Talmud, Mashup Yathi Chapter I Mishnah Oats are of two kinds subdivided into four the laws concerning the discovery of having unconsciously sinned through Uncle Anas are of two kinds subdivided into four the laws concerning carrying on the Sabbath are of two kinds subdivided into four the shades of leprous affections are of two kinds subdivided into four where there is knowledge at the beginning and at the end but forgetfulness between a sliding scale sacrifice is brought where there is knowledge at the beginning but not at the end the goat the blood of which is sprinkled within the veil on the day of atonement together with the day of atonement itself hold the sin in suspense until it become known to the sinner and he brings the sliding scale sacrifice where there is no knowledge at the beginning but there is knowledge at the end the goat sacrificed on the outer altar together with the day of atonement itself bring him forgiveness for it is said one he goat for a sin. Offering beside the sin offering of atonement they are likened to one another so that we may deduce that both atone for similar kinds of sin just as the inner goat atones only for an unconscious sin where there was knowledge at the beginning so the outer goat atones only for an unconscious sin where there was knowledge at the end where there is no knowledge either at the beginning or at the end the goats offered as sin offerings on festivals and new moons bring atonement this is the opinion of our Judah B.I.L.I.R. -I -I Simeon B.O.A. holds that the festival goats alone and not the new moon goats atone for this class of unconscious offense and for what do the new moon goats bring atonement Talmud, Masha Yath for a ritually clean man who ate holy food that had become unclean Armadir says all the goats except the inner have equal powers of atonement for transgressions of the laws of Uncle Anas in connection with the temple and holy food thereof now our Simeon holds that the new moon goats bring atonement for a clean man who ate unclean holy food and the festival goats atone for transgression of the laws of Uncle Anas where there was no knowledge either at the beginning or at the end and the outer goat of the day of atonement for transgression of these laws where there was no knowledge at the beginning but there was knowledge at the end they therefore said to him is it permitted to offer up the goat set apart for one day on another he replied yes they however argued with him since they are not equal in the atonement they bring how can they take each other's place he replied they are all at least equal in the wider sense in that they all bring atonement for transgressions of the laws of Uncle Anas in connection with the temple and holy food thereof our Simeon B. Judah said in his name the new moon goats bring atonement for a clean person who ate unclean holy food the festival goats in addition to bringing atonement for such a case atone also for a case where there was no knowledge either at the beginning or at the end the outer goat of the day of atonement in addition to bringing atonement for both these cases atones also for a case where there was no knowledge at the beginning but there was knowledge at the end they accordingly asked him is it permitted to offer up the goat set apart for one day on another he said yes they further said to him granted that the day of atonement goat may be offered up on the new moon but how can the new moon goat be offered up on the day of atonement to bring atonement for a trespass that is not within its scope he replied they are all at least equal in the wider sense in that they all bring atonement for transgressions of the laws of Uncle Anas in connection with the temple and holy food thereof for willful transgression of the laws of Uncle Anas in connection with the temple and holy food thereof the inner goat of the day of atonement together with the day of atonement itself Bring forgiveness for other transgressions of the Torah light and great willful and unconscious known and unknown positive and negative those punishable by Gareth and those punishable by death imposed by the court for all these the scapegoat brings atonement to Israelites priests and the anointed high priest what then is the difference between Israelites priests and the anointed high priest none save that the bullet brings atonement to the priests for transgressions of the laws of Uncle Anas in connection with the temple and holy food our Simeon says just as the blood of the goat that is sprinkled within the veil brings atonement for Israelites so the blood of the bullet brings atonement for priests and just as the confession of sins pronounced over the scapegoat brings atonement for Israelites so the confession pronounced over the bullet brings atonement for priests Kamara now the Tana has just ended the treatise Macus why does he study Shabbat because he learned for rounding the corners of the head the penalty of lashes is incurred twice once for each corner Talmud, Mashabiyat and for shaving the beard five times twice for each cheek and once for the point of the chin since he has been discussing a single prohibition involving two punishments he continues with oats are of two kinds subdivided into four why did the Tana enumerate all the instances of two subdivided into four only in this treatise and not in the treatise Shabbat when discussing the laws of carrying nor in the treatise Nega'im when discussing the shades of leprous affections I will tell you the laws of oats and uncleanness are mentioned together in the Bible and are akin to each other in that their transgressor brings a sliding scale sacrifice the Tana therefore mentions them together here and having mentioned these two he includes the rest also having begun with the laws of oats why does the Tana proceed to explain the laws of uncleanness first because the laws of uncleanness are few he disposes of them first and he proceeds to explain the laws of oats which are more numerous oats are of two kinds subdivided into four two I shall eat I shall not eat subdivided into four I have eaten I have not eaten the laws concerning the discovery of having unconsciously sinned through Uncle Anas are of two kinds subdivided into four two the discovery of having been unclean and partaken of holy food and the discovery of having been unclean and entered the temple the uncleanness having been forgotten in both cases subdivided into four the discovery that it was holy food he had eaten while being unclean having forgotten that it was holy during the eating of it and the discovery that it was a temple he had entered while being unclean having forgotten it was a temple at the time of entering the laws concerning carrying on the Sabbath are of two kinds subdivided into four two the carrying out by the poor man and the carrying out by the Householder subdivided into four the bringing in by the poor man and the bringing in by the householder the shades of leprous affections are of two kinds subdivided into four two seth and bahirath subdivided into four the derivative of seth and the derivative of bahirath who is a tana of our mission it is neither our ishmael nor our akiva it is not our ishmael for he states he is guilty only when the oath is in the future tense and it is not our akiva for he states he is guilty only in the cases where he forgets his uncleanness while eating holy food or entering the temple but not in the cases where he forgets that it is the temple he is entering or that the food is holy while he is unclean if you wish I can say the tana of our mission is our ishmael or if you prefer I can say it is our akiva it may be our ishmael of the four kinds of oaths mentioned not all are equally serious but two incur punishment and the other two do not or it may be our akiva two of the cases of Transgression through uncleanness incur punishment and two do not in some cases there is no punishment Talmud, Masjub Yathbi but does not the Tana mention them together with the laws concerning the shades of leprosy just as in these laws all four shades make him unclean necessitating a sacrifice so here in the case of oats and uncleanness all must be equal necessitating a sacrifice verily the Tana is our Ishmael and though in the case of oats our Ishmael excludes the past tense it is only to free the transgressor from bringing a sacrifice if he transgresses unwittingly but not to free him from lashes if he transgresses willfully and this will be in accordance with Rabbah's dictum for Rabbah said clearly did the Torah state that a false oath is like a vain oath for lashes just as a vain oath which is necessarily in the past being untrue the moment it is uttered is attended by the penalty of lashes so is a false oath in the past attended by the penalty of lashes granted. In the case of the oats I have eaten I have not eaten he is guilty and receives the lashes if they are false as Rabbah says also in the case of I shall not eat and he ate he is guilty and receives lashes for he has transgressed a negative precept involving action but in the case of I shall eat and he did not eat why should he receive lashes since the transgression is of a negative precept involving no action where then are the four kinds of punishable oats or Ishmael holds that the violation of a negative precept not involving action is also punishable by lashes if so our Yohanan contradicts himself for our Yohanan said the rule is in accordance with the anonymous mission and yet we find it stated I swear I shall eat this loaf today and the day passed and he did not eat it or Yohanan and Reshlakish both say he does not receive lashes or Yohanan's reason for his opinion being because it is a negative precept not involving action and the transgression of a negative precept. Involving no action is not liable to lashes and rushlakish reason being because it is an uncertain warning and an uncertain warning is not a warning or Yohanan found another anonymous mission which agrees with his view which one is it the following anonymous mission for we learned but he who leaves over a portion of even a ritually clean paschal lamb or breaks the
Fire scripture has come to appoint the positive precept to follow the negative precept to teach us that this negative precept is not punishable by lashes. This is the opinion of Arjuna. Our Jacob says this is not the reason, but rather because it is a negative precept not involving action and the disregard of a negative precept not involving action is not punishable by lashes. But he found the following anonymous mission. I swear I shall not eat this loaf. I swear I shall not eat it. And he ate it. Talmud, Mashabiyatha Talmud, Mashabiyatha he is guilty of transgressing only one oath. This is the useless oath for which the punishment of lashes is inflicted for willful transgression and the sliding scale sacrifice for unwitting transgression. This is the oath for which the punishment of lashes is inflicted for willful transgression. But in the case I swear I shall eat and he did not eat, we may deduce he would not receive lashes presumably because the transgression involves no action. And this anonymous mission would be the one with which our Yohanan agrees. Now, well, this mission is anonymous and our mission is anonymous. Why does our Yohanan prefer the ruling of this mission rather than of ours? But might it not be asked as a counter question, even according to your argument? How can Rabbi himself agree with both? At first, Rabbi held that a negative precept not involving action is punishable by lashes and therefore stated the ruling of our mission anonymously. Afterwards, he held it is not so punishable and stated the ruling of the second mission anonymously. And though he had changed his view, he allowed the first mission to stand. Also, you have explained our mission as being in accordance with our Ishmael's view and as referring to lashes for willful transgression. If so, what lashes can there be in connection with the shades of leprosy? There are lashes in the case where one cuts off his leprous spot, and as our Abin said in the name of our for our Abin said in the name of. Rile whenever there occur in holy writ the expressions take heed lest or do not they are negative precepts in connection with carrying on the Sabbath what lashes can there be is it not a negative precept which requires the warning that its violation is punishable by death and every such negative precept is not punishable by lashes for this very reason we have explained the mission as being in accordance with our Ishmael's view who holds that a negative precept requiring the death warning is if the lashes warning be given punishable by lashes but were it not for this would it have been possible to explain the mission as being in accordance with our Akiva's view surely not for has it not been shown that the laws of uncleanness in our mission are not in accordance with his views but did you not say that even according to our Ishmael the mission would have to be interpreted as referring to willful transgressions involving the punishment of lashes and if so were it not for the fact that our Akiva holds that a negative precept requiring the death warning is not punishable by lashes even if the lashes warning be given we could just as easily have explained the mission as being in accordance with our Akiva's view and as referring to lashes if so the phrase the discovery of having sinned through uncle ns implying unconscious sinning is inappropriate the appropriate expression would be warnings against sinning through uncleanness this question need cause no difficulty the Tana means the laws concerning the knowledge of the warnings against sinning if so how can there be two subdivided into four there are only two further where there is knowledge at the beginning and at the end but forgetfulness between how can there be forgetfulness if the mission is referring to willful transgression and lashes further a sliding scale sacrifice is brought obviously refers to willful transgression hence said our Joseph we must conclude that the Tana of the mission is Rabbi himself, who as editor incorporates the views of both Tanaim for the laws of uncleanness, he gives the view of our Ishmael, and for the laws of oaths, he gives the view of our Akiva. The mission referring accordingly to unwitting transgression said, Our Ashi, I repeated the statement of our Joseph to our Kahana, and he said to me, Do not think that our Joseph meant that Rabbi simply incorporated in the mission the views of both Tanaim, he himself not agreeing, but the fact is that Rabbi himself, for a sufficiently good reason, agrees with our Ishmael in the laws of uncleanness and with our Akiva in the laws of oaths, for it is taught whence do we deduce that one is not liable to bring a sacrifice except when there is knowledge at the beginning and at the end, and forgetfulness between Scripture records it was hidden from him twice. This is the opinion of our Akiva. Rabbi said, This deduction is not necessary. Scripture says, Talmud, Mashabiyat, be it was hidden from him, i.e., forgotten, therefore. It must have been known to him at the beginning, then scripture says, and he knows of it, i.e. at the end, hence knowledge is essential both at the beginning and at the end. If so, why does scripture say it was hidden from him twice in order to make him liable both in the case of forgetfulness of the uncleanness and in the case of forgetfulness of the temple or holy food concerning the laws of uncleanness? Then Rabbi has his own reason, but concerning oaths where we do not find that he gives a reason of his own, how do we know that he holds oaths are two subdivided into four? It is a reasonable assumption for what is our Akiva's reason for including oaths in the past tense for liability because he expounds amplifications and limitations. We find that Rabbi also expounds amplifications and limitations for it is taught Rabbi said the firstborn of man may be redeemed by all things except bonds, but the Rabbi said the firstborn of man may be redeemed by all things except slaves, bonds, and lands. What is Rabbi's reason? He expounds the verse in accordance with the principle of amplifications and limitations and those that are to be redeemed from a month old. The verse amplifies according to the valuation five shekels of silver. The verse limits shalt thou redeem the verse again amplifies since it amplifies limits and amplifies it includes everything and excludes only bonds. But the Rabbis expound the verse in accordance with the principle of generalizations and specifications and those that are to be redeemed from a month old. The verse generalizes according to the valuation five shekels of silver. The verse specifies shalt thou redeem the verse again generalizes since it generalizes specifies and generalizes you must include in the generalization only those things which are similar to the specification just as the specification is clearly movable and of intrinsic value. So all things which are movable and of intrinsic value may be used for redeeming the firstborn. But you must exclude lands which are not movable and slaves which have been likened to lands and bonds which though they are movable are not of intrinsic value and since Rabbi expounds amplifications and limitations he agrees with our Akiva said to Amimar does Rabbi really expound amplifications and limitations surely Rabbi expounds generalizations and specifications for it is taught and thou shalt take in all hands I deduce that in all may be used once do I deduce also a sharp wooden prick thorn needle borer or stylus it is said thou shalt take anything that may be taken by hand this is the opinion of our Jose son of our Judah Rabbi said and all just as in all is of metal so only those things which are of metal may be used and we explain the reason for their argument thus Rabbi expounds generalizations and specifications and our Jose son of our Judah expounds Talmud Mashabiyat amplifications and limitations through elsewhere he expounds generalizations and Specifications, but here in connection with the redemption of the firstborn, he expounds amplifications and limitations, and his reason is that which was taught in the academy of Arishmael, for in the academy of Arishmael it was taught in the waters in the waters twice. This is not generalization and specification, but amplification and limitation. And the rabbis who disagree with Rabbi in connection with the redemption of the firstborn, what is their reason? Rabbi said they agree with the Western Palestinian academies who hold that where there are two general statements followed by a particular, the particular should be regarded as being between the two general statements, and the verse may then be expounded on the principle of generalizations and specifications. Now that you say that Rabbi as a general rule expounds generalizations and specifications, the difficulty concerning oaths in our mission necessarily remains. We must perforce say therefore that in the mission he Gives our Akiva's view on oaths, but he himself does not agree to revert to the main subject. Whence do we deduce that one is not liable except when there is knowledge at the beginning and at the end? And forgetfulness between Scripture records it was hidden from him twice. This is the opinion of our Akiva. Rabbi said this deduction is not necessary. Scripture says it was hidden from him, therefore it must have been known to him at the beginning. Then Scripture says, and he knows of it, i.e., at the end. Hence knowledge is essential both at the beginning and at the end. If so, why does Scripture say it was hidden from him twice in order to make him liable both in the case of forgetfulness of the uncleanness and in the case of forgetfulness of the temple or holy food? The master said, and it was hidden from him, therefore it must have been known to him. How do you conclude this? Rabbi said, because it is not written and it is hidden from him. Abbe said to him, if so, in connection with the wife suspected. Of infidelity, when scripture says, and it was hidden from the eyes of her husband, will you reason from this also that he knew at the beginning, surely not, for if he knew the waters would not test her as it is taught, and the man shall
Outside the Mishnah there deals mainly with the Sabbath laws and therefore mentions the principles and derivatives but our Mishnah here which is not concerned mainly with the Sabbath laws mentions the principles only and not the derivatives which are the principles carrying out the laws of carrying out are only two and our Mishnah says two subdivided into four and perhaps you will say our Mishnah means two hosav carrying out which are punishable and two which are not that is not possible for they are mentioned together with the shades of leprous affections and just as those are all punishable so are these we must necessarily say said our Papa that the other Mishnah which deals mainly with the Sabbath laws mentions those which are punishable and those which are not but our Mishnah mentions only those which are punishable and not those which are not which are those that are punishable carrying out these are only two the Mishnah means two hosav and two hagnazeth but the Mishnah says Hosah said Arashi the Tana calls Haknasa also Hosah how do you know Talmud, Mashabiyat be because we learned he who carries out from one domain to another domain on the Sabbath is guilty and are we not concerned there also with bringing in and yet he calls it Hosah no perhaps the Tana means carrying out from a private domain to a public domain if so let him say distinctly he who carries out from a private domain to a public domain is guilty why does he say from one domain to another domain obviously to include even bringing in from a public domain to a private domain and he calls it Hosah what is the reason the withdrawing of an object from its place the Tana calls Hosah Rabbanah said the Mishnah also lends support to this view for it states the laws of carrying Ziyat on the Sabbath are two subdivided into four inside and two subdivided into four outside and it goes on to explain Haknasa bringing in this is conclusive Rabbah said. The Tana means domains. There are two kinds of domain with regard to carrying on the Sabbath. The shades of leprous affections are two subdivided into four. We learned there the shades of leprous affections are two subdivided into four. Bahirath intensively white likes no secondary to it, i.e., its derivative Sidha. He calls Seth like white wool secondary to it. Kiram Bezar Hanada said the Tana who stated this mission of leprous affections is not our Akiba for if it were our Akiba then since elsewhere. He enumerates them one above the other. Siddhikal cannot combine with any other shade for with which shade will you combine it? Will you combine it with Bahirath? There is Seth which is one degree higher than it. Intervening Bahirath being two degrees higher will you combine it with Seth? It is not its derivative. If so Kiram Bezar also with what will you combine it? Will you combine it with Seth? There is Sid which is one degree higher than it. Intervening Seth being two degrees higher. Will you combine it with Sid? It is not of its kind Talmud. Mashabiyatha, this is no question without Sid. Hikal Beza would present no difficulty for although Kiram Beza is two degrees lower than Seth. Scripture says for Seth and for Sephahath. Sephahath is secondary to Seth, although it is much i.e. two degrees lower, but Sid Hikal presents a difficulty with what shade can it combine? Obviously, then our mission in making Sid secondary to Bahirat and Kiram secondary to Seth is not in accordance with our Akiva's view. And where have we heard our Akiva enumerating the shades of leprosy one above the other? Shall we say in the following Barith where it is taught that our Jose said Joshua, the son of our Akiva, asked our Akiva, why did they say the shades of leprous affections are two subdivided into four? He replied, What should they say? They should say, said his son, all shades from Kiram Beza and upwards are unclean. He replied, the rabbi stated the law in the form of two. Subdivided into four so that we may deduce that they combine with each other. His son argued they could have said all shades from Kiram Beza and upwards are unclean and combine with each other. He replied the rabbi stated it in the form of two subdivided into four to teach us that a priest who is not well versed in them and their names is not competent to inspect the leprous shades. Now in his question Joshua did not suggest that they could have said that the shades from Kiram Beza and upwards are unclean and combine and the shades from Siddhikal and upwards are unclean and combine and because he did not say this we may deduce that he had heard that our Akiva held that they all combine with Seth but this is not conclusive as our Akiva may perhaps hold that Seth combines with its derivative and Bahirath with its derivative well then from our Hanan's statement we may deduce that our Akiva enumerates the shades one above the other for our Hanan said to what may our Akiva's Statement be compared to four tumblers of milk into one there fell two drops of blood into the second four drops into the third eight drops and into the fourth twelve drops some say sixteen drops they are all shades of white but one above the other no one did you hear our Akiva holding this view only in connection with variegated leprosy but did you hear it in connection with plain white leprosy and if you will say that just as he holds this view in connection with variegated leprosy so he holds it in connection with plain are you really sure that he holds it even in connection with variegated leprosy is it not taught our Akiva says the redness in this and in that Bahirath and Seth is like wine mixed with water except that Bahirath is white like snow and Sid is fainter than a Talmud Mashabiyath be and if it is as you say that our Akiva holds they are one above the other i.e. Bahirath and Seth he should have said white will i.e. Seth is fainter than it that is so are Akiba really said Seth and not Sid and so said our Nathan our Akiba did not say Sid is fainter than it but white will I.e. Seth is fainter than it and how do we know that Bahirath is brilliantly white Abbe said because scripture says and if the bright spot be white that is white and no other is as white as it our rabbis taught Bahirath is deep and so scripture says and the appearance thereof of the Bahirath is deeper than the skin like the appearance of the sun which is deeper than the shade Seth Seth denotes high and so scripture says upon all the high mountains and upon all the hills that are lifted up Sabahath Sabahath denotes an attachment i.e. derivative and so scripture says and he shall say attach me I pray thee to one of the priest's offices we find a derivative for Seth whence do we deduce that there is a derivative for Bahirath our said the word white is mentioned with Seth and the word white is mentioned with Bahirath just as the white mentioned with Seth as a derivative, so the white mentioned with Bahirath as a derivative in a very that it is taught scripture puts Sabahath between Seth and Bahirath to teach you that just as there is a derivative for Seth, so there is a derivative for Bahirath. Seth is like white wool. What white wool are BB said that RC said clean wool of a newborn lamb which is covered up to be made into a cloak of fine wool. Our Hannah said the rabbi's enumeration of the four shades to what may it be. Likened to two kings and two governors, the king of this is higher than the king of that, and the governor of this is higher than the governor of that, but this enumeration is one above the other. Well, then the king of this is higher than his own governor, and the king of that is higher than his own governor. Our Adabar Abba said it is like King Alcapta Rufila and Reshalutha, but this is one above the other. Well, then it is like King Rufila Alcapta and Reshalutha. Rabba said it is like King Shabur. And Caesar our Papa said to Rabba which of them is greater he replied you eat in the forest go forth and see whose authority is greater in the world for it is written it shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces said our Yohanan this is wicked Rome whose authority is recognized all over the world Rabba said it is like a new white woolen garment and a worn out woolen garment and a new white linen garment and a worn out linen garment where there is knowledge at the beginning etc our rabbis taught how do we know that scripture in demanding a sliding scale sacrifice for uncleanness refers only to cases where the temple is entered or holy food eaten while unclean there is a good argument for this deduction scripture warns against uncleanness and punishes it and also enacts that a sacrifice be brought for uncleanness now just as scripture in warning against uncleanness and punishing it did so only in cases where the temple was entered or holy food Eaten while unclean, so when it enacted that a sacrifice be brought for uncleanness, he did so only in cases where the temple was entered or holy food eaten. Then let us include teramah for sacrifice of eaten while unclean, since scripture also warned against its being eaten while unclean and punished the transgressor with death by divine intervention. We do not find that the sin for which the death penalty by divine intervention is inflicted for willful transgression should be punishable by sacrifice for unwitting transgression. You may say it is only the case in regard to a fixed sacrifice, but Talmud, Mashabiyat, a sliding scale sacrifice should perhaps be as in the case of hearing the voice of adoration and swearing clearly with the lips where a sliding scale sacrifice is brought for unwitting transgression, though neither karath nor death by divine intervention is inflicted for willful transgression. Scripture says whatsoever his uncleanness be by which he becomes. Unclean by which excludes terima
Whereas in the case of the temple it is entering in which constitutes the transgression well then said Rabba why is the punishment of Karat for eating peace offerings i.e. holy food while unclean mentioned three times in holy rig once for a general statement once for a particular and once for the uncleanness written in the Torah without being defined so that I know not what it means you may say that it means eating holy food while unclean and since it is unnecessary to have another prohibition for eating holy food while unclean for I deduce that from Rabbi's statement you may utilize the prohibition for entering the temple while unclean but this extra Karat we require for Arabab's deduction for Arabab said why does scripture mention Karat three times for eating peace offerings while unclean once for a general statement once for a particular and once for things which are not eaten and according to our Simeon who holds that things which are not eaten are not Punishable by Gareth if eaten during uncleanness we still require the extra Gareth to deduce that the inner sin offerings are included for we might have thought that since our Simeon holds that sacrifices which are not offered on the outer altar as our peace offerings are not subject to the law of pickle therefore they are also not subject to the law of uncleanness he therefore teaches us that they are the third Gareth that is necessary for this deduction how then shall we deduce that an unclean person entering the temple brings a sliding scale sacrifice well then the Nihardian say in the name of Rabba why does scripture mention uncleanness three times in connection with peace offerings once for a generalization once for a particular and once for the uncleanness written in the Torah without being explained so that I know not what it means you may say that it refers to eating holy food while unclean and since it is unnecessary to have another prohibition for that for I deduce that from Rabbi's statement you may utilize the prohibition for entering the temple while unclean but this extra word uncleanness we also require since scripture had to write the extra karat for Arabab's deduction it perforce had to write also the extra uncleanness for without it the phrase would have been meaningless well then said Rabbi we deduce that an unclean person entering the temple brings a sliding scale sacrifice from the similarity of phrases his uncleanness his uncleanness here it is written if he touch the uncleanness of man whatsoever his uncleanness be Talmud, Mashabiyath be Talmud, Mashabiyath be and there it is written he shall be unclean his uncleanness is yet upon him just as there it refers to entering the temple while unclean so here it refers to entering the temple while unclean if so why is the expression by which necessary to include that he who eats the carcass of a clean bird and enters the temple or eats holy food must bring a sliding scale sacrifice but you said that by which is intended to exclude and not include for the very reason that it does exclude it is superfluous it is written or if he touch the uncleanness this implies that only that which defiled by touch is included in the regulation of the sliding scale sacrifice but that which does not defile by touch is not included then it is written also by which which implies limitation we have then limitation after limitation and limitation after limitation serves to amplify where there is knowledge at the beginning but not at the end the goat the blood of which is sprinkled within the veil etc our rabbis taught and he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleannesses of the children of israel it is possible in this phrase to include three types of uncleanness the uncleanness of idolatry the uncleanness of incest and the uncleanness of bloodshed of idolatry the verse says he hath given of his seat unto Molech Defile my sanctuary of incest. It says, Ye shall keep my charge that ye do not any of these abominable customs that ye defile not yourselves therein of bloodshed. It says, And thou shalt not defile the land. Now I might have thought that for these three types of uncleanness this inner goat atones. Therefore, the text says of the uncleannesses of the children of Israel and not all the uncleannesses, these three are excluded because what uncleanness do we find that the text has differentiated? From all other uncleannesses, you must say it is the uncleanness of the transgressor who enters the temple or eats holy food. So here also the text in stating that the inner goat atones for the transgression of the laws of uncleanness refers to the uncleanness connected with temple and holy food. This is the opinion of our Judah. Our Simeon says from its own text it may be deduced for it says, And he shall make atonement for the holy place of the uncleannesses, i.e. of the uncleannesses of it. Holy place now I might have thought that for every uncleanness connected with the temple and holy food this goat atones therefore the text says and of their transgressions even all their sins sins are equated with transgressions just as transgressions are not liable for sacrifice so sins in this verse are those which are not liable for sacrifice and how do we know that only when there is knowledge at the beginning and not at the end does this goat hold the sin in suspense because the text says even all their sins implying sins for which a sin offering may ultimately be brought the master stated it is possible in this phrase to include three types of uncleanness the uncleanness of idolatry the uncleanness of incest and the uncleanness of bloodshed with reference to idolatry how is it possible if it was witting transgression the transgressor suffers the death penalty if unwitting he brings a sacrifice yes it may atone for witting transgression without warning or unwitting Transgression before it becomes known to him Talmud, Mashaviyate with reference to incest also how is it possible if it was witting transgression the transgressor suffers the death penalty if unwitting he brings a sacrifice yes it may atone for witting transgression without warning or unwitting transgression before it becomes known to him with reference to bloodshed also how is it possible if it was witting transgression the transgressor suffers the death penalty if unwitting he is exiled yes it may atone for witting transgression without warning or unwitting transgression before it becomes known to him or for cases where the punishment of exile is not inflicted the master has stated I might have thought that for these three types of uncleannesses this code atones therefore the text says of the uncleannesses and not all the uncleannesses what do we find that the text has differentiated from all other uncleannesses the uncleanness connected with temple and holy food so here also the text refers to the uncleanness connected with temple and holy food. This is the opinion of our Judah. What is the differentiation alluded to in that he alone brings a sliding scale sacrifice that include idolatry and as to the differentiation it is in that the sinner brings a she-goat and not a lamb. Our Kahana said we mean a differentiation to relax but this is a differentiation to restrict that include a woman after childbirth for the text differentiates in her case in that she brings a sliding scale sacrifice. Our Hashai said the verse says all their sins and not all their uncleannesses and according to our Simeon Biohe who said that a woman after childbirth is also a sinner what shall we say our Simeon is consistent in that he holds from its own text it may be deduced that include a leper who also brings a sliding scale sacrifice. Our Hashai said the verse says all their sins and not all their uncleannesses and according to our Samuel B. Naman who said for Seven sins leprous affections afflict man what shall we say there the leprosy itself atones for him and the sacrifice is merely to permit him to join the congregation then include a Nazirite who has become unclean for the text differentiates in his case in that he brings turtle doves or young pigeons our Hashai said the verse says all their sins and not all their uncleannesses and according to our Eliezer HaKapper who said that a Nazirite is also a sinner what shall we say he agrees with our Simeon who holds that from its own text it may be deduced the master has stated our Simeon said from its own text it may be deduced for it says and he shall make atonement for the holy place of the uncleannesses of the uncleannesses of the holy place our Simeon argues well why then does not our Judah accept this deduction he may say to you that and he shall make atonement is required to teach us that just as he does in the holy of holy so shall he do outside the veil in the temple and how does our Simeon deduce this? He deduces it from and so shall he do and our Judah cannot he also deduce it from this phrase? No from this phrase we might have thought that he must bring another bullock and go to do the service outside the veil in the temple therefore the text teaches us and he shall make atonement for the holy place implying that he shall use the same bullock and goat and so shall he do means that he shall repeat the service outside the veil and our Simeon why does he not agree with this argument of our Judah because the phrase and so shall he do for the tent of meeting implies everything the master stated I might have thought that for every uncleanness connected with the temple and holy food this code atones therefore the text says and of their transgressions even all their sins sins are equated with transgressions just as transgressions are not liable for sacrifice so sins in this verse are those which are not liable for sacrifice but a sin which is Liable for sacrifice is excluded, i.e., the inner goat does not atone for it, which is it that is excluded where there is knowledge at the beginning and at the end. Surely, for such a sin, the transgressor must bring a sliding scale sacrifice. The deduction is not necessary save in the case where the sin becomes known to the transgressor near sunset on the eve of the day of atonement. I might have thought that in the
The Day of Atonement atones I might have thought that we should reverse the atonements therefore the text says even all their sins so that we may infer that they are ultimately liable for a sin offering i.e. the inner goat holds in suspense those sins where there is knowledge at the beginning but not at the end but why should it not atone completely instead of merely holding the sin in suspense till he brings his sacrifice if it had been written and he shall make atonement of their transgressions and of their sins I should have agreed with you but now that it is written of their transgressions even all their sins the text means that it holds in suspense such transgressions as may ultimately be atoned for by sin offerings now since it does not atone completely what is the purpose of holding it in suspense Arzara said so that if he dies before the knowledge comes to enable him to bring his sacrifice he dies without sin said Rabba to him if he dies his death purges him from sin but said Rabba the inner goat by holding the sin in suspense shields him from suffering until he brings his sacrifice where there is no knowledge at the beginning but knowledge at the end the goat sacrificed on the outer altar and the day of atonement atone etc now they have been equated with each other let the inner goat then atone for its own where there is knowledge at the beginning and not at the end and for that for which the outer goat atones where there is no knowledge at the beginning but at the end and the outcome of this would be that there would be atonement in such case where the outer goat was not sacrificed no the text says and Aaron shall make atonement upon the horns of it once in the year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement once in the year shall he make atonement for it one atonement it atones but it does not affect two atonements well let the outer goat atone for its own and for that for which the inner goat atones and it Outcome of this would be that there would be atonement in such case where uncleanness occurred between the offering of this inner goat and that outer goat. No, the text says once in the year this atonement shall be Talmud, Mashabiyah only once a year, and according to our Ishmael who holds that where there is no knowledge at the beginning but knowledge at the end, the transgressor must bring a sliding scale sacrifice for which sin will the outer goat atone for that where there is no knowledge either at the beginning or at the end, but for this the goats offered on the festivals and new moons make atonement. He agrees with our Mayor who holds that all the goats give equal atonement for the uncle and as connected with the temple and holy food. In that case, for what purpose was the outer goat equated with the inner to teach us that just as the inner does not atone for other sins, so the outer does not atone for other sins where there is no knowledge either at the beginning or at the end of festival and new moon goats bring atonement. This is the opinion of Arjuna. Bi said Rab Judah that Samuel said what is Arjuna's reason because the text says and one goat for a sin offering unto the Lord for a sin which is known only to the Lord shall this goat atone. But this superfluous word we require for the deduction of our Simeon Belakish for our Simeon Belakish said why is the new moon goat different in that the phrase unto the Lord is used in connection with it. Because the Holy One blessed be he said this goat shall be an atonement for me as it were for my diminishing the size of the moon. If so for our Simeon Belakish deduction the text could have said a sin offering for the Lord why to the Lord for our deduction and say that it is solely for this deduction and eliminate our Simeon Belakish deduction. If so the text could have said a sin offering of the Lord why to the Lord hence we deduce both let it the new moon goat atone also for other. Sins which are known only to the Lord, i.e., are unknown to the transgressor in the school of Arishmael, it was stated that since this outer goat of the day of atonement comes at a fixed season and this new moon goat comes at a fixed season, and just as this outer goat atones only for the uncleanness connected with the temple and holy food, so this new moon goat atones only for the uncleanness connected with the temple and holy food, thus we find that the new moon goats atone for this. Class of sin once do we know that the festival goats atone for it, and if you will say that this also follows from the deduction of the school of Arishmael, it is possible to refute this reasoning if the deduction is made from the new moon goat, it may be argued that it is more frequent than the festival goat, therefore it atones for the sin, but the festival goat may not atone for it, and if the deduction is made from the day of atonement goat, it may be argued that the atonement of the day is more inclusive therefore the outer goat of the day atones for the sin but the festival goat may not atone for it and if you will say Talmud, Mashabiyat be Talmud, Mashabiyat be but we deduce the new moon goat from the day of atonement goat and did not refute the argument therefore let us deduce the festival goat from the day of atonement goat it may be said in reply that with reference to the new moon goat atonement is distinctly mentioned in the text for a sin which is unknown to the transgressor and what we desired is merely an intimation that only the unknown sins connected with temple and holy food are intended but here it may be said that the whole law we cannot deduce well then just as our Habibi Hanan said elsewhere the text could have said one goat but it says and one goat so here the text could have said one goat but it says and one goat so that the festival goats are equated with the new moon goats just as the new moon goats atone only for sins where there is no knowledge either at the beginning or at the end so the festival goats atone only for sins where there is no knowledge either at the beginning or at the end the question was propounded when Arjuna said that the new moon and festival goats atone for sins where there is no knowledge either at the beginning or at the end does the statement apply only to a sin which will ultimately remain unknown to the transgressor but a sin which will ultimately become known is counted as if there were knowledge at the end and consequently is atoned for by the outer goat of the day of atonement together with the day of atonement or does his statement include even a sin which will ultimately become known since actually at this moment it is unknown and may be termed a sin which is known only to the lord come and here it has been taught for sins where there is no knowledge either at the beginning or at the end and for a sin which will ultimately become known the festival and new moon goats atone. This is the opinion of Arjuna. Our Simeon says the festival goats atone for this class of sin, but not the new moon goats. And for what do the new moon goats atone for? A ritually clean man who ate holy food that had become unclean. Our Eliezer said that our Ashai said what is our Simeon's reason? The verse says, and it hath he given you to bear the iniquity of the congregation. This verse refers to the new moon goat, and we deduce by analogy because of the use of the identical word iniquity from the zis. Here it is said iniquity, and there it is said iniquity. Just as there it refers to the uncleanness of the flesh, so here it refers to the uncleanness of the flesh. But since we deduce one from the other, let us say just as there it refers to offerings, so here it refers only to offerings, and let it not atone for a clean man who ate unclean holy food. No, it is written the iniquity of the congregation. Well, now we deduce one from the other, then let the new. Moon goat atone for its own and also do the work of the ziz and the outcome would be that there would be acceptance of the offering though unclean even when the ziz is broken no the verse says the iniquity one iniquity it bears but it does not bear two iniquities well then let the ziz atone for its own and for that for which the new moon goat atones and the outcome would be that there would be atonement for uncleanness which occurred between this new moon and the next no the verse says it hath he given you to bear the iniquity of the congregation it bears the iniquity but no other bears the iniquity our ashi said here it is written the iniquity of the congregation congregation and not holy things and there it is written the iniquity of the holy things holy things and not congregation hence we find that the new moon goats atone for a clean man who ate unclean holy food how do we know that the festival goats atone for sins of uncleanness where there is no knowledge Either at the beginning or at the end, as our Hamabi Hanan said elsewhere, the text could have said one goat, but it says and one goat. So here the text could have said one goat, but it says and one goat. Talmud, Mashabiyatha. Thus the festival goats are equated with the new moon goats, just as the new moon goats atone for something connected with holy things. So the festival goats atone for something connected with holy things. And if you should say, let them the festival goats atone for that for which the new moon goat atones, we would reply, No, for we have said it hath he given to you to bear the iniquity. The new moon goat bears the iniquity, and no other bears the iniquity. And if you should say, let them atone for that for which the day of atonement outer goat atones, we would reply, No, for we have said once in a year shall he make atonement for it. This atonement of the day of atonement outer goat shall be only once a year for what then do they the festival. Goats atone if for a case where there is knowledge at the beginning and at the end the transgressor must bring a sliding scale sacrifice if for a case where there is knowledge at the beginning and not at the end this is a case where the inner goat and the day of atonement hold the sin in suspense if for a case where there is no knowledge at the beginning but at the end for this the outer goat and the day of atonement atone of necessity therefore they the festival goats atone for a case where there is no knowledge either at the beginning or at the end our mayor says all the goats
Atonements nor do they atone his atonement, he does not atone their atonements, he atones one atonement and does not atone two atonements, they do not atone his atonement for the verse says once in the year shall he make atonement, this atonement shall be only once in the year it was likewise taught in a barita for a case where there is no knowledge either at the beginning or at the end and for a case where there is no knowledge at the beginning but knowledge at the end and for a clean man. Who ate unclean holy food the festival goats and the new moon goats and the goat offered outside the veil on the day of atonement bring atonement this is the opinion of our Meir the inner goat however he leaves out and that they the others atone his atonement he also leaves out now our Simeon says the new moon goats atone for a clean man who ate unclean holy food etc granted that the new moon goats do not atone for that for which the festival goats atone because the text says it hath he given you to bear the iniquity one iniquity it bears but it does not bear two iniquities but let the festival goats atone for that for which the new moon goats atone no the text says it hath he given you to bear the iniquity it bears the iniquity but no other bears the iniquity granted that the festival goats do not atone for that for which the day of atonement goat atones because the text says once in the year shall he make atonement this atonement shall be only once a year but let the day of atonement goat atone for that for which the festival goats atone no the text says an Aaron shall make atonement upon the horns of it once one atonement it atones but it does not atone two atonements but once is written in connection with the inner goat and not the outer the text says one goat for a sin offering beside Talmud, Mashabiath be the sin offering of atonement hence the outer is equated with the inner Arsimian be Judah said in his Arsimian be his name it. New moon goats atone for a clean man who ate unclean holy food the festival goats in addition to atoning for a clean man who ate unclean holy food atone also for a case where there was no knowledge either at the beginning or at the end the outer goat of the day of atonement in addition to atoning for a clean man who ate unclean holy food and for a case where there was no knowledge either at the beginning or at the end atones also for a case where there was no knowledge at the beginning but there was knowledge at the end what is the difference the new moon goats do not atone for that for which the festival goats atone because the text says it hath he given you to bear the iniquity one iniquity it bears but it does not bear two iniquities then let the festival goats also not atone for that for which the new moon goats atone because the text says it hath he given you to bear the iniquity it bears the iniquity but no other bears the iniquity because the emphasis on it does not seem justified to him what is the difference the festival goats do not atone for that for which the day of atonement goat atones because the text says once in the year shall he make atonement this atonement of the day of atonement goat shall be only once a year then let the day of atonement goat also not atone for that for which the festival goats atone because it is written and Aaron shall make atonement upon the horns of it once one atonement it atones but it does not atone to Atonements the emphasis on once does not seem justified to him why for it is written in connection with the inner goat and not the outer if so let the festival goats also atone for that for which the day of atonement goat atones because once in the year is written in connection with the inner goat and not the outer in reality the emphasis on once does seem justified to him but here it is different for the text says and Aaron shall make atonement upon the horns of it once in a year. The horns namely of the inner altar with reference to this we say that it atones one atonement and not two atonements but with reference to the outer we may say it atones even two atonements Allah said that our Yohanan said the regular offerings which are not required for the community are redeemed unblemished Rabbi said and stated this law said our Hista to him who eats you and our Yohanan your teacher whither has the holiness in them departed he replied to him do you not hold that we do not say. Whither has the holiness in them departed for we learned in a mission the remainder of the incense what was done with it the wages of the workmen were allocated from the temple treasury and the extra incense was exchanged for this money and given to the workmen as their wages and was then rebought from them with the new donations now why should this procedure be permitted let us say whither has the holiness in them departed he said to him you argue from incense incense is different. Talmud, Mashabiyatha for it has only a monetary holiness if so let it not become invalid by the touch of a tibulyam and yet it has been taught as soon as it, the incense is placed in the mortar it becomes liable to invalidation by the touch of a tibulyam but perhaps you will say all things which have only a monetary holiness are liable to invalidation by the touch of a tibulyam that cannot before we have learned the meal offerings are liable to be trespassed against as soon. As they are verbally consecrated when they are consecrated in the vessel they become liable also to invalidation by the touch of a tibulyam and one lacking atonement and by lina hence we may deduce when they are consecrated in the vessel yes they become liable to invalidation by the touch of a tibulyam but before they are consecrated in the vessel no well then is it the incense holy bodily if so let it become invalidated also by lina and yet we have learned the handful and it. Frankincense and the incense and the meal offering of the priest and the meal offering of the anointed high priest and the meal offerings brought with libations are liable to be trespassed against as soon as they are verbally consecrated when they are consecrated in the vessel they become liable also to invalidation by the touch of a tibulyam and one lacking atonement and by lina hence we may deduce when they are consecrated in the vessel yes they become liable to invalidation by Lina, but before they are consecrated in the vessel, no, he said to him, You argue from the fact that it is not invalidated by Lina, that therefore the incense is not bodily holy. Incense is different, it is bodily holy even in the mortar, but is not invalidated by Lina because it retains its form all the year. Nevertheless, the question remains since the incense is bodily holy, whether has the holiness in them departed. Rabbi said the Beth did make a mental stipulation that if they are required, they are required, i.e., utilized, but if not, they shall be holy only for their value. Said Abbe to him, But you, sir, yourself said, if one consecrates a male ram to be holy only for its value, it nevertheless becomes bodily holy. This is no question. I said it becomes bodily holy in the case where he said it should be holy for its value to buy burnt offering, but if he said it should be holy for its value to buy libations, it does not become bodily holy. Abbe asked him, It was taught. The bullock and inner goat of the day of atonement which were lost others being set apart in their stead Talmud, Mashabiyath B and also the goats to atone for idolatry which were lost others being set apart in their stead they all die this is the opinion of our Judah our Eliezer and our Simeon say they pasture till they become unfit for sacrifice then they are sold the money going as a donation to the temple treasury for a congregational sin offering does not die why should they be starved or pasture till they become blemished let us say the Beth did make a mental stipulation that if they be lost and found again they be redeemed unblemished you quote the case of lost sacrifices lost sacrifices are different because they are rare but the red heifer is rare and yet it was taught the red heifer is redeemed on account of any disqualification in it if it died it is redeemed if it was slaughtered it is redeemed if he found another which was more excellent it is redeemed but if he had already slaughtered it on its wood pile, it can never be redeemed. The red heifer is different, for it is in the category of holy things for temple repair. If so, how is it redeemed? If it died or was slaughtered outside the prescribed place, surely we require placing and valuation. This will be in accordance with our Simeon, who says that holy things for the altar are subject to the law of placing and valuation, but holy things for the temple repair are not subject to the law of placing and valuation. If it is in accordance with our Simeon's view, how will you explain the last clause? If he had already slaughtered it on its wood pile, it can never be redeemed. Surely it has been taught. Our Simeon says the red heifer defiles the defilement of edibles because it had a period of fitness. And our Simeon, Belakish said, our Simeon used to say that the red heifer may be redeemed even on its wood pile. Well, then the red heifer is different because it is expensive. The master said, if it died, it is. Redeemed do we then redeem holy things in order to feed dogs our measure she said it is redeemed for the sake of its hide do the Beth did then make a mental stipulation merely for the sake of its hide our Kahana said men say of a camel the ear is valuable he further asked him they said to our Simeon is it permitted to offer up the goat set apart for one day on another he said to them it may be offered they argued with him since they are not equal in the atonement they bring how can they take each other's place he replied they are all at least equal in the wider sense in that they all bring atonement for transgressions of the laws of Uncle Anas in connection with the temple and holy food thereof now why should our Simeon give such an unconvincing reply let him say the Beth did make a mental stipulation in their case you argue thus against our Simeon our Simeon does not hold that the Beth are empowered to make a mental stipulation for our EDB Aben said that our Rome said that our
Rabbis who disagree with Arsimian holding that the Beth didn't make a mental stipulation, but Aryohanan had a tradition that according to Arsimian the daily offerings are not redeemed unblemished, and according to the sages they are redeemed, and according to Arsimian who does not hold that the Beth didn't make a mental stipulation that the daily offerings which are not required should be redeemed, what is done with them? Or Isaac said that Aryohanan said they are offered as dessert to the altar. Our Samuel son of Arisaac said Arsimian admits, however, that the goats for a sin offering are not themselves offered as dessert for the altar, but their money equivalent. For here in the case of the surplus daily offering, it was originally intended for a burnt offering, and it is now also a burnt offering. But there in the case of the sin offering, it was originally intended for a sin offering, and now it will be a burnt offering. It is therefore not permitted to be offered up itself. Eh? Restriction being imposed even after the congregation have had atonement with another sin offering as a preventive measure in case it may be offered up before the congregation have had atonement with another. Abbe said we have also learned in the very the bullock and inner goat of the day of atonement which were lost others being set apart in their stead and also the goats to atone for idolatry which were lost others being set apart in their stead they all die. This is the opinion of our Jude, our Eliezer and our Simeon say they pasture till they become unfit for sacrifice and then they are sold the money going as a donation to the temple treasury for a congregational sin offering does not die now why should they pasture till they become blemished and then be sold let them be offered up themselves as burnt offerings as dessert for the altar obviously therefore since they do not say this we may deduce that a restriction is imposed even after atonement is a Preventive measure in case they may be offered up before atonement. Rabbi said we have also learned and the second one pastures till it becomes unfit for sacrifice when it is sold and the money goes as a donation to the temple treasury. Now why should it pasture till it becomes blemished and then be sold? Let it be offered up itself as a burnt offering as dessert for the altar. Obviously therefore since this is not done we may deduce that a restriction is imposed even after atonement. As a preventive measure in case it may be offered up before atonement. Rabbi said we have also learned a guilt offering the owner of which died or obtained atonement with another pastures till it becomes unfit for sacrifice when it is sold and the money goes as a donation to the temple treasury. Our Eliezer says it dies. Our Joshua says he brings a burnt offering for its money. Now let it be offered up itself as a burnt offering as dessert for the altar. Obviously therefore since this is not. Done we may deduce that a restriction is imposed even after atonement as a preventive measure in case it may be offered up before atonement. This is conclusive. This has also been taught in the following very though what do they bring from the surplus congregational offerings? Talmud, Mashabiyoth be dessert like wife fix for the altar, but it is written for any leaven or honey ye shall not offer up as smoke as an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Our Hannah explained the burnt offerings. Our dessert for the altar as wife fix our dessert for man our and son of our histi expounded the burnt offering of a bird is not offered as dessert for the altar. Rabba said this is an absurdity, said our nomin be Isaac to Rabba wherein lies its absurdity. I told it him and in the name of our Shimei of Nihardia, I told it him for our Shimei of Nihardia said the surplus offerings are utilized as congregational donations and a burnt offering of a bird cannot be a congregational burnt offering and Samuel also. Agrees with Aryohanan for Rab Judah said that Samuel said in the case of congregational offerings it is the night that draws them to what they are it has also been taught likewise and Arsimian admits that the goat which was not offered on a festival may be offered on the new moon and if it was not offered on the new moon it may be offered on the day of atonement and if it was not offered on the day of atonement it may be offered on a festival and if it was not offered on this festival it may be offered on another festival for it was originally intended only to make atonement on the outer altar and for willful transgression of the laws of Uncle Anas in connection with the temple and holy food thereof the goat offered within the veil and the day of atonement itself bring atonement how do we know this for our rabbis learned scripture says and he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the Uncle Anas of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions even all their sins transgressions mean rebellious acts and thus it says the king of Moab hath rebelled against me and also then did live revolt at the same time sins mean unwitting sins and thus it says if anyone shall sin through error for other transgressions of the Torah light and heavy willful and unwitting known and unknown positive and negative those punishable by Gareth and those punishable by death at the hand of the Beth din for all these the scapegoat brings atonement surely light is equivalent to positive and negative heavy is equivalent to those punishable by Gareth and those punishable by death at the hand of the Beth din known is equivalent to willful and unknown is equivalent to an unwitting Rab Judah said thus he means for other transgressions of the Torah whether light or heavy whether committed unwittingly or willfully those committed unwittingly whether their doubtful commission was known to him or not known to him and these are the light transgressions positive and negative and these are the heavy transgressions those punishable by Gareth and those punishable by death at the hand of the Beth in that positive precept for transgression of which the scapegoat atones how is this to be understood if he did not repent why should the scapegoat atone surely it is written the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination if he did repent why do we require the scapegoat repentance on any day avails for it was taught if he transgressed a positive precept and repented he does not move from there until he is forgiven our Zerah said Talmud, Mashabiyate it refers to the case of a man who persists in his rebellion and it is in accordance with Rabbi's view for it was taught Rabbi said for all transgressions of the Torah whether he repented or not the day of atonement brings atonement except in the case of one who throws off the yoke perverts the teachings of the Torah and rejects the covenant in the flesh in these cases if he repented the day. Of atonement brings atonement, and if not the day of atonement does not bring atonement, what is Rabbi's reason for it was taught scripture says because he hath despised the word of the Lord. This refers to one who throws off the yoke or perverts the teachings of the Torah and hath broken his commandment. This refers to one who rejects the covenant in the flesh that soul shall utterly be cut off to be cut off before the day of atonement. He shall be cut off after the day of atonement. I might think that this is the case even if he repented. Therefore, scripture says his iniquity shall be upon him. I did not say that the day of atonement does not bring atonement, except when his iniquity is still on him, and the rabbis they may reply, Scripture means to be cut off in this world, he shall be cut off in the world to come. His iniquity shall be upon him if he repented and died, death wipes out the sin. But how can you establish our mission as being in accordance with the view of Rabbi? Surely since the last clause is in accordance with our Judah's view the first clause must also be in accordance with our Judah's view for the last clause states the scapegoat brings atonement for Israelites priests and the anointed high priest now who holds this view our Judah therefore the first clause must also be in accordance with our Judah view our Joseph said it is really in accordance with Rabbi's view and he is in agreement with our Judah said Abbe to him do you master mean particularly that Rabbi agrees with our Judah but our Judah does not agree with Rabbi or that just as you say Rabbi agrees with our Judah so also our Judah agrees with Rabbi but you state as is customary that a disciple agrees with his master he replied I mean particularly that Rabbi agrees with our Judah but our Judah does not agree with Rabbi for it was taught I might think that the day of atonement should atone for those who repent and for those who do not repent and although an analogy might be a to Contrary thus in sin offering and guilt offering atone and the day of atonement atones we might therefore say just as the sin offering and guilt offering atone only for those who repent so the day of atonement atones only for those who repent yet we could argue sin offering and guilt offering do not atone for willful transgression as for unwitting therefore they atone only for those who repent but the day of atonement atones for willful as for unwitting transgression therefore let us say that just as it atones for willful as for unwitting transgression so let it atone for those who repent and for those who do not repent therefore scripture says howbeit on the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement this limits the power of the day of atonement now who is the author of any anonymous statement in the Sifra our Judah and it states that the day of atonement atones for only those who repent and not for those who do not repent but there is a contradiction between one anonymous statement in the Sifra and another for it was taught I might think that the Day of Atonement should not atone unless he fasted on it and called it a holy convocation and did no work on it but if he did not fast on it and did not call it a holy convocation and worked on it once do we deduce that the Day at
states what is the difference between Israelites priests and the anointed high priest Rab Judah said thus he means Israelites priests and the anointed high priest all equally obtained atonement with the scapegoat for other sins and there is no difference between them in this respect but what is the difference between Israelites priests and the anointed high priest this the bullet atones for the priests for transgression of the laws of uncleanness in connection with the temple and holy food thereof whereas for Israelites the inner and outer goats atone for these transgressions and who holds this view are Judah for it was taught scripture says and he shall make atonement for the most holy place this means the holy of holies and the tent of meeting this means the holy place and the altar in its usual sense he shall atone this means for the various compartments in the temple court and for the priests in the usual sense and for all the people of the assembly this means the Israelites he shall atone this means for the levites they are all equated for one atonement in that they obtain atonement with the scapegoat for other sins this is the opinion of our Judah our Simeon says just as the blood of the goat offered within the veil atones for Israelites for transgression of the laws of uncleanness connected with the temple and holy food thereof so the blood of the bullock atones for the priests for transgression of the laws of uncleanliness connected with the temple and holy food thereof and just as the confession pronounced over the scapegoat atones for Israelites for other sins so the confession pronounced over the bullock atones for the priests for other sins but according to our Simeon it may be asked surely they have been equated in what respect are they equated in that they all obtain atonement but each obtains atonement with his own what is our Simeon's reason it is written and he shall take the two goats the scapegoat is equated with the goat offered Within the veil, just as the goat offered within the veil does not atone for the priests for transgression of the laws of uncleanness connected with the temple and holy food thereof, because it is written concerning it the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, so the scapegoat does not atone for the priests for other sins. And our Judah, he may say to you, for this reason they are equated that they should be alike in color, height, and value. Who is the Tana who made the statement? Which the rabbis taught this scripture says he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people. This teaches that the priests do not obtain atonement with it, and with what do they obtain atonement with the bullock of Aaron? I might think that they should not obtain atonement with the bullock of Aaron, for it has already been said, and Aaron shall offer the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself, hence they would have no atonement at all. But when scripture says, and he Shall make atonement for the priests. We find that they have atonement with what do they obtain atonement? It is better that they should obtain atonement with the bullock of Aaron, for it was released from its implication in order to include also his house, and that they should not obtain atonement with the goat offered within the veil, which was not released from its implication in order to include also his house. And if you desire to say anything, I may add another argument for Scripture says, O oh, house of Aaron, bless ye the Lord, O house of Levi, bless ye the Lord, yet that fear the Lord, bless ye the Lord, who is the tenor of this very our Jeremiah said it is not our Judah, for if our Judah surely he says the priests obtain atonement with the scapegoat, and who is it Rabbah said it is our Simeon who holds that the priests do not obtain atonement with the scapegoat. Abbe said you may even say that it is our Judah, and thus he reasons hence they would have no atonement at all for transgression of it. Laws of uncleanness connected with the temple and holy food thereof, but when scripture says and he shall make atonement for the priests, we find that they have atonement for other sins, and just as we find that they have atonement for other sins, so they have atonement Talmud, Mashabiatha for the sins of uncleanness in connection with the temple and holy food thereof, with what do they obtain atonement? It is better that they should obtain atonement with the bullock of Aaron, for it was released from its implication in order to include also his house, and that they should not obtain atonement with the goat offered within the veil which was not released from its implication. And if you desire to say anything, I may add another argument for scripture says, O house of Aaron, bless ye the Lord, etc. What is meant by if you desire to say anything, you might say it is written, he shall atone for himself and for his house, therefore I add the argument that all priests are called his house. For it is said, O house of Aaron, bless ye the Lord, yet that fear the Lord, bless ye the Lord. Now as to the phrase that is for the people, does it come for this purpose? Surely it is required to deduce that the divine law means it should be from the people's funds. This we may deduce from and from the congregation of the children of Israel. He shall take two goats. Now as to the phrase which is for himself, does it come for this purpose? Surely it is required to deduce that which was taught. From his own funds he brings the bullock, and he does not bring it from public funds. I might think that he does not bring it from public funds because the congregation do not obtain atonement with it, but he may bring it from funds subscribed by his brother priests, for his brother priests obtain atonement with it. Therefore, scripture says which is for himself. I might think that he should not bring it from priestly subscriptions, but if he did it is still valid. Therefore, scripture says once. More which is for himself the verse repeats it in order to make this condition indispensable the tenement us in his argument why do they the priests not obtain atonement with the goat of the people because they spend no money on it for it is written that is for the people then we should say that since on Aaron's bullet they also spend no money they should not obtain atonement with it therefore he says they are all called his house it is right according to our Simeon that scripture mentions two confessions and the blood of the bullock one instead of the goat offered within the veil one instead of the goat offered outside and one instead of the scapegoat but according to our Judah why do we require two confessions and the blood of the bullock one confession and the blood should suffice one for himself and one for his household as it was taught in the academy of our Ishmael thus the nature of justice is practiced it is better that the innocent should come and atone for the guilty and not that the guilty should come and atone for the guilty chapter 2 mission of the laws concerning the discovery of having unconsciously sinned through Uncle Anes are two subdivided into four if he became unclean and was aware of it then the Uncle Anes became hidden from him though he remembered the holy food if the fact that it was holy food was hidden from him though he remembered the Uncle Anes if both were hidden from him and he ate holy food and was not aware and when he had eaten became aware in these cases he brings a sliding scale sacrifice if he became unclean and was aware of it then the Uncle Anes became hidden from him though he remembered the temple if the fact that it was the temple was hidden from him though he remembered the Uncle Anes if both were hidden from him and he entered the temple and was not aware and when he had gone out became aware in these cases he brings a sliding scale sacrifice it is the same whether one enters it Temple court or the addition to the temple court for additions are not made to the city of Jerusalem or to the temple compartments except by King Prophet Uriam and Tum and Sanhedrin of 71 two loaves of thanksgiving and song and the Beth in walking in procession the two loaves of thanksgiving being born after them and all Israel following behind them Talmud, Moshe be the inner one is eaten and the outer one is burnt and as to any addition that was made without all. These he who enters it while unclean is not liable if he became unclean in the temple court and was aware of it and the Uncle Anes then became hidden from him though he remembered the temple or the fact that it was the temple became hidden from him though he remembered the Uncle Anes or both became hidden from him and he prostrated himself or tarried the period of prostration or went out the longer way he is liable the shorter way he is not liable this is a positive precept. Concerning the temple for which they the Beth Din are not liable and which is a positive precept concerning a menstruous woman for which they are liable this if one cohabited with a clean woman and she said to him I have become unclean and he withdrew immediately he is liable because his withdrawal is as pleasant to him as his entry our Eliezer said scripture says if anyone touch the carcass of an unclean creeping thing and it be hidden from him when the unclean creeping thing is hidden from him he is liable but he is not liable when the temple is hidden from him or Akiba said scripture says and it be hidden from him that he is unclean when it is hidden from him that he is unclean he is liable but he is not liable when the temple is hidden from him or Ishmael said scripture says and it be hidden from him twice in order to make him liable both for the forgetfulness of the uncle Anes and the forgetfulness of the temple Gamara said our Papa to have a two subdivided into for they are two subdivided into six knowledge of the uncleanness at the beginning and at the end knowledge of the holy food at the beginning and at the end knowledge of the temple at the beginning and at the end but even according to your argument they should be eight for there is the uncleanness in connection with eating holy food and the uncleanness in connection with entering the temple necessitating knowledge both at the beginning and at the end this is no question the name. Uncleanness is the same but nevertheless there remains the question there are six our papa said verily there are eight the first
Liable for uncleanness in connection with forgetfulness of the temple. Again, the question does not arise for he does not require knowledge at the beginning. It is not necessary to ask this question except according to Rabbi who requires knowledge at the beginning and makes him liable in the case of forgetfulness of the temple and who holds furthermore that knowledge gained from a teacher is counted knowledge. What is the ruling shall we say since he knew that there was a temple in existence? This is called knowledge or since its place was not known to him it is counted as unawareness. The question remains undecided. It is the same whether one enters the temple court etc. How do we know our Shai Mai said because scripture says according to all that I show thee the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its vessels Talmud, Mashabiyah even so shall you make it for future generations. Rabbi objected all the vessels which Moses made were consecrated by there. Anointing thenceforth their employment in the service dedicated them now while let us say so shall you make it for future generations it is different therefore scripture says and he anointed them and sanctified them, them he anointed but vessels in future generations are not consecrated by anointing but you may say them he anointed but vessels in future generations may be consecrated either by anointing or by employment in the service our papa said scripture says and they shall take all the vessels of ministry wherewith they minister in the sanctuary the verse makes them dependent upon ministry now that scripture has written wherewith they minister why do we require them if scripture had not written them I might have said these in the time of Moses were consecrated by anointing only but vessels in future generations require both anointing and employment in service for scripture has written so shall you make it therefore scripture limits by writing them, them. By anointing but not vessels in future generations by anointing and with two loaves of thanksgiving we learned the two thanksgiving offerings which are mentioned refer to their loaves and not their flesh how do we know our Hista said because scripture says and I placed two great thanksgiving offerings and we went in procession on the right upon the wall now what is meant by great shall we say from a great or large kind actually if so let him say oxen but then large of their kind that is impossible for is there any importance attached to size before heaven surely we learned it is said with reference to a burnt offering of cattle an offering made by fire a sweet savor unto the Lord with reference to a burnt offering of a bird an offering made by fire a sweet savor unto the Lord with reference to a meal offering an offering made by fire a sweet savor unto the Lord this teaches us that it is the same whether one gives much or little as long as he directs his heart to his father who is in heaven well then that which is inevitably the larger in the thanksgiving offering and which is at the leaven for we learned the thanksgiving offering came from five Jerusalem seahs which are equivalent to six wilderness seahs which are two ephahs for an ephah is three seahs twenty tenths of an ephah ten for leaven and ten for unleavened loaves and the unleavened loaves were of three kinds cakes wafers and cakes saturated with oil hence the leavened loaves were larger Rami Bihava said the addition to the temple court is not sanctified except by the remnants of the meal offering what is the reason like Jerusalem just as Jerusalem is sanctified by that which must be eaten within it so the temple court is sanctified by that which must be eaten within it cannot then the loaves of thanksgiving be eaten in the temple court well then like Jerusalem just as Jerusalem is sanctified by that which must be eaten within it and which if it goes outside it becomes invalid so the temple court is sanctified by that which must be eaten within it and which if it goes outside it becomes invalid but why not say just as there it is leaven so here let it be leaven how can you reason thus is there then a meal offering of leaven Talmud, Moshe Yath B and if you should say that he leavens the remnants and sanctifies with them that cannot be for it is written it shall not be baked leavened as their portion have I given it and Rashi Lakish said even their portion must not be baked leavened but why not it is possible to sanctify it with the two loaves of Pentecost it is impossible how shall he do it shall he build it on the eve of Pentecost and sanctify it on the eve the two loaves become holy only by the sacrifice of the lambs on Pentecost shall he build it on the eve and sanctify it now on Pentecost we require sanctification at the time of the completion of the building shall he complete the building on the festival and Sanctify it on the festival the building of the temple does not supersede the festival shall he leave the two loaves till a day later and complete the building and sanctify it they the loaves become invalid by Lina shall he build it on the eve of the festival and leave a little incomplete so that when he has recited the blessing at the end of the day Havdalah he may complete it immediately and sanctify it the building of the temple cannot take place at night for Abbe said how do we know that the building of the temple cannot take place at night because it is said and on the day that the tabernacle was reared up during the day it is reared up during the night it is not reared up therefore it is not possible and with song our rabbis taught the song of thanksgiving was accompanied by lutes liars and symbols at every corner and upon every great stone in Jerusalem and the psalm is intoned I will extol thee O Lord for thou hast raised me up etc and the song against evil Occurrences and some call it the song against plagues. He who calls it the song against plagues does so because it is written, Neither shall any plague come nigh thy tent. And he who calls it the song against evil occurrences does so because it is written, A thousand may fall at my side. That is to say, the psalm is intoned, O thou who dwellest in the secret place of the Most High and abidest in the shadow of the Almighty, till for thou hast made the Lord who is my refuge even the Most High. Thy habitation, and then again, the psalm is intoned, A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son, Lord, how many are mine adversaries become till salvation. Belangeth unto the Lord, thy blessing be upon thy people. Selah, our Joshua be Levi recited these verses when retiring to sleep. How could he do so? Did not our Joshua be Levi himself say it is prohibited to heal oneself with words of the Torah to protect oneself is different? Well, then when he said it is prohibited, he meant where there is. Already a wound, if there is a wound, is it merely prohibited and nothing else? Surely we have learned he who utters an incantation over a wound has no portion in the world to come, but it has been taught with reference to this. Our Yohan and said they taught this law only if he spits for the name of heaven must not be mentioned in connection with spitting the Beth in walk in procession, the two loaves of thanksgiving being born after them, etc. Shall we say that the Beth in walk in front of it? Loaves of thanksgiving, surely it is written, and after them the two loaves went Hashai and half of the princes of Judah. Thus he means the Beth in walk and the two loaves of thanksgiving are born, and the Beth in walk behind. How are they born? Are high and our Simeon son of Rabbi disagreed. One said one opposite the other, and the other said one behind the other, according to the one who holds they were opposite each other. The inner one is that which is nearest the wall, and according to the one who holds that they were one behind the other, the inner one is that which is nearest the Beth Din. We learned the inner one is eaten, and the outer one is burnt. It is right according to the one who holds that they were one behind the other. Therefore, the inner one is eaten because the outer one came before it and sanctified the place. But according to the one who holds that they were opposite each other, they both simultaneously sanctified the place. But even according to your reasoning, according to the one who holds they were one behind the other, why is the inner one eaten? Does the one loaf then sanctify the place? Surely we have learned any addition that was not made with all these is not holy. And even according to the one who holds that the reading in the Mishnah is with any one of all these still these two loaves together are one precept. Well then said our Yohan and Talmud, Mashabiyatha, by the ruling of the Prophet, the one was eaten, and by the ruling of it. Prophet the other was burnt any addition that was not made with all these etc. It was taught Arhuna said with all these we learnt in our mission Arnaman said with any one of all these we learnt in our mission Arhuna said with all these we learnt in our mission because he holds the first consecration consecrated it for the time being and consecrated it for the future and Ezra in reconsecrating it merely did it as a symbol Arnaman said with any one of all these we learnt in our mission. Because he holds the first consecration consecrated it for the time being and did not consecrate it for the future and Ezra really reconsecrated it although there were no Urim and Tumim Rabba asked Arnaman we learnt any addition that was not made with all these amended and learn with any one of all these come and here Abbasal said there were two meadows on the Mount of Olives the lower and the upper the lower was consecrated with all these the upper was not consecrated with all these. But by the returned exiles without king and without Urim and Tumim, the lower one which was properly consecrated, the illiterate entered there and ate their sacrifices of a minor grade of holiness, but not the second tithe, and the learned ate their sacrifices of a minor grade of holiness, and also the second tithe, the upper one which was not properly consecrated, the illiterate entered there and ate their sacrifices of a
You deduce this perhaps all agree that the first consecration consecrated it for the time being and consecrated it for the future but one master states merely what he heard from his teachers and the other master states merely what he heard from his teachers and if you will say if so why according to our Eliezer our curtains necessary we may reply for privacy only well then there the Tanaim disagree for it has been taught our Ishmael son of our Jose said why did the sages enumerate? These because when the exiles returned they came upon these and consecrated them but the sanctity of the earlier cities was abolished when the sanctity of the land was abolished hence he holds that the first consecration consecrated it for the time being but did not consecrate it for the future but we may point out an incongruity our Ishmael son of our Jose said were there then only these surely it is already written and we took all his cities sixty cities all the region of our Godvid. Kingdom of Abba invasion all these were fortified cities with high walls and why did the sages enumerate these because when the exiles returned they came upon these and consecrated them they consecrated them now surely we state further on that it was not necessary to consecrate them but read they came upon these and enumerated them and not these only are walled cities but any one about which you may have a tradition from your fathers that it was surrounded by a wall from the days of Joshua. The son of Nun and all these precepts apply to it because the first consecration consecrated it for the time being and consecrated it for the future. There is thus a discrepancy between the statement of our Ishmael son of our Jose in the Beretha and that of our Ishmael son of our Jose in the Tisipta. If you will, you may say that they reflect the opinions of two Tanaim who disagree about the view of our Ishmael son of our Jose. And if you will, you may say that one of the statements was spoken by our Eliezer B. Jose, for it has been taught our Eliezer B. Jose said, Scripture says the city that has a wall, although it has not a wall now, as long as it had one before it is reckoned a walled city Talmud. Mosh of if he became unclean in the temple court and was aware of it, then the uncle Anas became hidden from him, etc. How do we know uncleanness in the temple court is punishable? Our Eliezer B. Petaf said, One verse states the tabernacle of the Lord he hath defiled, and another. Verse states for the sanctuary of the Lord he hath defiled if it is not applicable to the case of uncleanness occurring outside apply it to the case of uncleanness occurring inside but are the verses superfluous surely they are necessary for it has been taught our Eliezer B. Shamu said if tabernacle is mentioned why is sanctuary mentioned and if sanctuary is mentioned why is tabernacle mentioned if tabernacle had been mentioned and sanctuary had not been mentioned I might have thought that for entering the tabernacle he should be liable because it was anointed with the anointing oil but for entering the sanctuary i.e. temple he should not be liable and if sanctuary had been mentioned and tabernacle had not been mentioned I might have thought that for entering the sanctuary he should be liable because its holiness is an everlasting holiness but for entering the tabernacle he should not be liable therefore tabernacle is mentioned and sanctuary is mentioned our Eliezer B. Shamu argued thus since tabernacle is called sanctuary and sanctuary is called tabernacle let scripture write either in both verses sanctuary or in both verses tabernacle why does scripture write tabernacle and sanctuary hence we deduce both granted that sanctuary is called tabernacle for it is written and I will set my tabernacle among you but once do we know that tabernacle is called sanctuary shall we say because it is written and the Kohathites the bearers of the sanctuary said forward this refers to the ark well then from this verse and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them and it is written according to all that I show thee the pattern of the tabernacle and he prostrated himself or tarried the period of prostration Rabbah said they did not teach this except when he prostrated himself facing inwards but if he prostrated himself facing outwards then only if he tarried is he liable but if he did not tarry he is not liable some append this comment of Rabbi to the latter clause were tarried the period of prostration this implies that prostration itself requires tarrying Rabbi said they did not teach this except when he prostrated himself facing outwards but if facing inwards even if he did not tarry he is liable and thus the Mishnah means if he prostrated himself facing inwards without tarrying or if he tarried the period of prostration in his prostration facing outwards he is liable what is considered prostration in which there is tarrying and what is considered prostration in which there is no tarrying where there is no tarrying that is mere kneeling where there is tarrying that is the spreading out of hands and feet and what is the duration of tarrying in this there is disagreement between our Isaac Binamani and one of his associates namely our Simeon Bipazi and some say our Simeon Bipazi and one of his associates namely our Isaac Binamani and some say our Simeon Binamani one says as the time taken to recite this verse and all the children of Israel looked on when the fire came down and the glory of the Lord was upon the house and they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and prostrated themselves and gave thanks unto the Lord for he is good for his mercy endureth forever and the other says as the time taken to recite from and they bowed till the end our sages taught it a means falling on the face and so scripture says and Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth kneeling means upon the knees and so scripture says from kneeling at his knees prostration means spreading out of hands and feet and so scripture says shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down to thee to the earth Rabbi where it is tearing necessary for stripes or is tearing not necessary for stripes for the bringing of a sacrifice there is a tradition that tearing is necessary but for stripes there is no tradition that tearing is necessary Talmud, Mashabiyat, or perhaps the tradition is that within the temple tearing is necessary no matter whether for sacrifice or for stripes it remains undecided Rabbi Quirit if he suspended himself in the air in the temple what is the ruling is the tradition that tearing makes him liable only in the case of such tearing as may be used for prostration but for such tearing which cannot be used for prostration there is no tradition that he is liable or perhaps the tradition is that within the temple tearing makes him liable no matter whether it may be used for prostration or not it remains undecided Rashi Quirit if he defiled himself willfully what is the ruling for an accidental defilement there is a tradition that tearing is necessary but for willful defilement there is no tradition that tearing is necessary or perhaps the tradition is that within the temple tearing is necessary no matter whether for accidental or willful defilement it remains undecided Rashi Quirit does a Nazi right at a grave. Require tearing for stripes or not within the temple there is a tradition that tearing is necessary but outside there is no tradition that tearing is necessary or perhaps for accidental uncleanness there is a tradition that tearing is necessary no matter whether inside or outside it remains undecided if he went out the longer way he is liable the shorter way he is exempt etc. Rabbi said the shorter way which they said exempts him implies even walking heel to toe and even the whole day. Rabbi queried can pauses be combined let him solve it from his own statement there he is exempt only if he did not pause have a inquired of Rabbi if he went out the longer way in the time taken for the shorter way what is the ruling is the tradition that the time taken is the essential factor and if he went out the longer way in the time taken for the shorter way he is exempt or is the tradition definite that for the longer way he is liable and for the shorter way he is exempt he said to in the law that for the longer way he is liable was not given that it should be suspended for him our Zara objected strongly to this now it is established with us that an unclean priest who officiated is punished by death how can this be possible if he did not tarry how could he do the service if he tarried he is liable to Karath granted if you would say that the tradition is that time is the essential factor then it is possible if he strained himself in the shorter way after he had done the service Talmud, Mosh of but if you say that the tradition is definite how is it possible said Abbe what a question it is possible that he went out the shorter way without tarrying first and turned a piece of the sacrifice on the altar fire with a prong and this is in accordance with Arhunas view for Arhunas said a layman who turned a piece of the sacrifice on the altar fire with a prong is punished by death the text says Arhunas said a layman who turned a piece of it Sacrifice on the altar fire with the prong is punished by death. How is this? If without turning it, it would not have been consumed. This is self-evident. And if without turning it, it would also have been consumed. Then what has he done? It is not necessary for our not to state his law, except in a case where if he had not turned it, it would have been consumed in two hours. And now after turning it, it is consumed in one hour. And this law he teaches us that an acceleration of the service is also a service. Arash, I said, I wish to state a law, but I am afraid of my associates. He who enters a house plagued by leprosy backwards, even with his whole body inside, except his nose, is clean. For it is written, he that
The positive or negative precept concerning uncleanness in the temple but they the Beth Din are liable for an erroneous ruling in connection with the transgression of the positive or negative precept concerning a menstruous woman and the individuals bring a suspensive guilt offering for a doubtful sin in connection with the positive or negative precept concerning a menstruous woman so the Tana here says this is the positive precept concerning the temple for which they are not liable and which is the positive precept concerning a menstruous woman for which they are liable this if one cohabited with a clean woman and she said to him I have become unclean and he withdrew immediately he is liable because his withdrawal is as pleasant to him as his entry it was stated Abba said in the name of our high Rab he is liable to bring two sin offerings and so said Rabba that our Samuel son of Arshiba said that Arhuna said he is liable to bring two one for entering and one for withdrawing Rabba raised the question in what circumstances shall we say it was near the time of a regular period and with whom shall we say a learned man granted and for entering he should be liable for he thought I am able to cohabit but for withdrawing why should he be liable since he acted willfully Talmud, Mashabiate and if an illiterate man then both acts are the same as eating two portions of forbidden fat each the size of an olive in one spell of unawareness well then Shall we say it was not near the time of her period and with whom shall we say a learned man then he should not be liable to bring even one for in entering he was a victim of a pure accident and in withdrawing he acted willfully and if an illiterate man he is liable to bring one for withdrawing afterwards Rabba said it really refers to the time near her period and to a learned man but a learned man for this and not a learned man for that Rabba said and both these laws we have learned entering. We have learned and withdrawing we have learned withdrawing we have learned for it states if one cohabited with a clean woman and she said to him I have become unclean and he withdrew immediately he is liable entering we have learned in another mission if blood is found on his rag after cohabitation they are both unclean and are liable for a sacrifice now this surely refers does it not to the time near her period and to the act of entering our Adabim and said to Rabba no really I can say to you it refers to the time not near her period and to withdrawing and should you ask what need is there to state the law of withdrawing since it has already been stated I may reply because it is necessary to tell us if blood is found on her rag after cohabitation they are both unclean because of the doubt but exempt from bringing a sacrifice and because he wishes to teach us this law concerning if found on hers he teaches us also the law concerning if found on his set. Rabbinah to our Adah how can you maintain that that other mission refers to the time not near her period and to withdrawing seeing that it states if blood is found and found implies later and if it refers to withdrawing from the very first when he withdrew he already had the knowledge said Rabbinah to him or Adah listen to what your teacher Rabbinah tells you he replied how can you maintain that it refers to entering since it has been taught with reference to it this is a positive precept. Concerning a menstruous woman for which one is liable and if it is as you say it is a negative precept he said to him if you have learned the very thus it is defective and you should write it thus this is a negative precept concerning a menstruous woman for which one is liable if however he was cohabiting with a clean woman and she said to him I have become unclean and he withdrew immediately he is liable this is a positive precept concerning a menstruous woman etc the text says if he withdrew immediately he is liable what should he do Arhuna said in the name of Rab he should press his ten nails into the ground i.e. bed until his desire dies out Rabba said from this we may deduce that he who commits incest with member more to him is exempt for if it will enter your mind to say that he is liable what is the reason that he is exempt here because he has no alternative if it is because he has no alternative then even if he withdraws immediately let him also be exempt for he has no alternative Abbe said to him verily I may say to you he who commits incest with member more to him is liable and here the reason that he is exempt is because he has no alternative and as for your question if he withdraws immediately why is he liable I may reply because he should have withdrawn with little pleasure and he withdrew with much pleasure said Rabba behind unto Abbe if so we find a longer and a shorter route in connection with a menstruum and Talmud, Mashabiyath be whereas we learned this distinction only in the case of the temple they are not the same the longer route here is as the shorter route there and the longer route there is as the shorter route here Arhuna son of Arnathan raised an objection did Abbe then say that he had no alternative from which we deduce that we are discussing the time not near her period surely it was Abbe who said that he is liable to bring to from which we deduce that it refers to the time near her period Abbe's statement was Made elsewhere our Jonathan B. Jose B. Lacuna inquired of our Simeon B. Jose B. Lacuna where is the prohibition in the Torah against intercourse with a menstruous woman he took a clot and threw it at him prohibition against intercourse with a menstruant and into a woman who is impure by her uncleanness thou shalt not approach well then I meant to ask where do we find the warning that he who cohabits with a clean woman and she says to him I have become unclean he should not withdraw immediately. Hezekiah said scripture says and if any man lie with her a menstruous woman her impurity shall be with him even at the time of her impurity she shall be with him hence we have a positive precept whence do we derive a negative precept our papa said scripture says thou shalt not approach unto a woman who is impure thou shalt not approach means also thou shalt not withdraw for it is written to say approach to thyself come not near me for I am holier than our rabbis taught us shall yet. Separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness. Our Josiah said from this we deduce a warning to the children of Israel that they should separate from their wives near their periods. And how long before Rabbi said one own our Yohanan said in the name of our Simeon Biohei who does not separate from his wife near her period. Then even if he has sons like the sons of Aaron they will die even as it is written thus shall ye separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness. This is the law of her that is sick with her impurity and next to it. And the Lord spoke unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Our high B Abba said that our Yohanan said he who separates from his wife near her period will have male children even as it is written to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean. And next to it if a woman conceive and bear a male child our Joshua B. Levi said he will have sons worthy to be teachers for it is written that ye may make a distinction. Between the unclean and the clean, and that ye may teach our high Abba said that our Yohanan said he who recites the Havdalah over one at the termination of the Sabbath will have male children, even as it is written that ye may make a distinction between the holy and the common, and elsewhere it is written to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean, and next to it if a woman conceive and bear a male child, our Joshua B. Levi said he will have sons worthy to be teachers, even as it is written that ye may make a distinction between the holy and the common, and that ye may teach our Benjamin B. Jaffe said that our Eliezer said he who sanctifies himself during cohabitation will have male children, even as it is said, sanctify yourselves therefore and be holy, and next to it if a woman conceive and bear a male child, our Eliezer said scripture says if anyone touch the carcass of an unclean creeping thing and it be hidden from him, etc., what is the difference between their views? Hezekiah said creeping thing and carcass is the difference between the moralizer holds we require that he should know whether he had become unclean by the carcass of a creeping thing or of an animal and our akiba holds we do not require that he should know this as long as he knows that he has actually become unclean it is not necessary that he should know whether he has become unclean by a creeping thing or by an animal carcass and so said will a creeping thing and carcass is the difference between them for Ola pointed out an incongruity between one statement of moralizers and another and then explained it did moralizer then say that we require he should know whether he had become unclean by a creeping thing or by a carcass I question this for moralizer said in any case if he ate prohibited fat he is liable or if he ate nuthar he is liable if he desecrated the Sabbath he is liable or if he desecrated the day of atonement he is liable if he cohabited with his wife when menstruous he is liable or if he cohabited with his sister he is liable said our Joshua to him scripture says if his sin wherein he hath sinned be known to him only when it is known to him wherein he hath sinned Allah however explains it thus their scripture says he hath sinned and he shall bring his offering as long as he knows that he has sinned though he does not know the actual sin he brings his offering but here since it is already written if anyone touch any unclean thing why do we require or the carcass of an unclean creeping thing hence we deduce that we require he should know whether he had become unclean by a creeping thing or by an animal carcass and our akiba because Talmud, Mashabiyah the scripture wishes to write cattle and beast for the sake of rabbi's deduction it writes also creeping thing as was taught in the school of our
of the uncleanness and does he leave because of the uncleanness unless it be also because it is the temple well then there is no difference our rabbis taught two public paths one unclean and one clean and he walked along one and did not enter the temple afterwards and along the other and entered the temple he is liable to bring a sliding scale sacrifice if he walked along one and entered the temple and was sprinkled upon on the third day and again on the seventh day and bathed himself and then he walked along the other and entered the temple he is liable Arsimian Biyohe exempts him and Arsimian Bijuda exempts him in all these cases in the name of Arsimian Biyohe and all of them Talmud, Mashabiyoth B even in the first case at all events he is unclean said Rabbah here we are discussing the case of one who walked along the first path and when he walked along the second path forgot that he had already walked along the first so that he has only an incomplete knowledge of uncleanness and this is in what they differ the first Tana holds that we say an incomplete knowledge is like a complete knowledge and Arsimian Bijuda holds that we do not say an incomplete knowledge is like a complete knowledge if he walked along the first path and entered the temple and was sprinkled upon on the third day and again on the seventh day and bathed himself and then he walked along the second path and entered the temple he is liable and Arsimian B Yohe exempts him. Why is he liable? Since it is a doubtful knowledge. Our Yohanan said here they made doubtful knowledge like definite knowledge. And Rish Lakish said this is in accordance with the view of our Ishmael who holds that we do not require knowledge at the beginning. We may point out an incongruity between the words of our Yohanan here and the words of our Yohanan elsewhere, and we may point out an incongruity between the words of Rish Lakish here and the words of Rish Lakish elsewhere. For it has been taught if he ate doubtful prohibited fat and became aware of it later, and he ate again doubtful prohibited fat and became aware of it later. Rabbi said just as he would bring a sin offering for each one, so he brings a guilt offering for doubtful sin for each one. Our Simeon Bijuda and our Eliezer son of our Simeon said in the name of our Simeon Bijuda he brings only one guilt offering for doubtful sin for it is said, and he shall bring a ram for a guilt offering for his. Error wherein he heard the Torah includes many errors for one guilt offering and Rish Lakish said here Rabbi taught that the awareness of the doubt separates the acts for sin offerings and our Yohanan said Rabbi meant just as the awareness of definite sin elsewhere separates the acts for sin offerings so the awareness of doubtful sin here separates the acts for guilt offerings hence there is incongruity between our Yohanan statements and between Rish Lakish statements granted that there is no contradiction between one statement of our Yohanan and the other statement of our Yohanan for he said here they made doubtful knowledge like definite knowledge and not everywhere in the whole Torah did they do so for only here because knowledge at the beginning is not explicitly written but is deduced from and it be hidden therefore they made doubtful knowledge like definite knowledge but not everywhere in the whole Torah did they do so for it is written if his sin be known. To him a definite knowledge we require but Rish Lakish why does he establish it as being in accordance with Arishmael's view let him establish it as being in accordance with Rabbi's view this he teaches us that Arishmael does not require knowledge at the beginning but it is obvious that he does not require knowledge at the beginning for he has no extra verse from which to deduce it since he requires and it be hidden to make him liable for unawareness of temple perhaps you might think that he does not infer that we require knowledge at the beginning from the verse but he has it from a tradition therefore Rish Lakish teaches us that Arishmael definitely does not require knowledge at the beginning chapter 3 Mishnah oaths are two subdivided into four I swear I shall eat and I swear I shall not eat I swear I have eaten and I swear I have not eaten I swear I shall not eat and he ate a minute quantity he is liable this is the opinion of our Akiva, the sages said. To our Akiba, where do we find that he who eats a minute quantity is liable that this one should be liable? Our Akiba said to them, But where do we find that he who speaks brings an offering that this one should bring an offering tomorrow? Shall we say that Okal means I shall eat? We may question this, for we learned, I swear I shall not eat of thine, I swear I shall eat Okal of thine, I do not swear I shall not eat of thine, he is prohibited to eat of that man's food. Abbe said, Really, Okal means I shall eat as our Mishnah states, yet there is no difficulty here. It is a case where he is urged to eat, and there it is a case where he is not Talmud. Mashaviyatha Talmud, Mashaviyatha urged to eat. Our Mishnah refers to the case where he is not urged to eat, and the Beritha to the case where he is urged to eat, and he says, I shall not eat, I shall not eat, so that when he swears, he means, I swear I shall not eat. Our Ashi said, Read in the Beritha, I swear I shall not eat of. Thine if so what need is there to state it I might have thought his tongue became twisted therefore he teaches us that it is a definite negative our rabbis taught Mubta is an oath is an oath what is the binding force of Isar if you say that Isar is an oath he is liable and if not he is exempt if you say that Isar is an oath but you have just said that Isar is an oath Abbe said thus he means Mubta is an oath Isar is tacked onto an oath what is the binding force of Isar if you say that which is tacked onto an oath is like a properly expressed oath he is liable and if not he is exempt and how do we know that Mubta is an oath is it not because it is written if anyone swear pronouncing with his lips then Isar also should be counted an oath for it is written every vow and every oath of a bond and again how do we know that Isar has the force of being tacked onto an oath is it not because it is written or bound he sold by bond with an oath then Mubta also should have the force of being tacked onto an oath for it is written whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath but said Abbe that Mubta is an oath we deduce from this and if she be married to a husband while her vows are upon her or the utterance of her lips wherewith she hath bound her soul now oath is not mentioned with what then did she bind herself with Mubta Rabbah said in reality I can say to you that which is tacked onto an oath is not like a properly expressed oath and thus he the Tana means Mubta is an oath is or is also an oath and what is the binding force of this our scripture placed it between a vow and an oath to teach us that if he expressed it in the form of a vow it is a vow and if in the form of an oath it is an oath where did scripture place it between a vow and an oath and if in her husband's house she vowed or bound her soul by bond with an oath and they follow their own opinions for it has been stated that which is tacked onto an oath Abbe. Said it is like a properly expressed oath, and Rabbi said it is not like a properly expressed oath. An objection was raised for it has been taught what is this or which is mentioned in the Torah. He who says, I take it upon me that I shall not eat meat and that I shall not drink wine as on the day that my father died, or as on the day that so and so died, or as on the day that Kedalai son of Ahikam was killed, or as on the day that I saw Jerusalem in its destruction, he is prohibited from eating meat. Etc. And Samuel said only if he had already made a vow on that day, now it is well according to Abbe, for just as that which is tacked onto a vow is a vow, so that which is tacked onto an oath is an oath Talmud, Mashabiyath be, but according to Rabbi, it is difficult. Rabbi may say to you, explain it thus what is the binding force of a vow which is mentioned in the Torah. He who says, I take it upon me that I shall not eat meat and that I shall not drink wine as on the day that my father died, or as on the day that so and so was killed, he is prohibited from eating meat, etc. And Samuel said, Only if he had already made a vow on that day, what is the reason? Scripture says, If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, only if he vow in the matter which he had already vowed, as on the day my father died, this is self evident, as on the day that Kedalai son of Ahikam was killed, is necessary. I might have thought that since it is also prohibited, even if he had not vowed, the fact that he vowed does not bring a prohibition upon him because of his vow, so that it is present vow is not based on a previous vow and hence is not a normal vow. Therefore, he teaches us that it is so based, and because perforce he mentions this clause, he mentions also the previous clause, though it is unnecessary. And Aryohanan also holds this view of Rabba for when Rabin came from Palestine, he said that Aryohanan said, If one says Mipta that I shall not eat of thine, or so that I shall not eat of thine, it is an oath. When Ardimi came from Palestine, he said that our Yohanan said, If one says, I swear I shall eat, or I swear I shall not eat, and he transgresses the oath, it is a false oath, and its prohibition is derived from this verse, Ye shall not swear by my name falsely. If one says, I swear I have eaten, or I swear I have not eaten, and it was untrue, it is a vain oath, and its prohibition is derived from this verse, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, vows come under the prohibition of he shall not break his word,
teaches us that he is punished by stripes as have answered him and if you will I may say that just as he brings an offering for a false oath so he brings an offering for a vain oath and it is in accordance with our Akiba's view who makes him liable for an oath in the past as in the future an objection was raised what is a vain oath swearing that which is contrary to the facts known to man a false oath swearing that which is the reverse hence a false oath is in the past tense yet our Yohanan says in the future say swearing and reversing when our Abin came from Palestine he said that our Jeremiah said that our Abab said that our Yohanan said I swear I have eaten I swear I have not eaten and it was untrue our false oaths and their prohibition is from ye shall not swear by my name falsely I swear I shall eat I swear I shall not eat and he broke the oath he transgresses he shall not break his word and what is a vain oath swearing that which is contrary to the facts known to Man, our Papa said the statement of our Abbas was not explicitly expressed but only deduced by implication for our EDB. Abin said that our Amram said that our Isaac said that our Yohanan said our Judah said in the name of our Jose the Galilean every negative precept in the Torah if it involves action is punished by stripes if it does not involve action is not punished by stripes except swearing exchanging and cursing one's neighbor with the name swearing how do we know our Yohanan said in the name of our Simeon Biohi scripture says thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless the upper court will not render him guiltless but the lower court inflicts stripes and render him guiltless at our Papa to have a perhaps scripture means this he will not render him guiltless at all if it had been written for he will not hold him guiltless it would have meant what you say but now that it is written for the Lord will not hold him guiltless it means the Lord does not render him guiltless, but the lower court inflicts stripes and render him guiltless. Hence, we find that a vain oath is punished by stripes. How do we know a false oath is so punished? Our Yohanan himself said in vain is mentioned twice, since it is not needed for a vain oath. Utilize it for a false oath. And our Abba raised the question: This false oath, what kind is meant? Shall we say, I swear I shall not eat? And he ate. This is a negative precept involving action. And again, if he said, I swear I shall eat, and he did not eat, does he then receive stripes? Surely it has been stated, I swear I shall eat this loaf today, and the day passed, and he did not eat it. Our Yohanan and Reshlakish both hold that he does not receive stripes. Our Yohanan says he does not receive stripes because it is a negative precept, not involving action, and any negative precept not involving action is not punishable by stripes. And Reshlakish says he does not receive stripes because it is an uncertain. Warning and an uncertain warning is not a warning well then said Arabah it refers to I swear I have eaten I swear I have not eaten and what is the difference Rabbah said clearly did the Torah include a false oath which is like a vain oath just as a vain oath is in the past so a false oath which is in the past is included our Jeremiah put a question to Arabah we learned I swear I shall not eat this loaf I swear I shall not eat it I swear I shall not eat it and he ate it he is liable. Only for one oath this is the oath of utterance for the willful transgression of which stripes are incurred and for the unwitting transgression of which a sliding scale sacrifice is brought this is the oath etc what does this exclude surely it excludes I swear I have eaten swear I have not eaten that he is not liable for stripes no it excludes I swear I have eaten I swear I have not eaten from an offering this is the oath for the unwitting transgression of which a sliding. Scale sacrifice is brought but not I swear I have eaten I swear I have not eaten and this will be in accordance with the opinion of our Ishmael who holds that he is only liable for an oath in the future but stripes he incurs Talmud, Masjid Yath Bihau then will you explain the latter clause this is a vain oath for the willful transgression of which stripes are incurred and for the unwitting transgression of which he is exempt this is a vain oath etc what does this exclude surely it excludes I swear I have eaten I swear I have not eaten that he is not liable for stripes no this is the oath for the unwitting transgression of which he is exempt from a sacrifice but I swear I have eaten I swear I have not eaten makes him liable for a sacrifice for unwitting transgression and this will be in accordance with the opinion of our Akiva who holds that he is liable for an oath in the past as in the future but you have said that the first statement is in accordance. With our Ishmael's view is the first statement then in accordance with our Ishmael's view and the second in accordance with our Akiva's view. No, it is entirely in accordance with our Akiva's view and the first statement is not intended to exclude I swear I have eaten I swear I have not eaten from a sacrifice but to exclude elsewhere I shall eat and he did not eat from stripes but for a sacrifice he is liable why should you prefer this it is reasonable that since he is discussing the future he should exclude the future but discussing the future shall he exclude the past I swear I shall not eat and he ate a minute quantity he is liable this is the opinion of our Akiva it was queried by the scholars does our Akiva agree in the whole Torah with our Simeon who imposes liability for a minute quantity for it has been taught our Simeon says for a minute quantity stripes are incurred and it was not said that the size of an olive is necessary except for a sacrifice and by right they should. Disagree also elsewhere, but the reason their disagreement is stated here is to show you the power of the sages. For although it is possible to say, since if he had expressly stated a minute quantity, he would have been liable, he should also be liable, even if his statement is undefined. We are informed, nevertheless, that they exempt him. Or elsewhere, does our Akiva agree with the sages? And here, this is the reason, since if he expressly states a minute quantity, he is liable, he is liable. Also, if his statement is undefined, come and here they said to our Akiva, where do we find that he who eats a minute quantity is liable, that this one should be liable? And if it is so that he agrees with our Simeon elsewhere, also let him answer them. I'll agree in the whole Torah with our Simeon. It is possible that he is replying according to the views of the rabbis themselves. As for me, I agree with our Simeon in the whole Torah, but as for you, agree with me at least that since if he expressly states a minute. Quantity he is liable he should be liable also if his statement is undefined and the rabbis reply to him no come and here our Akiva says a Nazi right who soaked his bread in wine and there is sufficient in both together to make up the size of an olive is liable now if you were to hold that everywhere he agrees with our Simeon what need is there for combining and again we learned I swear I shall not eat any ate carrion trefa forbidden animals and reptiles he is liable and our Simeon exempts him and we asked why is he liable since he had already been adjured on Mount Sinai Rab and Samuel and our Yohanan said he is liable because he had included permitted things with the prohibited things and Reshlakish said you cannot find that he should be liable except either if he expressly stated half the legal quantity and it will be in accordance with the view of the rabbis or even if his statement was undefined and it will be in accordance with our Akiva's view who holds that a man in Undefined oath prohibits to himself even a minute quantity. Now, if you were to say that elsewhere, our Akiva also agrees with our Simeon, and for a minute quantity he also stands adjured from Mount Sinai. Hence, we deduce from this: must we not that elsewhere he agrees with the rabbis? It is proven they said to our Akiva, where do we find that he who eats a minute quantity is liable, etc.? Can we not? Is there not the ante creature is different? Is there not sacred property? But we require it should be. The value of a paratah is there not the expressly defined oath? An expressly defined oath is like a creature. Is there not dust? May you then Talmud, Moshe Yatha decide that which Rabbah inquired? I swear I shall not eat dust. And he ate what quantity must he eat to make him liable? May you then decide that it must be the size of an olive? No one do we say that we do not find liability for a minute quantity only in the case of an edible? Do we say so? Is there not the case of house? Are like expressly defined oaths he said to them but where do we find that he who speaks brings an offering that this one should bring an offering do we not find such a case is there not the blasphemer we mean speaking and prohibiting but this one speaks and sins is there not the Nazi right we mean bringing an offering for breaking his word but this one brings an offering so that one may again be permitted to him is there not sacred property we mean prohibiting to himself only but this one prohibits to the whole world is there not the case of vows he holds that there is no trespass offering for breaking vows Rabbah said the controversy between our Akiva and the sages is in the case of an undefined oath but if he expressly states a minute quantity all agree that he is liable for a minute quantity what is the reason an expressly defined oath is on a par with a creature and Rabbah said further the controversy is only where he says I shall not eat but if he says I shall not Taste all agree that he is liable for a minute quantity this is self-evident I might
For a minute quantity refers only to stripes and that which we learned in the Beritha that thou's combine refers to an offering where we require that the enjoyment should be the value of a pair of tasha. We say that the sages hold there is a trespass offering for Konamoth yet we learned if he says this loaf is sacred and he eats it either he or his neighbor he trespasses therefore there is redemption for it if he says this loaf is to me sacred he trespasses by eating it but his neighbor does not trespass therefore there is no redemption for it this is the opinion of our Meir Talmud. Moschavyoth B and the sages say neither he nor his neighbor trespasses by eating it for there is no trespass in Konamoth reverse it neither he nor his neighbor trespasses for there is no trespass in Konamoth this is the opinion of our Meir and the sages say he trespasses but his neighbor does not trespass if so our Meir says Konamoth are like oats implying that Konamoth do not combine. But there is trespass in them yet Armeir says there is no trespass in Konamoth at all according to the views of the sages he is replying as for me I hold there is no trespass in Konamoth at all but as for you admit to me at least that Konamoth are like oats and do not combine and the sages they reply in oaths there is the reason of our Phinehas in Konamoth there is not the reason of our Phinehas Rabbah said if a man says I swear shall not eat and he ate dust he is exempt Rabbah inquired if a man says I swear I shall not eat dust what amount must he eat to make him liable shall we say since he said I shall not eat his intention was a case a youth or since it is not something that people eat his intention was a minute quantity let it stand Rabbah inquired if a man says I swear I shall not eat grape stones what amount must he eat to make him liable shall we say since it can be eaten mixed with the grapes his intention was a cause a youth or since by itself it is not eaten by People his intention was a minute quantity let it stand Arashi inquired if a Nazi right said I swear I shall not eat grape stones what amount must he eat to make him liable shall we say since a cause a youth is prohibited in the Torah therefore when he swears he swears for that which is permitted and his intention is for a minute quantity or since he says I shall not eat his intention is a cause a youth come and here I swear I shall not eat and he ate carrion trefa forbidden animals and reptiles he is liable and our Simeon exempts him and we ask why is he liable since he stands a jurid from Mount Sinai Rab and Samuel and our Yohanan said because he included permitted things with the prohibited things and Resh Lakish said you cannot find that he should be liable except either if he expressly stated half the legal quantity in accordance with the view of the sages or if his statement was undefined in accordance with the view of our Akiba who holds that a man in an undefined oath prohibits to Himself a minute quantity now carrion for which he stands a jurid from Mount Sinai is like great stones to a Nazi right and yet only if he expressly states less than the legal quantity is he liable but if he does not expressly state this his intention is for a cause a youth it is proven well then you may decide that which Rabbah inquired if a man says I swear I shall not eat dust what amount must he eat to make him liable you may decide that it must be a cause a youth for carrion is like dust and yet he is liable only if he expressly states less than the legal quantity but if he does not expressly state this his intention is for a cause a youth no dust is not edible at all but carrion is edible except that a lion is lying on admission if a man says I swear I shall not eat and he ate and drank he is liable only once I swear I shall not eat and I shall not drink and he ate and drank he is liable twice I swear I shall not eat and he ate we bread barley bread and spelt bread he is Liable only once I swear I shall not eat wheat bread barley bread and spelt bread and he ate he is liable for each one I swear I shall not drink and he drank many liquids he is liable only once I swear I shall not drink wine oil and honey and he drank he is liable for each one I swear I shall not eat and he ate foods which are not fit to be eaten and drank liquids which are not fit to be drunk he is exempt I swear I shall not eat and he ate carrion trefa forbidden animals and reptiles he is liable and our Simeon exempts him he said I vow that my wife shall not benefit from me if I have eaten today and he had eaten carrion trefa forbidden animals or reptiles his wife is prohibited to him Gemara our high Bob and said that Samuel said if a man says I swear I shall not eat and he drank he is liable if you will it may be deduced by reason and if you will it may be deduced from scripture if you will it may be deduced by reason for a man will say to his friend let us eat something and they Go in and eat and drink and if you will it may be deduced from scripture drinking is included in eating for Resh Lakish said once do we know that drinking is included in eating because it is said and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to cause his name to dwell there the tithe of thy coin of thy wine Talmud, Mosh of Yath and now Tyrosh is wine and yet it is written thou shalt eat perhaps scripture means when used in Eleogaron for Rabbah B. Samuel said. Eleogaron contains the juice of beets Oxygaron the juice of all kinds of boiled vegetable but said our Ahabi Jacob we deduce that drinking is included in eating from the verse and thou shalt bestow the money for whatsoever thy soul desired for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink and thou shalt eat there now you is certainly wine and yet it is written thou shalt eat perhaps here also scripture means in Eleogaron strong drink is written implying that which can cause. Intoxication perhaps pressed figs from Gila are intended for it was taught if he ate a pressed fig from Gila or drank honey or milk and entered the temple and ministered he is liable well then we deduce that drinking is included in eating by analogy from strong drink used here and in connection with the Nazi right just as there it implies wine so here it implies wine Rabbah said we have also learned thus I swear I shall not eat and he ate and drank he is liable only once granted if you say that drinking is included in eating it is necessary for the Tana to teach us that nevertheless he is liable only once but if you say that drinking is not included in eating if he says I swear I shall not eat and he ate and did work would it be necessary for the Tana to teach us that he is liable only once Abbe said to him what then drinking is included in eating if so read the second clause I swear I shall not eat and I shall not drink and he ate and drank he is liable twice now. Since he said I shall not eat he is already prohibited from drinking then when he says I shall not drink why should he be liable if he had said I shall not drink twice would he have been liable twice he replied to him there the Mishnah means he first said I shall not drink and then he said I shall not eat for drinking is included in eating but eating is not included in drinking but if he said I swear I shall not eat and I shall not drink and he ate and drank he would be liable only once if. So why does he teach in the first clause I swear I shall not eat and he ate and drank he is liable only once let him teach I swear I shall not eat and I shall not drink he is liable only once and most certainly we should know when he says I shall not eat alone he is liable only once we must therefore read the Mishnah as it stands but here it is different since he said I shall not eat and then he said I shall not drink he revealed his mind that this eating that he mentioned meant eating only. Our Ashi said our mission also proves it I swear I shall not eat and he ate foods which are not fit to be eaten and drank liquids which are not fit to be drunk he is exempt this implies that if they are fit he is liable but why so surely he said merely I swear I shall not eat perhaps he said both I swear I shall not eat I swear I shall not drink I swear I shall not eat and he ate wheat bread etc but perhaps he wished to exempt himself from other kinds in that case he should have said I shall not eat wheat barley and spelt but perhaps that would have meant to chew he could have said I shall not eat the bread of wheat barley and spelt but perhaps that would have meant the bread of wheat to eat and barley and spelt to chew he could have said I shall not eat the bread of wheat and of barley and of spelt Talmud, Master Yathbi but perhaps that would have meant mixed say he could have said I shall not eat the bread of wheat and also of barley and also of spelt. Why is bread repeated obviously in order to separate I swear I shall not drink and he drank many liquids he is liable only once etc granted there as you say the word bread being superfluous makes him liable but here what could he have said perhaps he wishes to exempt himself from other liquids our papa said here we are discussing the case of where they are lying before him so that he could have said I swear I shall not drink these but perhaps that would have meant these I shall not drink but others of the same kind I shall drink well he could have said I swear I shall not drink liquids just like these perhaps that would have meant just like these I shall not drink but less than these or more than these I shall drink well then he could have said I swear I shall not drink of these kinds perhaps that would have meant these kinds I shall not drink but these themselves I shall drink say he could have said I shall not drink these and their kinds are aha the son of R I K said we
Carrion Treff of forbidden animals and reptiles he is liable what is the difference between the first clause where he is exempt and the second where he is liable this is no question the first clause relates to an undefined oath and the second to a defined oath in the case of a defined oath itself it may also be asked why surely he is a Druid from Mount Sinai Rab and Samuel and Aryohan and said because he included permitted foods with the prohibited foods and Reshlech said you cannot find that he should be liable except either if he expressly states half the legal quantity in accordance with the view of the rabbis or if his oath is undefined in accordance with the view of our Akiva who says a man in an undefined oath prohibits to himself even a minute quantity granted Aryohan and does not agree with Reshlech because he wishes to expound our mission in accordance with the views of all but why does not Reshlech agree with Aryohan and he may reply to you we say that a more Inclusive prohibition falls on a less inclusive one Talmud, Mashabiyat only when the more inclusive prohibition comes of its own accord but when the prohibition is imposed by himself we do not say this granted according to Rish Lakish it is for this reason that our Simeon exempts him for we learned our Simeon says a minute quantity imposes liability for stripes and it was not said that a cause is necessary except for imposing liability for a sacrifice but according to our Yohanan. What is our Simon's reason for exempting him is not the reason that the sages make him liable because it is a more inclusive prohibition our Simeon is consistent in his view that a more inclusive prohibition cannot take effect for it has been taught our Simeon says he who eats carrion on the day of atonement is exempt granted according to Rish Lakish it is possible to have it negative and positive but according to our Yohanan granted that negative is possible but how is positive possible well then. The Mishnah may be explained in accordance with Rabbah's view for Rabbah said if a man says I swear I shall not eat and he ate dust he is exempt. Armari said we have also learned thus I vow that my wife shall not benefit from me if I have eaten today and he had eaten carrion treff off forbidden animals and reptiles his wife is prohibited to him hence eating carrion is also called eating how now there since first he ate and then he swore Talmud, Mashabiyat he had made it important but here. Did he make it important Rabbah said what is the reason of the one who holds an inclusive prohibition can take effect on a previous prohibition because it is analogous to an extensive prohibition and the reason of the one who exempts him not holding this because he says an extensive prohibition is applicable only to one piece but not to two pieces and Rabbah said further according to the one who holds an inclusive prohibition takes effect on a previous prohibition if one says I swear I shall. Not eat figs and then says I swear I shall not eat figs and grapes because it takes effect on the grapes it takes effect also on the figs but this is self-evident I might have thought that in the case of a prohibition which comes of its own accord we say it takes effect on a previous prohibition but in the case of a prohibition which is imposed by himself we do not say this therefore he teaches us that even in this case it takes effect Rabbi the son of Rabbi raised an objection we learned one may eat one portion of Kazayit and yet be liable for it for sin offerings and one guilt offering thus an unclean person who ate halab which was not hara holy food on the day of atonement our mayor said also if it was Sabbath and he carried it out in his mouth he is liable the sages said to him it is not in the same category now if it is as you say it is possible to have five for example if he said I swear I shall not eat dates and halab because it takes effect on it. Dates it takes effect also on the hell of the Tana mentions only the case of a prohibition which comes of its own accord but a prohibition imposed by himself he does not mention but he mentions holy food it refers to a firstborn which is holy from the womb if you will you may say the Tana mentions only that which does not come within the category of absolution but an oath which comes within the category of absolution he does not mention but he mentions holy food while well, we have established that it refers to a firstborn if you will you may say the Tana mentions only the case where a fixed sacrifice is brought but where a sliding scale sacrifice is brought he does not mention but he mentions an unclean person who ate holy food for which a sliding scale sacrifice is brought it refers to a prince and it is in accordance with the view of our Eliezer who says a prince brings a goat or as he said the Tana mentions only that which takes effect on the legal minimum but an oath which takes effect on less than the legal minimum he does not mention but he mentions holy food because we require that it should be the value of a parata and our ashi of Ibarya said in the name of our Zara the Tana mentions only that for which for willful transgression Karath is inflicted but that for which for willful transgression there is only a negative prohibition he does not mention but he mentions a guilt offering in the case of which for willful transgression there is only a negative prohibition Talmud, Mashabiyat we mean in the case of a sin offering Rabbana said the Tana mentions only that which is applicable to foods but an oath which can take effect even on that which is not a food he does not mention but he mentions holy things which are applicable also to wood and stone well then he mentions only that which is applicable to that which has substance but an oath which can take effect also on that which has no substance as for example I shall sleep or I shall not sleep he does not mention Mishnah it is the same whether he swears of things concerning himself or of things concerning others or of things which have substance or of things which have no substance how so if he said I swear that I shall give to so and so or I shall not give I have given or I have not given I shall sleep or I shall not sleep I have slept or I have not slept I shall throw a pebble in the sea or I shall not throw I have thrown or I have not thrown he is liable R. Ishmael says he is liable only for an oath in the future for it is said to do evil or to do good our Akiva said to him if so we know only such cases where doing evil and doing good are applicable but how do we know such cases where doing evil and doing good are not applicable he replied to him from the amplification of the verse whereupon he said to him if the verse amplifies for that it amplifies for this also Gemara our rabbis taught there is a greater restriction in vows than in oaths in one respect and there is a greater restriction in oaths than in vows in another respect the greater restriction in vows is that vows take effect on a precept as on an optional matter which is not the case in oaths the greater restriction in oaths is that oaths take effect on a thing which has no substance as on a thing which has substance which is not the case in vows how so if he said I swear that I shall give to so and so or I shall not give what is meant by I shall give shall we say charity to the poor for that he already stands a druid from Mount Sinai for it is said thou shalt surely give him it must therefore mean to give to a rich man I shall sleep or I shall not sleep this cannot be for our Yohan and said he who says I shall not sleep three days is given stripes and he may sleep immediately there he said three here he did not say three I shall throw a pebble in the sea or I shall not throw it was stated if a man says I swear that so and so threw a pebble in the sea or that he did not throw rap said he is liable and Samuel said he is exempt rap said he is liable because it is applicable in both negative and positive forms and Samuel said he is exempt because it is not applicable in the future shall we say that they disagree on the same principle on which our Ishmael and our Akiva disagree for we learned our Ishmael says he is liable only for an oath in the future for it is said to do evil or to do good our Akiva said to him if so we know only such cases where doing evil and doing good are applicable but how do we know such cases where doing evil and doing good are not applicable he replied to him from the amplification of the verse whereupon he said to him if the verse amplified for that it amplified for this also shall we say that rap agrees with our Akiva and Samuel agrees with our Ishmael no with reference to our Ishmael's view they do not disagree for since even in a case which is possible of application in the future our Ishmael does not make him liable for the past obviously in a case which is not possible of application in the future he most certainly does not make him liable for the past but they disagree with reference to our Akiva's view Rab agrees with our Akiva and Samuel says our Akiva makes him liable therefore an oath in the past because in a case which is possible of application in the future our Akiva makes him liable for the past but in a case which is not possible of application in the future he does not make him liable for the past shall we say that they disagree on the same principle on which Talmud, Mashabiyat B are Judah B and the rabbis disagree for we learned if he swore to annul a precept and did not annul it he is exempt to fulfill a precept and did not fulfill it he is exempt though logically he should be liable in the second case as is the opinion of our Judah B therefore our Judah B Bithera said if for an optional matter for which he is not a Jew from Mount Sinai he is liable for a precept for which he is a Jew from Mount Sinai he should most certainly be liable they reply to him no if you say that for an oath on an optional matter he is liable it is because scripture has made negative
did not put on Tefillin, he is liable for strikes, robberies, and objection. We learned what is of an oath if he swore that which is contrary to the facts known to man, saying of a pillar of stone that it was of gold, and Allah said, provided that it was already known to three men that it was of stone. Now the reason that he is liable for an oath is because it is known to three men that it is of stone, but if it were not known to three men, he would be transgressing an oath of utterance. Why it is not applicable in the future, I swear it will be of gold. He himself put the question and he himself answered it. If it is known, he transgresses of an oath. If it is not known, he transgresses a false oath. Abbe said, Rabbi admits that he who says to his neighbor, I swear that I know some testimony for you, and it was found that he did not know is exempt because it is not applicable negatively. I do not know any testimony for you if a man says I did no testimony for you or I did not. Know in this there is disagreement between Rab and Samuel. I bore witness for you or I did not bear witness in this. There is also disagreement between them. Granted, according to Samuel, who says that in a case which is not applicable in the future, he is not liable for the past. Therefore, the divine law removed the oath of testimony from the category of the oath of utterance. But according to Rab, for what purpose did the divine law remove it? The rabbi said to Abbe in order to make him liable for it twice. He, however, replied to them, You cannot say he is liable twice, for it has been taught when he shall be guilty in one of these things. For one, you make him liable, but you do not make him liable for too well. Then, according to Abbe, for what purpose did the divine law remove the oath of testimony from the category of the oath of utterance? In Rab's view, for this purpose it has been taught in all of them. It is said and it was hidden from him, but here it is not said and. It was hidden in order to make him liable for willful as for unwitting transgression. The rabbi said to Abbe, say that for willful transgression he is liable. One for unwitting two, he replied to them, is that not what I said? It is written in one of these things. For one, you make him liable, but you do not make him liable for two. And if it refers to willful transgression, are there then two? Rabbi said because it was a matter included in a generalization, and it was singled out from it. Generalization in order to introduce an anomaly. Therefore, you cannot add anything to this anomaly. This would imply that Abbe holds that the oath of utterance is still in existence, but did not Abbe say Rabbi admits that he who says to his neighbor, I swear that I know some testimony for you, and it was found that he did not know is exempt because it is not applicable negatively. I do not know any testimony for you. Abbe withdrew from that statement, or if you will, you may say Talmud, Moss. Shabbat, one of them was stated by our Papa Arishmael says he is liable only for an oath in the future. Our rabbis taught to do evil or to do good from this. We know only such cases where doing evil and doing good are applicable. But how do we know such cases where doing evil and doing good are not applicable? Because it is said, or if anyone swear clearly with his lips from this, we know only oaths in the future. How do we know oaths in the past? Because it is said, whatsoever it be that a man shall utter clearly with an oath. This is the opinion of our Akiba Arishmael says to do evil or to do good implies the future. Our Akiba said to him, if so, we know only such cases where doing evil and doing good are applicable. How do we know such cases where doing evil and doing good are not applicable? He replied to him from the amplification of the verse whereupon he said to him, if the verse amplified for that it amplified for this also well, did our Akiba reply to our Ishmael, our Yohan and said, our Ishmael who ministered to our Nihunya Bihakana who expounded the whole Torah on the principle of generalization and specification also expounded it on the principle of generalization and specification our Akiba who ministered to Nahum of Gamza who expounded the whole Torah on the principle of amplification and limitation also expounded it on the principle of amplification and limitation how does our Akiba expound it on the principle of amplifications and limitations it has been taught or if anyone swear clearly with his lips this amplifies to do evil or to do good this limits whatsoever it be that a man shall utter clearly with an oath this again amplifies because it amplifies limits and amplifies it includes all what does it include it includes all things what does it exclude it excludes a precept and our Ishmael expounds it on the principle of generalization and specification or if anyone swear clearly with his lips this generalizes to do evil or to do good this specifies Whatsoever it be that a man shall utter clearly with an oath, this again generalizes because it generalizes specifies and generalizes you may include in the generalization only those oaths which are similar to the specification just as the specification is clearly in the future so all oaths in the future may be included the generalization helping to include even cases where doing evil and doing good are not applicable as long as they are oaths in the future and the specification. Helping to exclude even cases where doing evil and doing good are applicable if they are oaths in the past let me reverse it our Isaac said we include only oaths similar to the oath to do evil or to do good where the prohibition is on account of he shall not break his word but exclude this oath where the prohibition is not on account of he shall not break his word but on account of ye shall not lie our Isaac B. Abin said scripture says or if anyone swear clearly with his lips the oath must. Precede the utterance and not the utterance precede the oath this excludes I ate or I did not eat where the action precedes the oath our rabbis taught whatsoever it be that a man shall utter clearly with an oath this excludes a false oath by accident and it be hid this excludes willful transgression of oath from him this implies that the oath was hidden from him I might think that even if the thing be hidden from him he should be liable therefore it is said with an oath and it be hid for the unawareness of the oath he is liable and he is not liable for the unawareness of the thing the master said a man with an oath this excludes a false oath by accident how is this as the case of our Kahana and RC when they rose from the lecture of Rab one said I swear that the said Rab and the other said I swear that the said Rab when they came again before Rab he would agree with one of them and the other would say to him did I then swear falsely he would Reply to him your heart deceived you and it be hid from him this implies that the oath was hidden from him I might think that even if the thing be hidden from him he should be liable therefore it is said with an oath and it be hid for the unawareness of the oath he is liable and he is not liable for the unawareness of the thing they left at this in the west granted unawareness of oath is possible without unawareness of thing for example if he said I swear I shall not eat we bread and he thought he had said I shall eat his oath he forgot and the thing he remembered but unawareness of thing without unawareness of oath how is that possible if for example he said I swear I shall not eat we bread and he thought he had said barley bread his oath he remembered and the thing he forgot since he forgot the thing it is automatically unawareness of oath well then said our Eliezer this and that our one our Joseph demurred this means that unawareness of thing Without unawareness of oath is by no means possible but surely it is possible for example if he said I swear I shall not eat wheat bread and he stretched out his hand to the basket to take barley bread but wheat bread came to his hand and he thinking it was barley bread ate it now his oath he remembered but it was the thing that he did not know Abbe said to him but do you not make him liable for an offering for that which he holds in his hand it is therefore unawareness of oath another version Abbe said to our Joseph in any case he should bring an offering for this bread for it is unawareness of oath and our Joseph he may reply to you since if he had known that this was wheat he would have refrained from eating it it is unawareness of thing Rabbi inquired of our nomin if there was unawareness of both what is the ruling he said to him since there is unawareness of oath he is liable on the contrary since there is unawareness of thing he should be exempt our Ashi said we observe if because of the oath he refrains it is a case of unawareness of oath and he is liable and if because of the thing he refrains it is a case of unawareness of thing and he is exempt said Rabbanit to Arashi does he then refrain because of the oath unless it be also because of the thing and does he refrain because of the thing unless it be also because of the oath there is really no difference Rabbanit inquired of Arnam and Talmud, Mashabiyath be what is unwitting transgression of oath of utterance in the past if he knew it is willful transgression if he did not know it is accidental transgression he replied to him it is possible in the case of one who says I know that this oath is prohibited but I do not know whether one is liable to bring an offering for it or not according to whom will this be according to Manabez who holds that ignorance of liability for an offering is termed ignorance you may however say that it will be even in accordance with the view of the rabbis. For the rabbis disagree with Manabez only in the rest of the Torah where there is no innovation but here where there is an innovation for in the whole Torah we do not find that the unwitting transgression of a negative precept for the willful transgression of which Karath is not inflicted should make him liable for an offering for we deduce it from the ruling concerning idolatry yet here it does make him liable to bring an offering even the sages admit Rabbah inquired
means with the lips but not if he decided in his mind to utter it with his lips and did not utter it if he decided in his mind simply how do we know that he is liable because it is said whatsoever it be that a man shall utter clearly but against Samuel the question remains are she's hates and answer it thus with the lips but not if he decided in his mind to utter wheat bread and he uttered barley bread if he decided in his mind to utter wheat bread and he uttered bread simply how do we know that he is liable because it is said whatsoever it be that a man shall utter clearly an objection was raised that which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt observe and do from this we know only if he uttered it with his lips if he decided in his mind how do we know that he must keep his promise because it is said all who were willing hearted brought an offering of gold unto the Lord there it is different because it is written all who were willing hearted but let us deduce from it no because tabernacle offerings and holy things are two verses which come as one and all cases of two verses which come as one do not teach for other cases that is well according to the one who holds that they do not teach but according to the one who holds that they do teach what shall we say this is Holland and the others are holy things and Holland we cannot deduce from holy things Talmud Moshe Yatha Mishnah if he swore to annul a precept and did not annul it he is exempt to fulfill a precept and did not fulfill it he is exempt though logically in the second instance he should have been liable as is the opinion of our Judah Bibathera for our Judah Bibathera said now if for an optional matter for which he is not a Jew from Mount Sinai he is liable for a precept for which he is a Jew from Mount Sinai he should most certainly be liable they reply to him no if you say that for an oath in an optional matter he is liable it is because scripture has in that case Made negative equal to positive for liability, but how can you say that for an oath to fulfill a precept he is liable since scripture has not in that case made negative equal to positive for if he swore to annul a precept and did not annul it he is exempt. Tomorrow our rabbis taught I might think that if he swore to annul a precept and did not annul it he should be liable therefore it is said to do evil or to do good just as doing good is optional so doing evil must be optional I must. Therefore exclude if he swore to annul a precept and did not annul it for which he is exempt I might think that if he swore to fulfill a precept and did not fulfill it he should be liable therefore it is said to do evil or to do good just as doing evil is optional so doing good must be optional I must therefore exclude if he swore to fulfill a precept and did not fulfill it for which he is exempt I might think that if he swore to do evil to himself and did not do so that he should be exempt. Therefore it is said to do evil or to do good just as doing good is optional so doing evil must be optional I will therefore include if he swore to do evil to himself and did not do so that he is liable for the option is in his own hands I might think that if he swore to do evil to others and did not do so that he should be liable therefore it is said to do evil or to do good just as doing good is optional so doing evil must be optional I will therefore exclude if he swore to do evil to others and did not do so that he is exempt for the option is not in his hands once do we know to include an oath to do good to others because it is said or to do good and what is doing evil to others I shall smite so and so and crack his brain but how do we know that the verses refer to optional matters perhaps they refer also to matters relating to precepts that cannot enter our minds for we require that doing good shall be similar to doing evil and that doing evil shall be similar to Doing good for the verse likens doing evil to doing good just as doing good cannot refer to the annulling of a precept so doing evil cannot refer to the annulling of a precept so that this doing evil is actually doing good and it likens doing good to doing evil just as doing evil cannot refer to the fulfilling of a precept so doing good cannot refer to the fulfilling of a precept so that this doing good is actually doing evil if so even in an optional matter it is not possible well then. Since the word or is necessary in order to include doing good to others we deduce that the verses refer to optional matters for if it should enter your mind that they refer to matters relating to precepts we would not require the word or to include doing good to others for since doing evil to others is included doing good is certainly included but this word or is necessary to separate the phrases to separate them the word is not necessary that is so according to our Jonathan but According to our Josiah what is to be said for it has been taught a man who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death from this we know only if he curses his father and his mother if he curses his father and not his mother or his mother and not his father how do we know that he is liable because it is also said his father or his mother he hath cursed his father he hath cursed his mother he hath cursed this is the opinion of our Josiah our Jonathan said it may imply both together and it may also imply each one alone Talmud must of be unless the verse clearly specifies together according to our Josiah then how do we know that the verse concerning oath refers to optional matters you may say that it will be even in accordance with the view of our Josiah he agrees with our Akiva who expounds the verse on the principle of amplification and limitation so that granted if you say the verse refers to optional matters it may exclude a precept but if you say it Refers also to precepts what can it exclude our Judah be said now if for an optional matter etc. Well did the rabbis reply to our Judah Bibathera and our Judah Bibathera he may reply to you is there not the case of doing good to others which though it is not applicable negatively in doing evil to others is yet included by the divine law similarly therefore in the case of fulfilling a precept though it is not applicable negatively in annulling a precept it may be included by the divine law and the rabbis there it is applicable negatively in such a case as I shall not do good to others but here is it applicable negatively and I shall not fulfill the precept mission I swear I shall not eat this loaf I swear I shall not eat it I swear I shall not eat it and he ate it he is liable only once this is the oath of utterance for which one is liable for its willful transgression stripes and for its unwitting transgression a sliding scale sacrifice for a vain oath one is liable. For willful transgression stripes and for unwitting transgression one is exempt tomorrow why does he state I swear I shall not eat this loaf I swear I shall not eat it this he teaches us the reason is because he said I swear I shall not eat then he said I swear I shall not eat it therefore he is liable only once but if he said I swear I shall not eat it and then he said I swear I shall not eat he is liable twice as his robber's view for robber said if he said I swear I shall not eat this loaf as soon as he ate a cause a youth of it he is liable but if he said I swear I shall not eat it he is not liable until he eats it all I swear I shall not eat it and he ate it he is liable only once etc why is this further oath necessary this he teaches us that there is no liability but the oath remains so that if room is found it takes effect for what practical purpose for that which robber said for robber said if he obtained absolution from the first the second takes effect in its place. Shall we say that the following supports him for it has been taught he who bowed two vows of Nazi rightship and counted the first and set apart the offering for it and then obtained absolution from the first and the second vow takes the place of the first vow now there the second vow of Nazi rightship is at least in existence so that when he would have finished counting for the first he would have had to begin counting for the second even if there had been no absolution but here would the second oath have any existence at all were it not for the absolution from the first robber said if he swore concerning a loaf and was eating it then if he left a cause a youth of it he may obtain absolution from it but if he has eaten it all he cannot obtain absolution from it said Araha the son of Rabba to Arashi how is this if he said I shall not eat then from the first cause a youth he has already transgressed the prohibition and if he said I shall not eat it then why mention cause a youth Talmud? Mashabiyatha even if only a minute quantity is left he should obtain absolution also if you will you may say that he said I shall not eat and if you will you may say that he said I shall not eat if you will you may say that he said I shall not eat and since absolution is effective for the last cause a absolution is effective also for the first cause a and if you will you may say that he said I shall not eat it now if he left the cause a it is of sufficient consequence to have absolution obtained for it but if not it is not of sufficient consequence to have absolution obtained for it an objection was raised he who vowed two vows of Nazi rightship and counted the first and set apart an offering for it and then obtained absolution from the first the second vow takes the place of the first year we are discussing the case where he has not yet obtained atonement but surely it has been taught even if he obtained atonement he can still obtain absolution it refers to the case where he had not yet shaved and it is in accordance with the view of our Eliezer who holds that shaving is indispensable but surely it has also been taught even if he shaved he can still obtain absolution or as she said you put a question from that which obtains in the case of Nazi rightship there is no comparison what caused the second vow not to take effect the first well it is no more Mimar however
each other I shall not eat this one if I eat that one I shall not eat that one if I eat this one then if he ate this one willfully mindful of the oath concerning it but forgetful of the oath concerning the other and ate the other willfully mindful of the oath concerning it but forgetful of the oath concerning the first he is exempt if he ate this one unwittingly forgetful of the oath concerning it but mindful of the oath concerning the other and ate the other unwittingly forgetful of the oath concerning it but mindful of the oath concerning the first he is liable both unwittingly he is exempt both willfully then for the second he is liable but for the first the ruling depends on the controversy between Aryuhan and Reshlakish Armari said we have also learned thus in a mission of four vows did the sages permit vows of urging vows of hyperbole vows made unwittingly and vows accidentally unfulfilled vows made unwittingly how this loaf to me if I ate or Drank today and he remembered that he had eaten or drunk on this loaf to me if I eat or drink today and he forgot and ate or drank he is permitted to eat that loaf and it was taught with reference to this just as vows made unwittingly are permitted so oaths made unwittingly are permitted if I learned the laws of oaths in the school of Rabbi his brother Abumi met him and asked him if one said I swear I have not eaten I swear I have not eaten and he had eaten what is the ruling. He replied he is liable only once he said to him you are mistaken for surely a false oath went forth from his mouth he asked him again if one said I swear I shall not eat nine fix I swear I shall not eat ten fix and he ate ten fix what is the ruling he replied he is liable for each oath he said to him you are mistaken for if he will not eat nine he will not eat ten he asked him again if one said I swear I shall not eat ten fix I swear I shall not eat nine fix and he ate. 10 What is the ruling? He replied, He is liable only once he said to him, You are mistaken. 10 He would not eat, but 9 He would eat. Abbe said, Sometimes this ruling of Ephah is possible, as the master said, for Rabbi said, If a man said, I swear I shall not eat fix and grapes together in one day, then he said, I swear I shall not eat fix Talmud, Mosh of and he ate fix and set apart the offering, and then he ate grapes alone. The grapes are then only half the quantity and for half the quantity he is not liable. So here also, if he said, I swear I shall not eat 10 fix, and then he said, I swear I shall not eat 9 fix, and he ate 9 and set apart the offering, and then he ate a 10th fig, the 10th is then only half the quantity and for half the quantity he is not liable. Mishnah, what is a vain oath if he swore that which is contrary to the facts known to man, saying of a pillar of stone that it is a gold, or of a man that he is a woman, or of a woman that she is a man if he Swore concerning a thing which is impossible as e.g. if I have not seen a camel flying in the air or if I have not seen a serpent like the beam of the olive press if he said to witnesses come and bear testimony for me and they replied we swear that we will not bear testimony for you if he swore to an olive precept as e.g. not to make a sukkah or not to take a lulab or not to put on tefillin these are vain oaths for which one is liable for willful transgression stripes and for unwitting. Transgression one is exempt if a man said I swear I shall eat this loaf I swear I shall not eat it the first is an oath of utterance and the second is a vain oath if he ate it he transgressed the vain oath if he did not eat it he transgressed the oath of utterance Gamar said provided that it was already known to three men if he swore concerning a thing which is impossible as e.g. if I have not seen a camel flying in the air I swear that I have seen he does not say what then is meant. If I have not seen Abbe said learn I swear I have seen Rabbi said the Mishnah means he said I swear that all the fruits of the world shall be prohibited to me if I have not seen a camel flying in the air said Rabbi to Arashi perhaps this man saw a large bird and gave it the name of camel and when he swore he swore according to his own mind and if you say we go according to his mouth and we do not go according to his mind that cannot be for it has been taught when they adjure him they say to him know that we do not adjure you according to your own mind but according to the mind of the omnipresent and the mind of the Bethin what is the reason is it not because we say perhaps he gave him counters and called them Zuzim in which case when he swears he swears according to his own mind know there the reason is because of the king of Rabbi come and here and so we find that when Moses adjured the Israelites he said to them know that I do not adjure you according to your own minds. But according to the mind of the omnipresent and according to my mind now why should he say this let him say to them fulfill what God has decreed is it not then because they might bring to their minds an idol no but because an idol is also called God for it is written gods of silver or gods of gold ye shall not make unto you well let him say to them fulfill the Torah that might have implied one Torah let him then say fulfill the two Torah that might have implied the Torah of sin. Offering and the Torah of trespass offering let him say fulfill the whole Torah that might have implied merely the avoidance of idolatry for it has been said important is idolatry and that he who denies it is as if he accepts the whole Torah well let him say to them fulfill the precept that would have implied one precept let him say fulfill the precepts that might have implied merely two let him say fulfill all the precepts that might have implied the precept of for a master. Said the precept of Ksitsis is equal to all the precepts together then let him say to them fulfill the 613 precepts but even according to your reasoning let him say according to my mind why is it necessary to add according to the mind of the omnipresent Talmud, Mashabiyath be obviously therefore merely so that there should not be any absolution for their oath if I have not seen a serpent like the beam of the olive press and is it not possible oh there was one in it. Reign of King Shippur which swallowed 13 high stuff with straw Samuel said he meant striped but they are all striped he meant striped on his back I swear I shall eat this loaf I swear I shall not eat it etc now for the oath of utterance he is liable and for the vain oath he is not liable surely the oath was uttered in vain our Jeremiah said learn also the oath of utterance mission of the oath of utterance applies to men and women to relatives and non-relatives to those qualified to. Bear witness and those not qualified whether uttered before the Bethdin or not before the Bethdin but it must be uttered with a man's own mouth and he is liable for willful transgression stripes and for unwitting transgression a sliding scale sacrifice of a oath applies to men and women to non-relatives and relatives to those qualified to bear witness and those not qualified whether uttered before the Bethdin or not before the Bethdin but it must be uttered with his own mouth. And he is liable for willful transgression stripes and for unwitting transgression he is exempt in the case of both this and that oath if he was adjured by the mouth of others he is liable thus if he said I have not eaten today or I have not put on tefillin today and the other said I adjure thee and he said amen he is liable Gamara Samuel said he who responds amen after an oath it is as if he uttered the oath with his own mouth for it is written and a woman shall say amen amen our papa. Said in the name of Rabbi Mishnah and Abari, they also prove it for the Mishnah states the oath of testimony applies to men and not to women, to non-relatives and not to relatives, to those qualified to bear witness and not to those unqualified, and it applies only to those liable to bear witness and whether uttered before the Bethdin or not before the Bethdin, if uttered with his own mouth, but if adjured by the mouth of others, he is not liable unless he denies it before the Bethdin. This is the opinion of our Meir and in the Bari, it was taught what is the oath of testimony. He said to witnesses, Come and bear testimony for me, and they replied, We swear we know no testimony for you, or they said we know no testimony for you, and he said, I adjure you, and they responded, Amen, whether it was uttered before the Bethdin or not before the Bethdin, whether from their own mouths or the mouths of others, since they denied knowing any testimony, they are liable. This is the opinion of Armenir now they contradict each other obviously therefore we deduce from this that here it is a case where he said amen and there a case where he did not say amen this proves it Rabbin said in the name of Rabbi Armishnah also proves it for it states the oath of utterance applies to men and women to non-relatives and relatives to those qualified to bear witness and those not qualified whether uttered before the Bethdin or not before the Bethdin but it must be uttered with his own mouth hence if uttered with his own mouth he is liable but from the mouth of others he is not liable and yet the last clause states in the case of both this and that oath if he was adjured by the mouth of others he is liable thus they contradict each other obviously therefore we must infer from this that here it is a case where he said amen and there a case where he did not say amen but if so what does Samuel teach us the deduction of the Mishnah he teaches us Talmud, Mas. Shabbat chapter 4 mission of the oath of testimony applies to men and not to women to non-relatives and not to relatives to those qualified to bear witness and not to those unqualified and it applies only to those liable to bear witness and
Then two come to court and do not three ever come to court but if you wish to say something to refute this deduction I give you another here it is said to and there it is said to just as there it refers to witnesses so here it refers to witnesses what is meant by if you wish to say something to refute this you might say the verse refers to plaintiff and defendant therefore I give the second deduction here it is said to and there it is said to just as there it refers to witnesses so. Here it refers to witnesses another bury the teachers and the two men shall stand the verse refers to witnesses you say it refers to witnesses but perhaps it refers to the litigants you may retort to then men come to court and do not women ever come to court but if you wish to say something to refute this deduction I give you another here it is said to and there it is said to just as there it refers to witnesses so here it refers to witnesses what is meant by if you wish to say. Something to refute this you might say it is not usual for a woman because all glorious is the king's daughter within therefore I give the second deduction here it is said to and there it is said to just as there it refers to witnesses so here it refers to witnesses our rabbis taught and the two men shall stand it is a precept that the litigants stand our Judah said I heard that if they desire to allow them both to sit they may allow them to sit what is prohibited one should not stand and the other said one speak all that he wishes and the other bidden to be brief our rabbis taught in righteousness shall thou judge thy neighbor that one should not sit and the other stand one speak all that he wishes and the other bidden to be brief another interpretation in righteousness shall thou judge thy neighbor judge thy neighbor in the scale of merit our Joseph learned in righteousness shall thou judge thy neighbor he who is with the in Torah and precepts endeavor to judge him. Favorably Arola the son of Arlay had a case before Arnaman and Arjoseph sent a message to him our friend Ola is a neighbor in Torah and precepts said Arnaman why did he send this message to me that I should favor him and he said probably that I should settle his case first Talmud, Moshev Yathbi or with reference to the discretion of the judges Ola said the controversy is in regard to the litigants but in regard to witnesses all agree that they must stand for it is written and the two men shall stand Arhuna said the controversy is in regard to the time of the discussion but at the time of the completion of the case all agree that the judges sit and the litigants stand for it is written and Moses sat to judge the people and the people stood another version the controversy is in regard to the time of the discussion but at the time of the completion of the case all agree that the judges sit and the litigants stand for witnesses are like the completion of the case and it is written with reference to them and the two men shall stand the widow of Arhuna had a case before Arnaman he said to himself what shall I do if I should rise before her the plea of her opponent will be stopped up if I should not rise before her I should be doing wrong for the wife of a scholar is like a scholar so he said to his attendant go and make a duck fly over me and urge it towards me so that I will rise but the master said the controversy is in regard to the time of the discussion but at the time of the completion of the case all agree that the judges sit and the litigants stand he sits as one who unties his shoes and says you so and so are innocent and you so and so are guilty rabbi son of Arhuna said if a rabbinical scholar and an illiterate person have some dispute with each other and come to court we persuade the rabbinical scholar to sit and to the illiterate person we also say sit and if he stands it matters not rabbi son of Arsharabia had a case before our papa he told him to sit and told his opponent also to sit but the attendant of the court came and nudged the illiterate man and made him stand up and our papa did not say to him sit how could he do so will not the others please be stopped up our papa may say he will say he has asked me to sit but the attendant was not appeased by me and rabbi son of Arhuna said if a rabbinical scholar and an illiterate person have some dispute with each other the scholar should not come first and sit down before the judge because it will appear as if he is setting forth his case and we do not say this except when he has not a fixed time with him but if he has a fixed time with him it matters not for he will say he is occupied with his lesson and rabbi son of Arhuna said if a rabbinical scholar knows some testimony and it is undignified for him to go to the judge who is inferior to him to give testimony before him he need not go our shisha the son of our said we also learned thus if he found a Sack or a basket which it is not his custom to handle he need not take it however this is only the case in money matters but in the case of a prohibition he must give evidence for it is written there is no wisdom nor understanding nor counsel against the Lord wherever there is a profanation of the name the honor of a scholar is not regarded Aryamar knew some testimony from Marzitra and came before Amimar he told them all to sit said Arashi to Amimar did not Allah say the controversy is in regard to the litigants but in regard to witnesses all agree that they should stand he replied to him this is a positive precept and that is a positive precept the positive precept enjoining respect for the Torah is greater mnemonic advocate uncultured robbery false our rabbis taught how do we know that a judge should not appoint an advocate for his words because it is said from a false matter keep far and how do we know that a judge should not allow an uncultured disciple to sit before him because it is said from a false matter keep far and how do we know that a judge who knows his colleague to be a robber or a witness who knows his colleague to be a robber should not join with him because it is said from a false matter keep far and how do we know that a judge who knows that a plea is false should not say since the witnesses give evidence I will decide it and Talmud, Moshe Piyatha the chain of guilt will hang round the neck of the witnesses because it is said from a false matter keep far mnemonic three of disciples three of creditors rags hearing explaining how do we know that a disciple sitting before his master who sees that the poor man is right and the wealthy man wrong should not remain silent because it is said from a false matter keep far and how do we know that a disciple who sees his master making a mistake in the law should not say I will wait until he finishes and then upset his decision and build up another decision according to my own judgment. So that the decision will be called by my name because it is said from a false matter keep far and how do we know that a disciple to whom his master says you know that if I were given a hundred mainas I would not tell a lie now so and so owes me one main and I have only one witness against him how do we know that the disciple should not join with him because it is said from a false matter keep far is this then deduced from from a false matter keep far surely this is definitely lying and it divine law said thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor well then for example if he said to him I have definitely one witness and you come and stand there and you need not say anything so that you will not be uttering a lie from your mouth even so it is prohibited because it is said from a false matter keep far how do we know that he who has a claim of a hundred zuzim against his neighbor should not say I will claim two hundred so that he will admit a hundred and be liable for an oath then I will be able to impose an oath upon him from another place because it is said from a false matter keep far and how do we know that if one has a claim of a hundred zuzim against his neighbor and sues for two hundred the debtor should not say I will deny it totally in court but admit it outside the court so that I should not be liable for an oath and he may not impose on me an oath from another place because it is said from a false matter keep far and how do we know that if three persons have a claim of a hundred zuzim against one person one should not be the litigant and the other two the witnesses in order that they may extract a hundred zuzim and divide it because it is said from a false matter keep far how do we know that if two come to court one clothed in rags and the other in fine raiment worth a hundred mainas they should say to him either dress like him or dress him like you because it is said from a false matter keep far when they would come before Rabbison. Of Arhuna he would say to them remove your fine shoes and come down for your case how do we know that a judge should not hear the words of one litigant before the other litigant arrives because it is said from a false matter keep far and how do we know that a litigant should not explain his case to the judge before the other litigant arrives because it is said from a false matter keep far Arkahana learned these deductions from thou shalt not utter a false report thou shalt not cause to be uttered and did that which is not good among his people Rab said this refers to one who comes with power of attorney and Samuel said it refers to one who buys a field about which there are disputes and it applies only to those liable to bear witness etc what does this exclude our papa said it excludes a king and our Ahabi Jacob said it excludes a dice player he who says it excludes a dice player certainly holds it excludes a king but he who says it excludes a king holds it does not exclude a dice player for he is fit to be a witness according to holy writ and it is the rabbis who have disqualified him before the Bethdin or not before the Bethdin etc. In what do they disagree said the scholars to our papa they disagree as to whether we say deduce from it and entirely from it or deduce from it and establish it in its own place our mayor holds deduce from it and entirely from it deduce from it just as in the case of a deposit if he swears of his own accord he is liable so in the
entirely from it, but this is the reason of the rabbis they deduce it by inference from minor to major, since if adjured by others he is liable if he swears of his own accord, how much more so should he be liable? And because they deduce it by inference from minor to major, they hold it is sufficient for that which is deduced by this inference to be similar to that from which it is deduced, just as if adjured by others he is liable before the Beth din only, but not outside the Beth din. So if he swears of his own accord, he is liable before the Beth din only, but not outside the Beth din. Said the scholars to our Papa, how can you say that they do not disagree on the principle of deduce from it and entirely from it? Surely we learn concerning a deposit. The oath of deposit applies to men and women, to non-relatives and relatives, to those qualified to bear witness and those unqualified before the Beth din, and not before the Beth din if uttered from his own mouth, but if adjured by the Mouth of others, he is not liable unless he denies it before the Beth din. This is the opinion of our Meir and the sages say whether uttered by his own mouth or adjured by the mouth of others. Since he denied it, he is liable now. If adjured by the mouth of others in the case of a deposit, how do the sages know that he is liable? Is it not because they deduce it from a case of testimony? Hence, you must infer from this that they disagree on the principle of deduce from it and entirely from it. Our Papa replied from this, yes, but from the other, it is not possible to infer it, and they are liable for the willful transgression of the oath. How do we know this? For our rabbis taught in all of them, it is said, and it be hid from him, but here it is not said, and it be hid in order to make him liable for willful as for unwitting transgression, and for its unwitting transgression coupled with willful denial of knowledge of testimony. How is unwitting transgression possible coupled with willful? Denial of knowledge of testimony said Rab Judah that Rab said if one says I know that this oath is prohibited but I do not know if one is liable to bring an offering for it or not but they are not liable for its unwitting transgression only shall we say that we are here taught a confirmation of that which our Kahana and RC were told no although we learned it here it was necessary for I might have thought here because it is not written and it be hid we require unwitting to be like willful transgression but there since it is written and it be hid even unwitting transgression in a slight degree makes him liable therefore he teaches us that this is not so mission what kind is the oath of testimony he said to two persons come and bear testimony for me and they replied we swear we know no testimony for you or they said to him we know no testimony for you and he said I adjure you and they said amen they are liable if he adjured them five times outside the Beth din and they came to the Beth din and admitted knowledge of testimony they are exempt but if they denied they are liable for each oath if he adjured them five times before the Beth din and they denied knowledge of testimony they are liable only one said our Simeon what is the reason because they cannot afterwards admit knowledge if both persons denied knowledge together they are both liable if one after another the first is liable and the second exempt if one denied and the other admitted. The one who denied is liable if there were two sets of witnesses and the first denied and then the second denied they are both liable because the testimony could be upheld by either of the two Tamara Samuel said if they saw him running after them and they said to him why are you running after us we swear we know no testimony for you they are exempt being liable only when they hear from his mouth what does he teach us we have learned it if he sent the adjuration by his slave or if it Defendant said to them, I adjure you that if you know any testimony for him, you should come and bear testimony for him. They are exempt Talmud, Mashabiyatha, unless they hear the adjuration from the mouth of the plaintiff. If he ran after them, he requires to tell us. I might have thought that since he ran after them, it is as if he had said to them, therefore he teaches us that it is not so. But this we have also learned what is the oath of testimony. He said to witnesses, Come and bear testimony for me. And they replied, We swear, etc., implying only if he said, Come and bear testimony, they are liable. But if he did not say it, they are not liable. He said, Is not necessarily stressed by the mission. For if you will not say thus, then with reference to deposit, where we learned what is the oath of deposit, he said to him, Give me the deposit that you have of mine. Will you also say that if he said, Give me the deposit, he is liable. And if he did not say it, he is not liable. That Cannot be for the verse and deal falsely with his neighbor implies in however slight a degree hence he said is not stressed in that mission and here also it is not stressed what is this granted if you say that he said here in our mission is stressed he states it there because of here but if you say neither he said there is stressed nor he said here is stressed why does the mission say he said in both places perhaps because it is the usual thing therefore he teaches us that it is to be taken literally it was taught in agreement with Samuel if they saw him coming after them and said to him why are you coming after us we swear we know no testimony for you they are exempt but in the case of a deposit they are liable if he adjured them five times etc how do we know that for denial in the Beth din they are liable but outside the Beth din they are not liable have said scripture says if he tell it not he shall bear his iniquity I do not say to you that he bears his iniquity Except in the place where if he would tell his evidence the other would be liable to pay money said our Papa to Abbe if so say the oath itself if uttered before the Beth din makes him liable if not before the Beth din does not that cannot enter our minds for we learn scripture says when he shall be guilty in one of these things to make him liable for each one and if it enters your mind to say it must be uttered before the Beth din is he then liable for each one surely we learned if he adjured them five times before the Beth din and they denied it they are liable only one said our Simeon what is the reason because they cannot afterwards admit it hence we deduce from this the oath must be uttered outside the Beth din and denial must be before the Beth din if they both denied it together they are both liable but it is impossible to ascertain simultaneity our Hista said this is in accordance with the view of our Jose the Galilean who says it is possible to ascertain Simultaneity are Yohanan said you may even say it is in accordance with the view of the rabbis and the Mishnah means for example they both denied it within the time of an utterance and two statements following each other within an interval of the time of an utterance are considered one utterance said Araha of Dipti well now within the time of an utterance what is its duration as the greeting of a disciple to his master some say as the greeting of a master to his disciple now till they say we swear we know no testimony for you the duration is longer he said to him each one within the interval of utterance of his neighbor one after another the first is liable and the second exempt our Mishnah will not be in accordance with the view of this tanna for we learned if he adjures one witness he is exempt but our Eliezer son of our Simeon makes him liable shall we say that they disagree and this one holds that one witness when he comes to bear testimony comes to make the Defendant liable for an oath and the other holds that one witness when he comes to bear testimony comes to make him liable to pay money can you really think so surely Abbe said all agree in the case of the witness of the soda and all agree in the case of the witnesses of the soda and they disagree in the case of the witnesses of the soda all agree in the case of one witness and all agree in the case of the witness where his adversary is suspected of swearing falsely well then all agree that one witness when he comes to bear testimony comes to make the defendant liable for an oath and here they disagree in this one holds that which causes extraction of money is counted as if it had actually extracted money and the other holds it is not counted as if it had actually extracted money to revert to the text above Abbe said all agree in the case of the witness of the soda and all agree in the case of the witnesses of the soda and they disagree in the case of the witnesses of the soda all agree in the case of one witness and all agree in the case of the witness where his adversary is suspected of swearing falsely all agree in the case of the witness of the soda that he is liable the witness of defilement for scripture believes him as it is written and there be no witness against her as long as there is some testimony against her and all agree in the case of the witnesses of the soda that they are exempt the witnesses of jealousy for they are the cause of a cause Talmud, Mashabiyat B and they disagree in the case of the witnesses of the soda the witnesses of the secret meeting one holds that which causes extraction of money is counted as if it had actually extracted money and they are liable and the other holds it is not counted as if it had actually extracted money and they are exempt all agree in the case of the witness where his adversary is suspected of swearing falsely all agree in the Case of one witness in such circumstances as came before our Abba all agree in the case of the witness where his adversary is suspected of swearing falsely who is suspected shall we say the debtor is suspected and the creditor could say to the witness if you would have come to bear testimony for me I would have sworn and taken the debt let the witness say to him who says that you would have sworn well then for example if they are both suspect in which case it has been said the oath returns to the one who is bound to take it and because he cannot swear he pays all agree in the case of one wit
In the case of one after another where both deny you say the first is liable and the second exempt in the case where one denies and the other admits is there any question it is not necessary for the mission to tell us this except in the case where both denied and then one of them turned and admitted within the interval of the time of an utterance and this he teaches us that two statements following each other within the interval of the time of an utterance are considered one utterance. Granted according to our Hista who explains that clause as being in accordance with the view of our Jose the Galilean the first clause establishes that it is possible to ascertain simultaneity and the second clause is necessary in order to teach us that two statements following each other within the interval of the time of an utterance are considered one utterance but according to our Yohan and the first clause teaches us the law with regard to statements uttered within the interval of the time of an utterance and the second clause teaches us the law with regard to statements uttered within the interval of the time of an utterance why do we need both you might have thought that only in the case of denial and denial do we say that two statements within a brief interval are considered one but in the case of denial and admission we do not say this therefore he teaches us that we do if there were two sets of witnesses and the first denied and then the second denied they are both Liable granted the second should be liable because the first denied but the first why should they be liable Talmud, Mosh of Yatha the second set are still there Robin said here we are discussing a case where for example the second set at the time of the denial of the first set were related through their wives and their wives were dying you might have thought because we say the majority of dying people actually die the second set are eligible therefore he teaches us that they are not because as yet the wives are not dead mission I adjure you that you come and bear testimony for me that there are of mine in the possession of so and so a deposit loan theft and lost object we swear we know no testimony for you they are liable only once we swear we know not that there are of yours in the possession of so and so a deposit loan theft and lost object they are liable for each one I adjure you that you bear testimony for me that there is of mine in the possession of so and so a deposit of wheat barley and spelt we swear we know no testimony for you they are liable only once we swear we know no testimony for you that there is of yours in the possession of so and so a deposit of wheat barley and spelt they are liable for each one I adjure you that you come and bear testimony for me that so and so owes me full indemnity for damage or half indemnity or double or four or five times the amount or that so and so violated my daughter or seduced my daughter or that my son smote me or that my neighbor injured me or set fire to my haystack on the day of atonement and they deny knowledge of testimony they are liable tomorrow it was debated if he adjures witnesses in a case where a fine is imposed what is the ruling in accordance with the view of our Eliezer son of our Simeon who says let the witnesses come and hear testimony there is no question but the question is in accordance with the view of the rabbis who say he who admits an act for which a fine is Imposed and then witnesses come is exempt but consider the rabbis there with whom do they agree shall we say they agree with our Eliezer son of our Simeon here surely he says that which causes extraction of money is counted as if it had extracted money well then they agree with the rabbis here who say that which causes extraction of money is not counted as if it had extracted money what is the ruling shall we say since if he had confessed he would have been exempt he is not denying a legitimate money liability or since now he did not actually confess he is denying a money liability come and here I adjure you that you come and bear testimony for me that so and so owes me full indemnity for damage or half indemnity now half indemnity is a fine and yet they are liable the mission will agree with him who holds the half indemnity is a liability that is well according to him who holds that the half indemnity is a liability but according to him who holds it is a fine what shall we say the mission will refer to the half indemnity of pebbles for which there is a tradition that it is a liability come and here so and so owes me double because of the principle four or five times the amount because of the principle so and so violated or seduced my daughter because of the shame and deterioration what does he teach us it is all liability the first clause teaches us one thing and the last clause teaches us one thing the first clause teaches us one thing that the half indemnity of pebbles is a liability the last clause teaches us one thing that he set fire to my haystack on the day of atonement etc what does this exclude it excludes the view of our nihunya bihakana for it was taught our nihunya bihakana made the day of atonement equivalent to the sabbath for payment just as on the sabbath etc come and here i adjure you that you come and bear testimony for me talmud mashabiyat be that so and so uttered an evil report about my daughter and the witnesses deny knowledge of testimony they are liable if he confessed himself he is exempt this is in accordance with the view of our Eliezer son of our Simeon who says let the witnesses come and bear testimony read then the latter clause if he confessed himself he is exempt we hear thus come round to the view of the rabbis it is all in accordance with the view of our Eliezer son of our Simeon and thus he means it is not possible that if he confessed himself he should be exempt except when there are no witnesses at all and he confessed himself mission I adjure you that you come and bear testimony for me that I am a priest or that I am a Levite or that I am not the son of a divorced woman or that I am not the son of a Halyza that so and so I as a priest or that so and so I as a Levite or that he is not the son of a divorced woman or that he is not the son of a Halyza that so and so violated another's daughter or seduced his daughter that my son injured me that my neighbor injured me or set fire to my haystack on the Sabbath they are exempt Gemara the reason they are exempt is because he adjured them so and so I as a priest or so and so I as a Levite but if he adjured them so and so oh so and so a hundred Zeus they would be liable surely he teaches in a later clause they are exempt unless they hear the adjuration from the mouth of the claimant Samuel said it refers to a case where he comes with power of attorney but the Nihardians say we do not write an authorization on movables that is only when he denies it but when he does not deny it we do write our rabbis taught how do we know that the verse refers only to a money claim our Eliezer said here it is said or, or and there it is said or, or just as there it refers only to a money claim so here it refers only to a money claim but let the or, or of a murderer prove that a money claim is not intended for the or, or, or and refer not to a money claim we deduce or, or which are Concerned with an oath from or, or which are concerned with an oath and let not the or, or of a murderer prove anything for they are not concerned with an oath but let the or, or so to prove for they are or, or and are concerned with an oath and refer not to a money claim we deduce or, or which are concerned with an oath and not concerned with a priest from or, or which are concerned with an oath and not concerned with a priest and let not the or, or of a murderer prove anything for they are not concerned with an oath nor let the or, or of a so to prove anything for although they are concerned with an oath they are also concerned with a priest our Akiva said and it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things in some of these things he is liable and in some of these things he is exempt how is this if he claimed from him money he is liable if something else he is exempt our Jose the Galilean said behold scripture says he being a witness whether he have seen or known of such testimony as may be established by seeing without knowing and by knowing without seeing the verse deal seeing without knowing how a hundred zoos I counted out to you before so and so and so and so let so and so and so and so come and bear testimony this is seeing without knowing knowing without seeing how you admitted that you owe me a hundred zoos before so and so and so and so let so and so and so and so come and bear testimony this is knowing without seeing R. Simeon said he is liable here and he is liable in the case of deposit just as there it deals only with the money claim so here it deals only with the money claim and further we have an argument from minor to major deposit where the law makes women equal to men relatives equal to non relatives those ineligible to bear testimony equal to those eligible and where he is liable for Talmud, Mosh of Yatha, each oath whether uttered before the Beth din or not before the Beth din yet deals only. With a money claim testimony where the law does not make women equal to men relatives equal to non relatives those ineligible to bear testimony equal to those eligible and where he is liable only once if adjured before the Beth din how much more that it should deal only with a money claim no we may argue deposit is restricted to money claims because the law does not make him who is adjured by others equal to him who swears of his own accord or him who swears willfully like him who swears unwittingly but how can you say in the case of testimony that it should be restricted to money claims since the law makes him who is adjured by others equal to him who swears of his own accord and him who swears willfully equal to him who swears unwittingly it is said since sin for deduction by analogy here it is said if anyone sin and there it is said if anyone sin just as there it deals only with a money claim so here it deals only with a money claim rabbi or raisin Objection or, or of the oath of utterance will prove that a money claim is
relies on the or or of our Eliezer. If so, what is the difference between our Eliezer and our Akiba? The difference between them is if he a Jewish witnesses for land according to our Eliezer, they are liable according to our Akiba, they are exempt. But according to our Yohanan, who says there that if he a Jewish witnesses for land, they are exempt. Even according to our Eliezer, what will be the difference here between our Eliezer and our Akiba? The difference between them will be witnesses for a fine. Our Jose, the Galilean said he being a witness, whether he has seen or known of such testimony as may be established by seeing without knowing and by knowing without seeing the verse deals. Our Papa said to Abay, shall we say that our Jose, the Galilean, does not agree with our Aha, for it was taught our Aha said if a camel copulates among other camels and one camel is found killed at his side, it is known that he killed him. Now, if he would agree with our Aha, it is possible also in capital cases as in the incident. Related by our Simeon Bishada, for we learned our Simeon Bishada said, May I not see the consolation of Zion if I did not see a man running after his neighbor into a ruin and I ran after him and found him with a sword in his hand with the blood dripping and the victim writhing in agony. I said to him, Wicked one who killed this man, I or you, but what can I do since your blood is not given into my hand? For scripture says, At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is to die be put to death, but the omnipresent will exact retribution from you. It is said they had not yet moved from there when a serpent bit him and he died. You may say he does agree with our Aha, granted knowing without seeing is possible, but seeing without knowing how is that possible? Does he not need to know if he killed a heathen or a Jew if he killed a man suffering from a fatal disease or a healthy man? We may deduce that our Jose the Galilean holds that if he a Jew's witnesses for a fine, they are exempt for. If you will say they are liable, granted that knowing without seeing is possible, but seeing without knowing how is that possible? Does he not need to know if he cohabited with a heathen woman or a Jewish woman with a virgin or with a woman who is not a virgin? Our Hamnon is sat before Rab Judah and Rab Judah sat and inquired if one said a hundred zoos I counted out to you before so and so and so and so Talmud, Mashabiyat B and witnesses had been watching him from outside. What is the ruling? Our Hamnon is said to him and what does that one plead if he says the thing never occurred? He is proven a liar if he says yes I took the money but it was my own that I took. If witnesses come what happens? He said to him Hamnon you come and go and a certain man said to his neighbor a hundred zoos I counted out to you by the side of this pillar. He replied to him I did not pass by the side of this pillar. Two witnesses came and bore testimony that he had urinated by the side of that pillar said. Resh Lakish, he is proven a liar. Arnaman raised an objection. This is a Persian judgment. Did he then say never in connection with this affair? He meant some say a certain man said to his neighbor, A hundred zoos I counted out to you by the side of this pillar. He replied to him, I never passed by the side of this pillar. Witnesses came that he had urinated by the side of that pillar. Arnaman said he is proven a liar. Said Rabbi to Arnaman, anything which is not imposed upon a man, he will do without. Being conscious of it, Arsimian said he is liable here and he is liable in the case of deposit, etc. They laughed at it in the West. Why the laughter? Because he states deposit is restricted to money claims because the law does not make him who is adjured by others like him who swears of his own accord, nor him who swears willfully like him who swears unwittingly. Now he who swears of his own accord in the case of testimony, how does Arsimian know that he is liable because he deduces it? From deposit, then let him also in the case of deposit deduce adjuration by others from testimony. But why the laughter? Perhaps our Simeon deduces it by argument from minor to major. If when adjured by others he is liable when he swears of his own accord, he should the more so be liable. Well, then the laughter is in connection with willful like unwitting, for he states deposit is restricted to money claims because the law does not make him who is adjured by others like him who swears of his own accord, nor him who swears willfully like him who swears unwittingly. Now, for swearing willfully in the case of testimony, how do we know that he is liable because it is not written and it be hidden here? Also, it is not written and it be hidden. Arhuna said to them, But why the laughter? Perhaps our Simeon deduces that willful transgression is not like unwitting in the case of deposit from the law of trespass in holy things. This then is the very reason for the laughter. Why does he deduce it? From trespass, let him rather deduce it from testimony. It is more reasonable that he should deduce it from trespass because it is trespass from trespass. On the contrary, he should deduce it from testimony because it is sin from sin. It is more reasonable that he should deduce it from trespass because they are both equal in respect of trespass. All enjoyment, fixed offering, fifth and guilt offering. On the contrary, he should deduce it from testimony because they are both equal in respect of sin. Limit oath, claim, and denial, and or, or the others are more well than why the laughter. When our Papa and Arhuna, the son of our Joshua, came from the academy, they said this is the reason for the laughter. Behold, our Simeon deduces by analogy testimony from deposit. Why then does he argue deposit is restricted to money claims because the law does not make him who is adjured by others like him who swears of his own accord, nor him who swears willfully like him who swears unwittingly, but why the Laughter perhaps he argued thus before he established the analogy, but after he established the analogy he does not argue thus, but does he not surely rob a bee? It is said to the sages who is the tenet who holds that in the case of the oath of deposit willful transgression is not atoned for by an offering it is our simian perhaps he argues that willful transgression is not like unwitting in the case of deposit because he deduces it from trespass since it is equal to it in more respects but that adjuration by others is not like swearing of his own accord he does not argue well let testimony now be in turn deduced from deposit that willful is not like unwitting transgression just as in the case of deposit he is liable for unwitting but not for willful transgression so in the case of testimony let him be liable for unwitting and not for willful transgression just as he deduces deposit from trespass Talmud, Mashabiyata Talmud, Mashabiyata for this reason scripture. Wrote testimony near the oath of utterance and near the laws of uncleanness in connection with the temple and the holy food thereof for in all of them it is said and it be hidden and here it is not said and it be hidden in order to make him liable for willful as for unwitting transgression mission if a man said I adjure you that you come and bear testimony for me that so and so promised to give me two hundred ZUZ and did not give me they are exempt for they are liable only for a money claim. As in the case of deposit I adjure you that when you know any testimony for me you should come and bear testimony for me they are exempt because the oath preceded the testimony if he stood in the synagogue and said I adjure you that if you know any testimony for me you should come and bear testimony for me they are exempt unless he directs himself to them he said to two persons I adjure you so and so and so and so that if you know any testimony for me you should come and bear testimony. For me and they replied we swear we know no testimony for you and they did no testimony for him but it was evidence of one witness from the mouth of another witness or if one of them was a relative or otherwise ineligible as a witness they are exempt if he sent by the hand of his servant or if the defendant said to them I adjure you that if you know any testimony for him you should come and bear testimony for him they are exempt being liable only when they hear the adjuration from the mouth of the claimant Gemara our rabbis taught if a man says I adjure you that you come and bear testimony for me that so and so promised to give me two hundred zoos and did not give me I might think they should be liable therefore it is said if anyone sin if anyone sin for analogy here it is said if anyone sin and there it is said if anyone sin just as there it deals with the claim of money which is due to him so here it deals with the claim of money which is due to him I adjure. You that when you know any testimony for me, etc. Our sages taught I adjure you that when you know any testimony for me, you should come and bear testimony for me. I might think they should be liable. Therefore, it is said and heard the voice of adjuration. He being a witness, whether he had seen or known where the testimony precedes the oath and not where the oath precedes the testimony, he stood in the synagogue and said, I adjure you, etc. Samuel said, even if his witnesses are among them, they are exempt. This is obvious. It is not necessary for him to tell us this, except where he stands next to them. You might have thought it is as though he said it to them specifically. Therefore, he teaches us that it is not so. It was also taught likewise if he saw a company of men standing and his witnesses were among them, and he said to them, I adjure you that if you know any testimony for me, you should come and bear testimony for me. I might think they should be liable. Therefore, it is said he. Being a witness and here he did not single out his witnesses I might think that even if he said all who stand here I adjure they are exempt therefore it
suffering one by the one abounding in kindness or by any of the substitutes for the name they are liable he who blasphemes by any of them is liable this is the opinion of our mayor but the sages exempt him he who curses his father or mother by any of them is liable this is the opinion of our mayor but the sages exempt him he who curses himself or his neighbor by any of them transgresses a negative precept if he said the lord smite you or god smite you these are the curses written in the torah May the Lord not smite you, or may he bless you, or may he do good unto you if you bear testimony for me, or may your makes them liable. But the sages exempt them. Gemara, I adjure you, what does he mean? Rab Judah said, Thus he means, I adjure you by the oath stated in the Torah, I command you by the command stated in the Torah, I bind you by the bond stated in the Torah. Abbe said to him, But then what of our high who taught I chained you, they are liable, is chained and mentioned in Scripture, well said. Abbe, thus he means, I adjure you by oath, I command you by oath, I bind you by oath, I chain you by oath, by Alef, Dalet, by Yahti, by Shaddai, by Zebaith, by the merciful and gracious one, by the long suffering one, by the one abounding in kindness, shall we say that merciful and gracious are names? This is contradicted from the following. There are names which may be erased, and there are names which may not be erased. These are the names which may not be erased, such as El Eloha, Elohim, your God, I am that. I am Allah Dalath Yahti Shadai Zibayath, these may not be erased, but the great, the mighty, the revered, the majestic, the strong, the powerful, the potent, the merciful, and gracious, the long suffering, the one abounding in kindness, these may be erased. Abbe said, Our Mishnah means I adjure you by him who is gracious, Talmud, Mashabyath be by him who is merciful. Rabbah said to him, If so, by heaven and earth, also let us say it means by him to whom heaven and earth belong, that is no question there. Since there is nothing else which is called merciful and gracious, it is clear that he means by him who is gracious, by him who is merciful, but here, since there are heaven and earth, he means by heaven and earth, our sages taught if he wrote Allah claimed of Elohim Yahti of the Tetragrammaton, they may not be erased. Shin Dalath of Shadai Allah Dalath of Adon Ixadi Beth of Zibayath, they may be erased. Our Jose said the whole word Zibayath may be erased because Zibayath refers only to Israel as it is said. And I will bring forth my host, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt. Samuel said, The Halachah is not in accordance with our Hosea. Our sages taught that which is joined to the name, whether before it or after it, may be erased before it. How to the Lord the lame to may be erased, and the Lord the Bethan may be erased, and the Lord the Bob and may be erased from the Lord the Mem from may be erased, that the Lord the Shin that may be erased, interrogative he before the Lord. That he may be erased as the Lord the Kaf as may be erased after it. How our God the suffix new or may be erased, their God the suffix him there may be erased, your God the suffix him your may be erased. Others say the suffix may not be erased for the name has already hallowed it. Our said the Halachah is in accordance with these others. Nehemiah Abraham who cursed Naboth in Jabia, Benjamin Solomon Daniel, all the names mentioned in Scripture in connection with Abraham are sacred except. This which is secular it is said and he said my lord if now I have found favor in thy sight Hannah the son of our Joshua's brother and our Eliezer be Ezra in the name of our Eliezer of Moden said this also is sacred with whom will the following agree Rab Judah said that Rab said greater is hospitality to wayfarers than receiving the divine presence with whom will disagree with this pair all the names mentioned in connection with Lot are secular except this which is sacred it is said and Lot said unto them O not so my lord behold now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight and thou hast magnified thy mercy which thou hast shown unto me in saving my life he in whose power it is to kill and to revive that is the holy one blessed be he all the names mentioned in connection with Naboth are sacred in connection with Micah are secular our Eliezer said in connection with Naboth all are sacred in connection with Micah some are secular and some sacred the name beginning Allah flamed. Is secular Yahti is sacred except this which is Allah claimed and is sacred all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. All the names mentioned in connection with Jabia of Benjamin are Eliezer said are secular are Joshua said are sacred are Eliezer said to him does he then promise and not fulfill are Joshua replied to him what he promised he fulfilled but they did not inquire whether the result would be victory of defeat later when they did inquire of the Urim and Tummim they approved their action as it is said and Phineas the son of Eliezer the son of Aaron stood before it in those days saying shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin my brother or shall I cease and the Lord said go up for tomorrow I will deliver them into thy hand every Solomon mentioned in the song of songs is sacred the song to him whose is the peace except this my vineyard which is mine is before me thou O Solomon shalt have a thousand Solomon for himself shall have a Thousand and two hundred for those that keep the fruit thereof the sages and there are some who say this also is secular behold it is the bed of Solomon this also implies that the other is undoubtedly secular but then what of Samuel who said a government which kills only one out of six is not punished for it is said my vineyard which is mine is before me thou O Solomon shalt have a thousand for the kingdom of heaven and two hundred for those that keep the fruit thereof for the kingdom on earth now Samuel is not in agreement with the first canon nor with the some who say but this is what it means and some there are who say this is sacred and this is secular the verse about his bed and Samuel agrees with them all kings mentioned in Daniel are secular except this which is sacred thou O king king of kings unto whom the God of heaven hath given the kingdom the power and the strength and the glory and some say this also is sacred it is said my lord the dream be to them that hate thee and the interpretation thereof to thine adversaries to whom does he say this if it should enter your mind that he says it to Nebuchadnezzar who are those who hate him Israel then he is cursing Israel and the first tana he holds are the enemies of Nebuchadnezzar only Israelites are there not enemies to who are heathens or by any of the substitutes for the name they are liable etc we may cite the following in contradiction the Lord make thee a curse and an oath why is this stated is it not already said the priest shall cause the woman to swear with the oath of cursing because it is said and hear the voice of Allah cursing here it is said Allah and there it is said Allah just as here it implies an oath so there it implies an oath just as here it must be by the name so there it must be by the name of a said it is no question this is the view of our Hanabi Edi and that is the view of the rabbis for we learned our Hanabi Edi said since the Torah said thou Shalt swear and thou shalt not swear, thou shalt curse and thou shalt not curse. We deduce just as thou shalt swear means by the name, so thou shalt not swear means by the name, and just as thou shalt curse means by the name, so thou shalt not curse means by the name. Now the rabbis, if they received on tradition this Kazurisha while let them require the actual name, and if they did not receive on tradition this Kazurisha while how do they know that Allah implies an oath? They deduce it from it. Very in which it was taught Allah Allah is nothing but the expression of an oath, and so it says, and the priest shall cause a woman to swear with the oath of Allah, but there it is written the oath of Allah, thus he means Allah Allah can only be an oath, and thus it says, and the priest shall cause a woman to swear with the oath of Allah Talmud, Mashabyate, and whence do we know to make an oath unaccompanied by an Allah like an oath accompanied by an Allah because it is said and here it is. Voice of cursing and heareth the cursing and heareth the voice of Rabbah said once do we know that Allah implies an oath because it is said and brought him under an Allah and it is written and he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who made him swear by God a tanda tatara may imply excommunication curse or oath it implies excommunication as it is written curse Yamara said the angel of the Lord curse yeah bitterly the inhabitants thereof and Allah said with four hundred blasts of it. Trumpet did bear a the ban over Meraz it implies curse as it is written and these shall stand for the curse and it is written or be the man that make the graven image it implies oath as it is written and Joshua adjured them at that time saying or be the man before the Lord but perhaps two things he did to them he adjured them and cursed them well then from here and the men of Israel were distressed that day but Saul adjured the people saying or be the man that he tended is. Written, but Jonathan heard not when his father adjured the people, but perhaps here also he did two things to them. He adjured them and cursed them. Is it then written and error? Now, since you have come to this, you may say there also it is not written and error. Our Jose Behanan said, Amen implies oath, acceptance of words, and confirmation of words. It implies oath as it is written, and the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. It implies acceptance of words as it is written,
Jose, for we learned our menahem be Jose said when he blasphemeth the name he shall be put to death. Why is it said name it teaches us that he who curses his father or mother is not liable unless he curses them by the name he who curses himself or his neighbor etc. Arjane said this is a view of all he who curses himself as it is written only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently and as Arabin said in the name of Arale for he said wherever it is said take heed lest or not it is. Nothing but a negative precept he who curses his neighbor as it is written thou shalt not curse the death the Lord smite you or God smite you these are the curses written in the Torah Arkahana sat before Rab Judah and was reciting this mission as we learned it he said to him modify it one of the scholars was sitting before Arkahana and reciting God will likewise break thee forever he will take thee up and pluck thee out of thy tent and root thee out of the land of the living seal he said to him modify it why do we require both I might have thought that only the mission we are permitted to modify but verses of scripture we are not permitted to modify therefore he teaches us that we are may the Lord not smite you or may he bless you or may he do good unto you if you bear testimony from me our mayor makes them liable and the sages exempt them but our mayor does not hold that from the negative you may derive the affirmative reverse it when our Isaac came he stated the mission as we Learned it our Joseph said since we learned it thus and when our Isaac came he also stated it thus we may infer that we learned it definitely so but the question then remains he does not hold that from the negative we derive the affirmative in money matters but in prohibitions he holds this principle but the case of soda is a prohibition and yet our tantum be our hakanei I said it is written hinaki the reason is because it is written hinaki which may be read as hinki but were it not for this we should not know the affirmative for we do not say that from the negative you may derive the affirmative Talmud Mashabiyoth be well then you must reverse for even in a prohibition he does not hold this principle to this rabbin and in a prohibition does he not hold this principle now then priest ministering in the temple intoxicated with wine or with a long growth of hair the punishment for which is said to be death will you also say in these cases that our mayor does not. Hold the principle surely we learned these are liable for death priests intoxicated with wine and with a long growth of hair hence indeed reverse but only in money matters does he not hold the principle in a prohibition however he does hold the principle and the case of soda is different because it is a prohibition which includes also money matters chapter of emission the oath of deposit applies to men and women to non-relatives and relatives to those qualified to bear testimony and those unqualified before the beth din and not before the beth din if uttered from his own mouth but if adjured by the mouth of others he is not liable unless he denies it before the beth din this is the opinion of a mayor but the sages say whether uttered from his own mouth or adjured by the mouth of others since he denied it he is liable and he is liable for the willful transgression of the oath and for its unwitting transgression coupled with willful denial of deposit but he is not Liable for unwitting transgression simply and to what is he liable for willful transgression a guilt offering of the value of two shekels of silver the oath of deposit how he said to him give me my deposit which I have in thy possession the other replied I swear that thou hast not anything in my possession or he replied to him thou hast not anything in my possession and the depositor said I adjure thee and he responded amen he is liable if he adjured him five times whether before the beth din or not before the beth din and he denied he is liable for each one our Simeon said what is the reason because he can retract and admit if five claimed from him and said to him give us the deposit that we have in thy possession and he replied I swear that you have not anything in my possession he is liable only once if he said I swear that thou hast not in my possession nor thou nor thou he is liable for each one our Eliezer says only if he says I swear at the end our Simeon says only if he says I swear to each one give me the deposit loan theft and lost object that I have in my possession I swear that thou hast not these in my possession he is liable only once I swear that thou hast not in my possession deposit loan theft and lost object he is liable for each one give me the wheat barley and spelt that I have in my possession I swear that thou hast not these in my possession he is liable only once I swear that thou hast not in my possession wheat barley and spelt he is liable for each one our mayor said even if he said a grain of wheat barley and spelt he is liable for each one thou hast violated or seduced my daughter and the other says I did not violate nor seduce I drew the end he responds amen he is liable our Simeon exempts him for he does not pay a fine on his own admission they said to him though he does not pay a fine on his own admission he still pays for the shame and blemish on his own admission thou hast stolen my ox and he says I have not Stolen it, I drew the end. He responds, Amen. He is liable. I have stolen it, but I have not killed it or sold it. I drew the end. He responds, Amen. He is exempt. Thy ox killed my ox, and he says it did not kill thy ox. I drew the end. He responds, Amen. He is liable. Thy ox killed my slave, and he says it did not kill thy slave. I drew the end. He responds, Amen. He is exempt. He said to him, Thou hast injured me or bruised me, and the other says, I have not injured thee or bruised thee. I drew the end. He responds, Amen. He is liable. His slave said to him, Thou hast knocked out my tooth or blinded my eye, and he said, I did not knock out thy tooth or blind thy eye. I drew the end. He responds, Amen. He is exempt. This is the principle. Whenever he pays on his own admission, he is liable, and when he does not pay on his own admission, he is exempt. Amar Ara Habihuna and Ar Samuel, the son of Rabbi Barhana, and Ar Isaac, the son of Rab Judah, studied the tractate of Shabbat. The school of Rabbi Arkahana met them and said Talmud, Mashabiyate to them if he willfully transgressed the oath of deposit and witnesses warned him what is the ruling since it presents an anomaly in that in the whole Torah we do not find that a willful transgressor brings an offering and here he brings an offering there is therefore no difference whether he is warned or not warned or it applies only when he is not warned but when he is warned he receives stripes and does not bring an offering or do we impose both punishments on him they said to him we have it stated in a very that the oath of deposit is more severe than it for one is liable for its willful transgression stripes and for its unwitting transgression a guilt offering of the value of two silver shekels now since it says for its willful transgression stripes we deduce they warned him and yet it says stripes only and not an offering and wherein lies then the greater severity in that a man prefers to bring an Offering rather than suffer stripes said Rabbi it to them no this affords no solution for who is the Tana who holds that willful transgression of oath of deposit is not atoned for by an offering it is our Simeon but according to the rabbis he brings an offering also Arkahana said to them away with this very before I learned it and thus I learned it both for its willful and unwitting transgression the penalty is a guilt offering of the value of two silver shekels and wherein lies its greater severity there he may bring a sin offering of the value of a dunko whereas here he must bring a guilt offering of the value of two shekels of silver let us then deduce from this perhaps it refers to the case where they did not warn him another version come and here one is not liable for its unwitting transgression to what is one liable for its willful transgression a guilt offering of the value of two shekels of silver now does this not refer to the case where they warned him no, here also it may refer to the case where they did not warn him. Come and here, no, if you say in the case of a Nazi right who had become unclean that such and such is the case, it is because he received stripes. But how can you say in the case of the oath of deposit that such and such is the case since its transgressor does not receive stripes? Since it says he received stripes, we deduce that they warned him. And it says, how can you say in the case of the oath of deposit that such and such is the case since its transgressor does not receive stripes? But presumably, an offering he brings what is meant by he does not receive stripes is that he is not freed by stripes. Do we infer then that a Nazi right who had become unclean is freed by stripes? Surely, an offering is specifically mentioned with reference to him. There he brings an offering merely in order that his Nazi right ship should recommence in cleanliness. The scholars told this to Rabbi. He said to them, hence, if they did not warn. Him though there are witnesses he is liable but surely it is like a merely useless denial of words that shows that Rabbi himself holds he who denies money for which there are witnesses is exempt. Our Hanan is said to Rabbi there is a very thought in support of your view and in yet it except if he admits it to one of the brothers or one of the partners and sweareth falsely except if he borrowed on a bond or borrowed in the presence of witnesses he said to him from this you can bring no support to my view it refers to a case where he says I borrowed but I did not borrow in the presence of witnesses I borrowed but I did not borrow on a bond how do we know it refers to such a case because it states and in yet it except if he admits it to one
Second set at the time of the denial of the first set were related through their wives and their wives were dying you might have thought that because we say the majority of dying people actually die the second set are reckoned eligible witnesses therefore he teaches us that they are not because as yet the wives are alive and not dead come and hear if the trustee pleaded the plea of death in the case of a deposit and swore and confessed and witnesses came if before the witnesses came he confessed he pays the principal the fifth and brings a guilt offering if after the witnesses came he confessed he pays double and brings a guilt offering here also as Rubin has said Rubin has said to Arashi come and hear the oath of deposit is more severe than it for one is liable for its willful transgression stripes and for its unwitting transgression a guilt offering of the value of two silver shekels now since he says he receives stripes it follows that there are witnesses and yet he says for its unwitting transgression a guilt offering of the value of two silver shekels are more decay said to them away with this paratha for low arcahana said to them I learned it and thus I learned it both for its willful and unwitting transgression the penalty is a guilt offering of the value of two silver shekels come and here know if you say in the case of a Nazi right who had become unclean that such and such is the case it is because he received stripes but how can you say in the case of a Oath of deposit that such and such is the case since its transgressor does not receive stripes now how is this if there are no witnesses why does he receive stripes obviously therefore there are witnesses and yet he states how can you say in the case of an oath of deposit that such and such is the case since its transgressor does not receive stripes stripes he does not receive but an offering he brings verily a refutation of rabbis view it is a refutation are Yohanan said he who denies on oath money for which there are witnesses is liable for which there is a bond is exempt our papa said what is our Yohanan's reason because witnesses are likely to die but the bond remains said are who not the son of our Joshua to our papa but a bond too is likely to be lost however said are who not the son of our Joshua this is our Yohanan's reason a bond is a hypothecary pledge of lands and an offering is not brought for a denial of a hypothecary pledge of lands it was stated he who drew witnesses for land our Yohanan and our Eliezer disagree. One says they are liable and the other says they are exempt. It may be concluded that it is our Yohanan who says they are exempt. For our Yohanan said he who denies money for which there are witnesses is liable for which there is a bond is exempt. And as our Huna, the son of our Joshua explained that it is conclusive. Our Jeremiah said to our Rabbi, shall we say that our Yohanan and our Eliezer disagree on the same principle on which our Eliezer and the Rabbis disagree? For we learned. He who robs a field from his neighbor and a river flooded it must restore a field to him. This is the opinion of our Eliezer. But the sages say he may say to him, Lo, thine own is before thee. And we said on what do they disagree? Our Eliezer expounds amplifications and limitations. And the Rabbi sages expound generalizations and specifications. Our Eliezer expounds amplifications and limitations and lie unto his neighbor. This amplifies in deposit or loanness limits or anything about which he hath. Sworn this again amplifies since it amplifies limits and amplifies it includes all what does it include it includes all things and what does it exclude it excludes bonds and the rabbis expound generalizations and specifications and lie unto his neighbor this generalizes in deposit or loan or robbery this specifies or anything about which he has sworn this again generalizes since it generalizes specifies and generalizes you may include only that which is similar to the specification just as the specification is clearly movable and intrinsically money so everything which is movable and intrinsically money may be included but exclude lands which are not movable and exclude slaves which have been likened to lands and exclude bonds which though they are movable are not intrinsically money now shall we say that he who makes them liable agrees with our Eliezer and he who exempts them agrees with the rabbis he said to him no he who makes them liable agrees with our Eliezer, but he who exempts them may tell you that in this even our Eliza agrees for scripture says of all and not all our Papa said in the name of Rabbi our Mishnah to his evidence for it states thou hast stolen my ox and the other says I have not stolen it I drew thee and he responds amen he is liable now thou hast stolen my slave it does not state what is the reason is it not because a slave is likened to land and an offering is not brought for a denial of a hypothecary pledge of land said our Papi in the name of Rabbi say the final clause this is the principle whenever he pays on his own admission he is liable and when he does not pay on his own admission he is exempt this is the principle what does this include does it not include the case where he claims thou hast stolen my slave Talmud Moshe Yatha hence then from this it is not possible to deduce the oath of deposit how give me the deposit which I have in that possession etc our Rabbis taught for a general statement he is liable only once for a particular he is liable for each one. This is the opinion of our Meir. Our Judah says, I swear I do not owe thee and not thee and not thee. He is liable for each one. Our Eliezer says, I do not owe thee and not thee and not thee. Elsewhere it he is liable for each one. Our Simeon says he is not liable for each one unless he says, I swear to each one. Rab Judah said that Samuel said the general statement of our Meir is the particular of our Judah and the general statement of our Judah is the particular of our Meir and our Yohanan said all agree that and not thee is a particular. They disagree only and not thee. Our Meir holding it is a particular and our Judah holding it is a general. And what is the general statement according to our Meir? I swear that you have not in my possession. In what do they disagree? Samuel argues from the Beritha and our Yohanan argues from our Mishnah. Samuel argues from the Beritha since our Judah says and not thee is a particular. We infer that he heard our Meir say it is a general. And therefore our Judah disagrees and says to him it is a particular and our Yohanan says both are according to our Meir particulars and our Judah said to him and not the I agree with you but in not the I disagree with you but Samuel says if so why mention that in which he agrees with him let him mention that in which he disagrees with him and our Yohanan argues from our Mishnah since our Meir says I swear you plural have not in my possession is a general statement we infer that and not the is a particular for if it enters your mind to say that and not the is a general statement why does he teach us I swear I do not owe you let him teach us I swear I do not owe thee and not the and not the and it would be obvious that I swear I do not owe you is a general statement and Samuel says if he says and not the it is as if he says I swear I do not owe you we learned not the and not the and not the read in the Mishnah not the come and here give me the deposit and loan and theft and Lost object red loan theft lost object come and here give me the wheat and barley and spelled read barley spelled but does the tana go on so frequently blundering well then it is the view of rabbi who says there is no difference between kazayit kazayit and kazayit and kazayit both are particulars come and here from his own view our Meir says even if he said a grain of wheat and barley and spelled he is liable for each one read a grain of wheat a grain of barley a grain of spelled what is the force of even araha the son of rika said even a grain of wheat is included in wheat and a grain of barley is included in barley and a grain of spelled is included in spelled give me the deposit loan theft and lost object which I have in that possession etc give me the wheat and barley are you said if there is a parrot in the value of all of them together they combine araha and rubin to disagree one says for the particulars he is liable but for the general statements he is not liable and the other says for the general statements he is also liable but did not our high teach behold there are here 15 sin offerings and if it is as you say there are 20 this tana is counting the particulars and is not counting the general statements and behold our high taught there are here 20 sin offerings no that refers to deposit loan theft and lost object Rabbi inquired of our nominee five claimed from him saying to him give us the deposit loan theft and lost object which we have in thy possession and he said to one of them I swear that thou hast not in my possession a deposit loan theft and lost object and thou hast not and thou hast not and thou hast not and thou hast not what is the ruling for one is he liable Talmud Moshe Yath or is he liable for each one come and here our high taught behold there are here 20 sin offerings how is this if he expressed fully it is obvious does our high come to tell us the number obviously therefore he did not express fully. Hence we deduce from this that there are particulars thou hast violated or seduced my daughter etc. Our high B. Abba said that our Yohanan said what is our Simeon's reason because mainly it is the fine that he is claiming said Rabbah in illustration of our Simeon's view to what may it be compared to a man who said to his neighbor give me the wheat barley and spelt that I have in that possession and he replied to him I swear that thou hast not in my possession wheat and it was found that wheat he really did not have but barley and spelt he had he is exempt for when he swore
Other replies I have not in my possession of yours except the parata he is liable you have of mine a hundred denarii I have not of yours he is exempt you have of mine a hundred denarii I have of yours only fifty denarii he is liable you have of my father's a hundred denarii I have of his only fifty denarii he is exempt because it is as if he restores a lost object you have of mine a hundred denarii he said to him yes on the morrow he said to him give them to me and he replied I have given them to you he is exempt if he says I have not of yours in my possession he is liable you have of mine a hundred denarii he said to him yes give them not to me except before witnesses on the morrow he said to him give them to me and he replied I have given them to you he is liable because he should have given them to him before witnesses you have of mine a litter of gold I have of yours only a litter of silver he is exempt you have of mine a golden dinar I have of yours only a Silver dinar or a tresses or a pundian or a parata he is liable for all are one kind of coinage you have of mine a core of grain I have of yours only a lethek of beans he is exempt you have of mine a core of produce I have of yours only a lethek of beans he is liable for beans are included in produce if he claimed from him wheat and the other admitted barley he is exempt but our Gamaliel makes him liable if he claims from his neighbor jars of oil and he admits his claim to the empty jars. Edmund says since he admits to him a portion of the same kind as the claim he must swear but the sages say that admission is not of the same kind as the claim our Gamaliel said I approve the words of Edmund if he claims from him vessels and lands and he admits the vessels but denies the lands or admits the lands but denies the vessels he is exempt if he admits a portion of the lands he is exempt a portion of the vessels he is liable because properties for which there is no security bind properties. For which there is security to take an oath for them. No oath is imposed in a claim by a deaf mute imbecile or minor, and no oath is imposed on a minor, but an oath is imposed when a claim is lodged against a minor or against the temple. Tomorrow, how do we impose the oath on him? Rab Judah said that Rab said we adjure him with the oath that is stated in the Torah as it is written, and I will make thee swear by the Lord the God of heaven, said Rabbanu to Arashi, in accordance with whose view is this in accordance with the view of our Hannah Bed, who says we require the distinguishing name, he said to him, You may even say it is in accordance with the view of the rabbis who say he may be adjured with a substitute for the name, but the outcome is that he must hold something sacred in his hand, and as Rabbah said, for Rabbah said a judge who adjures by the Lord God of heaven without handing a sacred object to the person taking the oath is counted as having heard in the ruling of a mission and must repeat the ceremony correctly and our papa said a judge who adjures with tefillin is counted as having heard in the ruling of a mission and must repeat the ceremony the law is in accordance with the view of rabbah and the law is not in accordance with the view of our papa the law is in accordance with the view of rabbah for he did not hold any sacred object in his hand but the law is not in accordance with the view of our papa for he held a sacred object in his hand the oath must be taken standing a disciple of the wise may take it sitting the oath must be administered with a sefer torah a disciple of the wise may directly take it with tefillin our sages taught as to the oath of the judges it also may be said in any language they say to him no talmud that the whole world trembled at the time when the holy one blessed be he said at sinai thou shalt not take the name of the lord thy god in vain and with reference to all transgressions in the torah it is Said holding guiltless, but here it is said will not hold him guiltless, and for all the transgressions in the Torah he the sinner alone is punished, but here he and his family for it is said suffer not thy mouth to bring thy flesh into guilt, and flesh means near relative as it is said, and from thine own flesh thou shalt not hide thyself, and for all the transgressions in the Torah he alone is punished, but here he and all the world for it is said swearing and lying therefore doth the land mourn. And every one that dwelleth therein doth languish, but say perhaps only when he does them all that cannot enter your mind, for it is written because of swearing the land mourneth, and it is written therefore doth the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein doth languish, and with reference to all transgressions in the Torah if he has merit punishment is suspended for two or three generations, but here he is punished immediately as it is said, I cause it to go forth, saith the Lord of hosts. And it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name and it shall abide in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof I cause it to go forth immediately and it shall enter into the house of the thief he who steals the mind of people e.g. there is no money owing to him by his fellow but he claims from him and causes him to swear and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name according to its plain meaning and it shall abide in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof from this you learn that things which neither fire nor water can destroy a false oath can destroy if he says I shall not swear he is dismissed immediately but if he said I shall swear those who are standing there say to each other depart I pray you from the tents of these wicked men etc and when they adjure him they say to him know that we do not adjure you According to your own mind, but according to the mind of the omnipresent and the mind of the Beth Din, for thus we find in the case of Moses our teacher when he adjured Israel, he said to them, Know that not according to your own minds do I adjure you, but according to the mind of the omnipresent and my mind, as it is said, neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that standeth here with us. Hence we know only those who were standing by Mount Sinai were adjured. The coming generations and proselytes who were later to be proselytes, how do we know that they were adjured also then? Because it is said, and also with him that is not here with us this day, and from this we know only that they were adjured for the commandments which they received at Mount Sinai. How do we know that they were adjured for the commandments which were to be promulgated later, such as reading the Megillah? Because it is said they confirmed and accepted, they confirmed what they had. Long ago accepted what is the meaning of it also may be said in any language as we learned these may be recited in any language the scriptural text of the Soda Confession when giving the tithe the Shema Tefila grace after meals the oath of testimony and the oath of deposit and now it says also the oath of the judges may also be said in any language the master said they say to him know that the whole world trembled at the time when the Holy One blessed be he said thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain what is the reason shall we say because it was given at Sinai the ten commandments were also given there again if because it is more serious but is it more serious behold has it not been taught these are like positive and negative precepts except thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain serious sins for the transgression of which Karath and death at the hands of the Beth are inflicted and thou shalt not take etc is in this category. Well then because of the reason which he states with reference to all transgressions in the Torah it is said holding guiltless but here it is said will not hold guiltless and with reference to all transgressions in the Torah is it not said will not hold guiltless surely it is written and will by no means hold guiltless that is required for our Eliezer's deduction for we learned our Eliezer said it is impossible to say holding guiltless for it is already said will not hold guiltless it is impossible to say will not hold guiltless for it is already said holding guiltless how can they be reconciled he holds guiltless those who repent and does not hold guiltless those who do not repent for all transgressions in the Torah he alone is punished but here he and his family and for all transgressions of the Torah is not his family punished lo it is written and I will set my face against that man and against his family and it was taught our Simeon said if he sent what sin did his family commit but this shows you that there is not a family containing a tax collector in which they are not all tax collectors or containing a robber in which they are not all robbers because they protect him there the family are punished with another lighter punishment but here with his own punishment as was taught rabbi said and I will cut him off why is it said because it is said and I will set my face against that man and against his family I might think the whole family shall be cut off. Therefore it is said him him will I cut off but not the whole family shall I cut off for all transgressions in the Torah he alone is punished but here he and the whole world and for all transgressions of the Torah is not the whole world punished lo it is written and they shall stumble one upon another one because of the iniquity of the other this teaches us that all Israel are sureties one for another Talmud, Mashabiyath be there they are punished because it was in their power to prevent. The sin and they did not prevent it. What is the difference between the wicked of his family and the wicked of the rest of the world, and between the righteous of his family and the righteous of the rest of the world? He himself, in the case of other transgressions, is punished by his own appropriate punishment, and the wicked of his family by a severe punishment, and the wicked of the rest of the world by a light punishment. The righteous both here and there are free in
Parata, there are scriptural verses in support of Samuel, for it is written, If a man give unto his neighbor silver or vessels to keep just as vessels implies too, so silver implies too, just as silver is a thing of worth, so everything which is of worth is included, and scripture says this is it and rab that we require for admission of a portion of the claim, and Samuel it is written it, and it is written this to teach us that if he denied a portion and admitted a portion, he is liable, and rab one word is to teach us that there must be admission of a portion of the claim, and one word is to teach us that there must be admission of the same kind as the claim, and Samuel he may retort, Can you not incidentally infer that the amount of the claim is lessened? Well, then rab may tell you silver when originally mentioned is with reference to the denial, for if it were not so, scripture could have written, If a man give unto his neighbor vessels to keep, and I would have said just as. Vessels implies too, so everything must be too. Why did scripture need to write silver since it is not required for the claim? Apply it for the denial and Samuel he may say to you if scripture had written vessels and had not written silver I might have said just as vessels implies too, so everything must be too. But a thing of worth we do not require therefore it teaches us that we do we learn two silver my HS of mine you have in your possession I have of yours in my possession only. Paratahi is exempt what is the reason is it not because the claim is now less than two my HS hence it is a refutation of Samuel's view Samuel may tell you do you think the mission means the value of two my HS it means literally two my HS that which he claimed the other did not admit to him and that which he admitted to him he had not claimed from him if so say the latter clause two silver my HS and a paratah of mine have you in your possession I have of yours in my possession. Only a paratah he is liable granted if you say the mission means the value of two my HS and a paratah therefore he is liable but if you say the mission means it literally why is he liable that which he claimed the other did not admit to him and that which he admitted to him he had not claimed from him is this not an argument against Samuel but surely Arnaman said that Samuel said if he claimed from him wheat and barley and he admitted to him one of them he is liable this appears to be. The more reasonable interpretation for it states in a later clause a litter of gold of mine you have in your possession I have of yours in my possession only a litter of silver he is exempt granted if you say the mission means them literally therefore he is exempt but if you say it means their value why is he exempt the litter is much well then since the latter clause is intended literally the first clause is also intended literally shall we say then that it will be a refutation of Rab's view no. Rab may tell you the whole mission deals with the value of my HS and Paratah but the case of a litter of gold is different Talmud, Mashabiyatha know that this is so for it states in a later clause a golden dinar of mine have you in your possession I have of yours in my possession only a silver dinar or a tresses or a pundian or a Paratah he is liable for they are all one point is granted if you say the mission deals with values therefore he is liable but if you say it means them. Literally why is he liable our Eliezer said it means he claimed from him a dinar in coins and he teaches us that a Paratah is in the category of coin this also is evidence that the mission means this for it states for they are all one point is and Rab all coins are subject to the same law now as to our Eliezer shall we say that since he expounds the latter clause in accordance with the view of Samuel he agrees in the first clause also with Samuel know the latter clause is definitely intended. Literally for it states for they are all one coinage but the first clause may be either in accordance with the view of Rab or Samuel come and here a golden dinar coin of mine you have in your possession I have of yours in my possession only a silver dinar he is liable now the reason he is liable is because he said to him a golden coin but if he had said simply a golden dinar he would have implied its value or as he said thus it means if he says a golden dinar it is as if he said a golden dinar coin are high taught in support of Rab a seller of mine you have in your possession I have of yours in my possession only a seller less two my HS he is liable less one my he is exempt our nomin B Isaac said that Samuel said they did not teach this except in the case of a claim of a creditor and admission of a portion on the part of the debtor but in the case of a claim of a creditor and the testimony of one witness even if he claimed only a paratah he is liable what is the reason because it is written one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin for any iniquity or for any sin he does not rise up but he rises up for an oath and it was taught wherever two witnesses make him liable for money one witness makes him liable for an oath and Arnaman said that Samuel said if he claimed from him wheat and barley and the other admitted one of them he is liable said our Isaac to him correct and so said our Yohanan do we infer that Rashlakish disagrees with him some say he was waiting and was silent and some say he was drinking and was silent shall we say this supports him if he claimed from him wheat and the other admitted barley he is exempt but our Gamaliel makes him liable the reason he is exempt is because he claimed from him wheat and he admitted barley but if he claimed from him wheat and barley and he admitted one of them he is liable no the same rule applies even if he claimed wheat and barley and the other admitted one he is also exempt and why they disagree in the case of wheat is to show you the power of Argamaliel come and here if he claimed from him vessels and lands and he admitted the vessels and denied the lands or admitted the lands and denied the vessels he is exempt Talmud, Mashabiyat B if he admitted a portion of the lands he is exempt a portion of the vessels he is liable now the reason he is exempt in the case of vessels and lands is because for land no oath is imposed but for vessels and vessels similar to vessels and lands he is liable no the same rule applies even in the case of vessels and vessels he is also exempt and the reason it states vessels and lands is because it wishes to teach us that if he admits a portion of the vessels he is liable also for the lands what does he intend to teach us thereby that they bind we have already learned that they bind the properties for which there is security to take an oath for them here is the chief place for the enunciation of this law there he mentions it merely incidentally and our high Abba said that our Yohanan said if he claimed from him wheat and barley and the other admitted to him one of them he is exempt but did not our Isaac say correct and so said our Yohanan they are Amorim who disagree as to our Yohanan's view come and here if he claimed from him wheat and the other admitted to him barley he is exempt and our Gamaliel makes him liable the reason he is exempt is because he claimed from him wheat and he admitted barley but if he claimed from him wheat and barley and he admitted one of them he is liable no the same rule applies even if he claimed wheat and barley and the other admitted one he is also exempt and the reason it states it thus is to show you the power of our Gamaliel come and here if he claimed from him vessels and lands and he admitted the vessels and denied the lands or admitted the lands and denied the vessels he is exempt if he admitted a portion of the lands he is Exempt a portion of the vessels he is liable the reason he is exempt in the case of vessels and lands is because for land no oath is imposed but for vessels and vessels similar to vessels and lands he is liable no the same rule applies even in the case of vessels and vessels he is also exempt but this he teaches us that if he admits a portion of the vessels he is liable also for the lands what does he teach us that they bind we have already learned that they bind the properties for which there is security to take an oath for them here is its chief place there he mentions it merely incidentally our Abba mammal raised an objection against our high B Abba if he claimed from him an ox and he admitted to him a lamb or he claimed a lamb and he admitted an ox he is exempt if he claimed from him an ox and a lamb and he admitted one of them he is liable he said to him this very is the view of our Gamaliel if it is our Gamaliel's view even in the first clause he should be liable. But it is the view of Edmund and I am not putting you off with an incorrect answer for it is an accepted teaching in the mouth of our Yohanan it is the view of Edmund Arain and said that Samuel said if he claimed from him wheat and was about to claim barley also and the other quickly came forward and admitted to him barley then if he appears to act with subtlety he is liable but if he merely intends to reply to the claim he is exempt and Arain and said that Samuel said if he claimed from him to needles and he admitted one of them he is liable for therefore were vessels expressly mentioned whatever their value are Papa said if he claimed from him vessels and a paratah and he admitted the vessels and denied the paratah he is exempt if he admitted the paratah and denied the vessels he is liable in one law he agrees with Rab and in the other with Samuel in one law he agrees with Rab who holds that the denial in the claim must be to my HS and in the other he agrees with Samuel who holds. That if he claimed from him wheat and barley and he admitted one of them he is liable a hundred denarii of mine you have in your possession I have not of yours in my possession he is exempt said Arnaman but they impose upon him the consuetudinary oath what is the reason
of an oath imposed by the Torah we do not transfer the oath but in the case of an oath imposed by the rabbis we transfer the oath and according to Marson of Arashi who holds that in the case of a Torah oath we also transfer the oath what is the difference between a Torah oath and a rabbinic oath there is this difference going down to his property in the case of a Torah oath we go down to his property in the case of a rabbinic oath we do not go down to his property and according to our Jose who holds that in the case of a rabbinic law we also go down to his property for we learned the finding of a deaf mute imbecile or minor is subject to the law of theft in the interest of peace our Jose says real theft and Arista said he means real theft according to their enactment what is the difference its extraction by the court now according to our Jose what is the difference between a Torah oath and a rabbinic oath there is a difference in the case where the opponent is suspected of Swearing falsely in the case of a Torah oath where the opponent is suspected of swearing falsely we transfer the oath to the other one but in the case of a rabbinic oath it is an enactment and we do not institute one enactment on top of another enactment and according to the rabbis who disagree with our Jose holding that in the case of a rabbinic law we do not go down to his property what do we do to him we excommunicate him said Rabbinah to Arashi this is holding him by his testicles till he gives up his cloak well then what do we do to him he Rabbinah said to him we excommunicate him until the time comes for his punishment with lashes and we lash him and leave him our Papa said if one produces a document of indebtedness against his neighbor and the other says to him it is a paid document we say to him it is not at all in your power to question the validity of the document go and pay him and if he says let him swear to me we say to him swear to him said our Ahabi Rabbi to Arashi. If so, what is the difference between this and one who impairs the validity of his document? He said to him there, even if the debtor does not demand an oath, we demand it for him. But here we say to him, go and pay him. But if he demands and says, swear to me, we say to the creditor, go and swear to him. But if he is a rabbinic scholar, we do not make him swear. Said our Yamar to our Ashi, a rabbinic scholar may strip men of their cloaks, but we do not attend to his case. You have a mind in your possession. One hundred denarii, etc. Our Judah said, our Asi said, if one lends to his neighbor before witnesses, he must repay him before witnesses. When I said this before Samuel, he said to me, he may say to him, I paid you before so and so and so and so. And they went to a country beyond the seas. We learned you have a mind in your possession. A hundred denarii, he said to him before witnesses, yes, on the morrow, he said to him, give them to me. And the other replied, I have given them to you. He is exempt now here. Since he claimed from him before witnesses it is as if he lent him before witnesses and yet it states he is exempt Talmud, Mashabiyath which is a refutation of RC RC may say to you I said that he must repay him before witnesses only if originally he lent him before witnesses which shows that he did not trust him but here he trusted him or Joseph taught it thus our Judah said RC said if one lends to his neighbor before witnesses he need not repay him before witnesses but if he said to him do not repay me except before witnesses he must repay him before witnesses when I said this before Samuel he said to me he may say to him I paid you before so and so and so and so and they went to a country beyond the seas we learned you have a mind in your possession a hundred denarii he said to him before witnesses yes he said to him do not give them to me except before witnesses on the morrow he said to him give them to me and the other replied I have given them to you he is liable because he must give them to him before witnesses. This is a refutation of Samuel. Samuel may say to you, This is a question upon which Tanaim disagree, for it was taught if a man said to his fellow, I lent you before witnesses, pay me before witnesses, he must either pay or bring proof that he has paid our Judah. But there is said, He may say to him, I paid you before so and so and so and so, and they went to a country beyond the seas. Araha asked, How do we know that this refers to the time of the loan? Perhaps it refers to the time of the claim, and thus he says to him, Did I not lend you before witnesses? You should have repaid me before witnesses, but at the time of the loan, all hold that he is liable. Our Papa said in the name of Rabbi, the law is if one lends his neighbor before witnesses, he must repay him before witnesses, but our Papa said in the name of Rabbi, if one lends his neighbor before witnesses, he need not repay him before witnesses, but if he said to him, Do not repay me except before witnesses he must repay him before witnesses and if he says to him I repaid you before so and so and so and so and they went to a country beyond the seas he is believed Nimon Grubin and Simeon who studied the law they lent and paid before so and so and so and so Galnut's different claims being believed as to there was a certain man who said to his neighbor when you repay me repay me before Reuben and Simeon but he went and repaid him before two others Abbe said he told him to repay him before two witnesses and he said he repaid him before two witnesses said Robert to him for this reason he said to him before Reuben and Simeon so that he should not be able to put him off there was a certain man who said to his neighbor when you repay me repay me before two who have studied laws he went and repaid him privately the money was lost the lender came to Arnaman and said yes I received it from him but only as a deposit and I said let it remain with me as a deposit until we obtain two witnesses who have studied law so that the condition may be fulfilled said Arnaman to him since you admit that you definitely received the money from him it is a proper repayment if you desire the condition to be fulfilled go and bring the money here for here am I and Arshis who have studied the law Sifra Sifra Tisipta and the whole Gemara there was a certain man who said to his neighbor give me the hundred zoos that I'll lend you the other said to him the thing never happened he went and brought witnesses that he lent him but they also said he repaid him Abbe said what shall we do they say he lent him and they themselves say he repaid him Rabbi said if he says I did not borrow it is as if he said I did not repay there was a certain man who said to his neighbor give me the hundred zoos that I claim from you he replied to him did I not repay you before so and so and so and so thereupon so and so and so and so came and said the thing never happened are Jesus he thought of saying that he was therefore proven a liar said Robert to him anything which does not rest upon a man he will do unconsciously there was a certain man who said to his neighbor give me the six hundred zoos that I claim from you the other replied to him did I not repay you a hundred cabs Talmud, Mashabiyatha of Galnuts which were worth six zoos per cab he said to him no they were worth four zoos per cab two witnesses came and said yes they were worth four zoos per cab. Said Robert he is proven a liar said Rami Bihama but you said anything which does not rest upon a man he will do unconsciously said Robert to him the fixed market price people remember there was a certain man who said to his neighbor give me the hundred zoos that I claim from you and here is the document he said to him I have paid you the other said to him those monies were for a different claim Arnaman said the document is impaired our Papa said the document is not impaired and according to our Papa, in what way does this differ from the case of the man who said to his neighbor, Give me the hundred zoos that I claim from you, and here is the document? And the other said to him, Did you not give it to me to buy oxen, and did you not come and sit by the butcher's stall and receive your money? And he replied to him, Those monies were on a different occasion, and our Papa said, The document is impaired there since he said you gave the money to me for oxen, and you received repayment from the sale of the oxen. The document is impaired, but here perhaps they were for a different claim. What then is the ruling with reference to this? Our Papa said, The document is not impaired. Our she hate the son of Aridi said, The document is impaired, and the law is the document is impaired, but this is so only if he paid him before witnesses and did not remember to take back the document, but if he paid him privately since he could have said the thing never happened, he can also say the monies were for a Different account as in the case of Abami the son of Arabah there was a certain man who said to his neighbor you are believed by me whenever you say to me that I have not paid you he went and paid him before witnesses Abay and Rabba both said behold he believes him or Papa argued granted he believes him more than himself but does he believe him more than witnesses there was a certain man who said to his neighbor you are believed by me like two witnesses whenever you say that I have not paid you he went and paid him before three witnesses or Papa said like two he believed him but like three he did not believe him said Arhuna the son of Arjashua to our Papa when do the rabbis say that we go according to the majority of opinions only in the case of estimates where the more there are the more experts there are but in the case of testimony a hundred are like two and two are like a hundred another version there was a certain man who said to his neighbor you are believed by me like two, whenever you say that I have not paid you, he went and paid him before three said our Papa like two, he believed him, but like three he did not believe him to this Arhuna the son of our Joshua Demur two are like a
For the claim of a deaf mute imbecile or minor indeed an adult is meant and he is called a minor because with reference to the affairs of his father he is a minor if so why does our Eliezer call it his own claim it is the claim of others yes it is the claim of others but his own admission Talmud, Masjub Yathbi but all cases are the claims of others and his own admission but say they disagree in Rabbah's dictum for Rabbah said why did scripture say that he who admits a portion of a claim must take an oath because it is a presumption that a man has not the effrontery to deny a claim in front of his creditor for this one may have wished to deny it all but did not deny it because he had not the effrontery to do so in front of his creditor and he really wished to admit it all but he did not admit it all because he tried to evade him for the moment thinking what I will have money I will pay him so divine law said impose an oath on him so that he may admit it all now are Eliezer B. Jacob holds no matter whether against him or against his son he has not the effrontery and therefore he is not a restorer of a lost object but the rabbis hold against him himself he has not the effrontery but against his son he has the effrontery and since he is not evincing any effrontery he is a restorer of a lost object and exempt but how can you affirm the mission to be in accordance with the view of our Eliezer B. Jacob surely it states in the first clause you have a hundred denarii of my father's in your possession I have of his in my possession only fifty denarii he is exempt for he is a restorer of a lost object there he did not say I am certain here he said I am certain Samuel said against a minor means to collect payment from the estate of a minor against the temple to collect payment from the estate of the temple against a minor to collect payment from the estate of a minor but we have already learned it is from the estate of orphans one cannot Collect payment except with an oath. Why do we require this ruling twice? This he teaches us as Abbe the Elder said for Abbe the Elder stated orphans which are mentioned are adults and there is no need to say they include minors whether for oath or for exacting payment from the lowest class of land against the temple to collect payment from the estate of the temple but we have already learned it is from assigned property they cannot collect except with an oath for what is the difference whether they are assigned to a layman or assigned to the most high it is necessary for I might have thought in the case of property assigned to a layman an oath is necessary because a man may make a conspiracy to defraud a layman but in the case of the temple an oath is not necessary for a man will not make a conspiracy to defraud the temple therefore he teaches us that it is necessary but did not Arhuna say a dying man who dedicated all his property to the temple and said I have a hundred denarii of so and so in my possession he is believed because it is a presumption that a man does not make a conspiracy to defraud the temple I will tell you that is only in the case of a dying man for a man will not sin without benefit to himself but in the case of a healthy man we certainly fear for conspiracy mission and these are the things for which no oath is imposed slaves bonds lands and dedicated objects the law of paying double or four or five times the value does not apply to them an unpaid guardian does not take an oath and a paid guardian does not pay our simian said for dedicated objects for which he is responsible an oath is imposed and for which he is not responsible an oath is not imposed our mayor said there are things which are attached to land but are not like land but the sages do not agree with him how if a man says ten vines laden with fruit I deliver to you and the other says there were only five our mayor makes him take an oath but it Sages say all that is attached to land is like land an oath is imposed only for a thing defined by size weight or number how if a man says a house full of produce I deliver to you or a purse full of money I deliver to you and the other says I do not know but what you left you may take he is exempt if one says I gave you produce reaching up to the molding above the window and the other says only up to the window he is liable to that the law of paying double does not apply. How do we know our rabbis taught for every matter of trespass is a generalization for ox for ass for sheep for rhyme our specifications for any lost thing is another generalization where there is generalization specification and generalization you may include only those things which are similar to the specification just as the specification is clearly a thing which is movable and intrinsically worth money so everything which is movable and intrinsically worth money may be included but Exclude lands which are not movable, exclude slaves which are likened to land, and exclude bonds which though they are movable are not intrinsically worth money as for dedicated things it is written his neighbor and not four or five times the value what is the reason the payment of four or five times the value said scripture and not the payment of three or four times the value an unpaid guardian does not take an oath whence do we know this our rabbis taught Talmud, Moshe of a man. Give unto his neighbor is a generalization silver or vessels are specifications to keep is another generalization where there is generalization specification and generalization you may include only those things which are similar to the specification just as the specification is clearly a thing which is movable and intrinsically worth money so everything which is movable and intrinsically worth money may be included but exclude lands which are not movable exclude slaves which are likened. To land and exclude bonds which though they are movable are not intrinsically worth money as for dedicated things it is written his neighbor a paid guardian does not pay whence do we know this our rabbis taught if a man give unto his neighbor is a generalization an ass or an ox or a sheep are specifications or any beast to keep is another generalization where there is generalization specification and generalization etc till as for dedicated things it is written his neighbor our mayor said there are things which are attached to land but are not like land etc hence our mayor holds that which is attached to land is not counted like land and why do they disagree about laden vines let them disagree about fruitless trees our jose son of our hannah said here they disagree about grapes which are ready to be cut our mayor holding there as if they are already cut whereas the rabbis hold they are not as if they are already cut an oath is imposed only for a thing defined by size weight etc. Abbe said they did not teach that an oath is not imposed except when he said to him a house merely but if he said to him this house full etc. his claim is known said Robert to him if so why does he teach in the later clause this one said I gave you produce reaching up to the molding above the window and the other said only up to the window he is liable let him make a distinction in teaching this first clause itself thus when is it stated that an oath is not imposed only if he says a full house but if he says this full house he is liable but said Robert he is never liable unless he claims from him a thing that is defined by size weight or number and he admits to him a thing that is defined by size weight or number it was taught in support of Robert if a man says a core of grain of mine you have in your possession and the other says I have not of yours in my possession he is exempt a large candlestick of mine you have in your possession I have of yours in my possession only a small candlestick he is exempt a large girdle of mine you have in your possession I have of yours in my possession only a small girdle he is exempt but if he said to him a core of grain of mine you have in your possession and the other said I have of yours in my possession only a lethek of grain he is liable a candlestick of the weight of ten liters you have of mine in your possession I have of yours in my possession a candlestick of the weight of only five liters he is liable the principle of the matter is he is never liable unless he claims from him a thing that is defined by size weight or number and he admits to him a thing that is defined by size weight or number now the principle of the matter what does this include does it not include the case where he says this house full etc now what is the difference in the case of large candlestick and small candlestick he is exempt because what he claimed from him he did not admit to him and what he Admitted to him he did not claim from him if so in the case of ten liters and five liters weight he should also be exempt because what he claimed from him he did not admit to him and what he admitted to him he did not claim from him our Samuel son of our Isaac said here we are discussing a candlestick of sections of which he admits a portion if so in the case of girdle also let him teach a similar law and explain it as referring to pieces sewn together but you must conclude that he did. Tana does not state the case of a girdle made up of pieces sewn together here also then he would not state the case of a candlestick made up of separate sections but said our Abba a candlestick is different because he can scrape it and reduce it to five liters mission if a man lends money to his neighbor on a pledge and the pledge was lost and he said to him I lent you a sell on it and it was worth a shekel and the other says no you lent me a sell on it and it was worth a Sella he is exempt I lent you a sell on it and it was worth a shekel and the other says no you lent me a sell on it and it was worth three denarii he is liable you lent me a sell on it and it was worth two and the other says no I lent you a sell on it and it was worth a sell he is exempt you lent me a sell on it and it was worth two and the other says no I lent you a sell on it and it was worth five denarii he is liable and who takes the oath he who had the deposit lest if the other take the oath this one may bring out the deposit Talmud, Moshe of to what does it refer shall
To his neighbor who deposited with him as a pledge the handle of the saw. If the handle of the saw is lost, the thousand zoos are lost. But in the case of two handles, we do not say this. But Arnaman says, even in the case of two handles, if he lost one, he loses five hundred zoos. If he lost also the other, he loses the whole loan. But in the case of a handle and a bar of silver, we do not say this. The Nihardians say, even in the case of a handle and silver bar, if he lost the silver bar, he loses half the loan. If he lost also the handle, he loses the whole loan. We learned I lent you a seller on it and it was worth a shekel. And the other says, no, you lent me a seller on it and it was worth three denarii. He is liable now. Why let him say to him, but you accepted it as security. Our mission refers to a case where he stated explicitly, and Samuel refers to a case where he did not state this explicitly. Shall we say that Tanaim disagree on this point? For it was taught if a man lends. His neighbor money on a pledge and the pledge was lost, he swears and takes his money. This is the opinion of our Eliezer. Our Akiva says he may say to him, Did you not lend me because of the pledge? Since the pledge is lost, your money is lost. But if one lends a thousand zoos on a bond and he deposited a pledge with him, all agree that if the pledge is lost, the money is lost. Now, how is this if the pledge is equal to the amount of the loan? Talmud, Mosh Yatha, what is the reason of our Eliezer? But you must therefore say it is not equal to the amount of the loan, and they disagree about Samuel's ruling. No, if it is not equal to the amount of the loan, neither of them would agree with Samuel. But here it is equal to the amount of the loan, and they disagree about our Isaac's ruling. For our Isaac said, Whence do we know that the creditor possesses the pledge because it is said, and it shall be righteousness unto thee? Now, if he does not possess the pledge, wherein is his righteousness in returning? It hence the creditor possesses the pledge. Shall we say then that these ten disagree about our Isaac's ruling? How can you think so? You may say that our Isaac stated his law if he took the pledge not at the time of his loan, but if he took the pledge at the time of the loan, did he say this? But answer thus if he took the pledge not at the time of the loan, all agree with our Isaac. But here we deal with the case where he took the pledge at the time of his loan and they disagree on it. Same principle which governs the guardian of a lost object, for it has been stated the guardian of a lost object. Rabbi says he is like an unpaid bailey Talmud. Mosh of and our Joseph says he is like a paid bailey. Shall we say then that these ten disagree about our Joseph's ruling? No, in the case of a guardian of a lost object, all agree with our Joseph, but here they disagree in a case where the lender requires the pledge for his use. One holds he is doing a miswa and the other. Holds he is not doing a miswa. Shall we say that the following Tanaim disagree about Samuel's ruling? For it was taught if one lends his neighbor money on a pledge and the sabbatical year arrives, even if it is only worth a half, it does not cancel the debt. This is the opinion of Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel Arjuna. The prince says if his pledge was equal in value to the debt, it does not cancel it. But if not, it cancels it. Now, what is meant by it does not cancel it? Which the first Tana states, shall we say only up to its value? But this would imply that Arjuna, the prince, holds it cancels also that portion up to its value. Then for what purpose is he holding the pledge? But it therefore means does it not all of it? And they disagree about Samuel's ruling. No, really, only up to its value. And in this they disagree. The first Tana holds it does not cancel up to its value. And Arjuna, the prince, holds it cancels also up to its value. And as to your question, why is he holding it? Pledge that is merely as a reminder. Chapter seven. Mission. All who take an oath enforced in scripture take an oath and do not pay, but these take an oath and receive payment. The hired laborer, he who has been robbed, he who has been wounded, he whose opponent is suspected of taking a false oath, and the shopkeeper with his account book. The hired laborer, how if he says to him, his employer, give me my wages which you owe me, and he replies, I have given it, and the other says, I have not received it. He, the laborer, takes an oath and obtains his due. Our Judah says there is no oath unless there is partial admission. How if he says to him, give me my wages, fifty denarii which you owe me, and the other says, you have received a gold denarii. He who has been robbed, how if they testified of a man that he entered into another's house to take a pledge without authority, and the other says, you have taken my vessels, and he says, I have not taken them. He takes an oath and recovers them. Are Judah says there is no oath unless there is partial admission. How he said to him, You have taken two vessels, and the other says, I have taken only one. He who has been wounded, how if they testified of a man that another went into him whole and came out wounded, and he said to him, You have wounded me, and the other said, I have not wounded you. He takes an oath and receives damages. Our Judah says there is no oath unless there is partial admission. How he said to him, You have inflicted on me two wounds, and the other said, I inflicted on you only one wound. He whose opponent is suspected of taking a false oath. How Talmud, Mosh of whether it be the oath of testimony or the oath of deposit or even of an oath, if one of the litigants was a dice player or usurer or pigeon flyer or dealer in the produce of the seventh year, his opponent takes the oath and receives his claim. If both are suspected, oath returns to its place. This is the opinion of our Jose our mayor says they divide in. The shopkeeper with his account book, how not that he e.g. says to him, it is written in my account book that you owe me 200 ZUZ, but he says to him, give my son two C's of wheat or give my laborer a small change to the value of a seller. He says, I have given, and they say, we have not received. He takes an oath and receives his due, and they take an oath and receive their due. Ben Nanya said, how can both be permitted to come to obey an oath, but he takes without an oath, and they take without an oath. If he said to a shopkeeper, give me fruit for a dinar, and he gave him, and the shopkeeper said to him, give me the dinar, and he replied to him, I gave it to you, and you placed it in the till. The householder takes an oath. If he gave him the dinar and said to him, give me the fruit, and the shopkeeper says to him, I have given it to you, and you took it to your house. The shopkeeper takes an oath. Our Judah says, he who has the fruit in his possession, his hand is uppermost. If he said to him, Money changer, give me change for a dinar, and he gave him and said to him, Give me the dinar, and the other said, I have given it to you, and you placed it in the till. The householder takes an oath if he gave him a dinar and said to him, Give me the small change, and the other said to him, I have given it to you, and you threw it in your purse. The money changer takes an oath. Our Judah says it is not usual for a money changer to give even an isar until he receives the dinar, just as they have said that. She who impairs her kethuba cannot receive payment except on oath, and that if one witness testifies against her that it has been paid in full, she cannot receive payment except on oath, and that from assigned property or orphan's property she cannot exact payment except on oath, and that if she claims not in his presence she cannot receive payment except on oath, so two orphans cannot receive payment except on oath, namely we swear that our father did not enjoin in his testament upon us neither. Did our father say unto us, nor did we find written among the documents of our father that this document is paid? Our Yohanan B. Baraka says, even if the son was born after his father's death, he may take an oath and receive his claim. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel says, if there are witnesses that the father said at the time of his death that this document was not paid, he receives his claim without an oath, and he's taken oath, though there is no definite claim. Partners, tenants, administrators, the wife who transacts the affairs in the house and the son of the house, if he said to him, What do you claim of me? And the other replied, I desire that you swear to me, he must take an oath. If the partners or tenants had divided, he cannot impose an oath upon them. If an oath was imposed upon him, in another case, they impose upon him the whole, and the seventh year cancels the oath. Gemara, all who take an oath enforced in scripture take an oath and do not pay. Once do we know this because scripture? Said and the owner thereof shall accept it, and he shall not pay. He whose duty it is to pay upon him devolves the oath, but these take an oath and receive payment, etc. In what way is the hired laborer different that the rabbis have instituted for him the privilege that he should take the oath and receive his wages? Rab Judah said that Samuel said, Great Halashat, did they teach your Halashat? Are these then Halashat? But say, Great enactments, did they teach your great hands? There are also small enactments, but said Arnaman that Samuel said, Fixed enactments, did they teach your rabbis? Remove the oath from the householder and imposed it upon the hired laborer for the sake of his livelihood, but for the sake of the laborer's livelihood, do we find the householder? The householder himself is satisfied that the laborer should take the oath and receive his wages so that laborers may hire themselves out to him. On the contrary, the hired laborer is satisfied that the Householder should take the oath and be released from payment so that the
Hired you and paid you your hire are Isaac said to him correct and so said are you and are we hence to infer that Resh Lakish disagrees with him some say that he was drinking and was silent and some say that he waited for him and was silent it was stated also Armanish Abizi but said that Rab said they did not teach this except when he hired him in the presence of witnesses but if he hired him without witnesses since he may say to him I never hired you he may say to him I hired you and paid you. Your hire Rami Bihama said how excellent is this ruling said Rabbi to him wherein is its excellence if such is the case the oath of guardians which the divine law imposes how is it possible of fulfillment since he may say to him the thing never happened he may say to him it was an unpreventable accident in the case where he deposited it with him before witnesses but since he may say to him I returned it to you he may say to him an accident happened in the case where he deposited it with him but a document hence we can infer that both hold that he who deposits an article with his neighbor before witnesses need not return it to him before witnesses but if by document he must return it to him before witnesses Rami Biham applied to Arshis hate the verse and David laid up these words in his heart for Arshis hate met Rabbi B. Samuel and said to him have you studied anything about a hired laborer he replied to him yes we are taught a hired laborer if he claims within his time limit takes an oath and receives his wages how if he said to him you hired me and did not pay me my wages and the other said I hired you and did pay you your wages but if he said to him two did you stipulate to pay me and the other said I stipulated to pay you only one he who desires to exact from his neighbor must bring proof now since the second clause is concerned with proof the first clause is not concerned with proof Arnam and B. Isaac said Talmud, Mashabiatha both the first and second. Clauses are concerned with proof. The proof which necessitates payment. He mentions the proof which necessitates merely an oath. He does not mention our Jeremiah B. Abba said the school of Rab sent to Samuel the request. Let our master teach us. If an artisan says to his employer, "To Zeus have you stipulated to pay me?" and the other says, "I stipulated to pay you." Only one who takes the oath. He replied to them. In this case, the householder takes the oath, and the artisan loses for the amount. Stipulated people certainly remember, but this is not so. For did not Rabbi B. Samuel learn in the case of dispute about the amount stipulated? He who desires to exact from his neighbor must bring proof, thus implying that if he does not bring proof, it is cancelled. But why let the householder take an oath and the artisan lose? Arnaman said both alternatives are meant. Either the artisan brings proof and receives his claim, or the householder takes an oath and the artisan loses an objection. Was raised if one gave his cloak to an artisan to mend and the artisan says you did stipulate to pay me two zoos and the other says I stipulated to pay you only one as long as the cloak is in the hands of the artisan the householder must bring proof but if he had already given it him then if he claims within his time limit he takes an oath and receives his claim but if his time has passed he who desires to exact from his neighbor must bring proof now it states after all if he claims within his time limit he takes an oath and receives his claim while let the householder take an oath and the artisan lose our nom and B. Isaac said this is in accordance with the view of our Judah who says whenever the oath inclines towards the householder the hired person takes the oath and receives his claim which our Judah shall we say our Judah of our mission surely he is more stringent for we learned our Judah says there is no oath unless there is partial admission but it is our Judah of it. Very for it was taught a hired laborer as long as his time limit has not expired takes an oath and receives his claim but if not he does not take an oath and receive his claim and our Judah said when does he take an oath only if he says to him give me my wages 50 denarii which you owe me and the other says you have already received of it a gold denar or if he says to him two did you stipulate to pay me and the other says I stipulated to pay you only one but if he says to him I never hired you at all or if he says to him I hired you and paid you your wages then he who desires to exact from his neighbor must bring proof to this Arshish the son of R.E.D. demurred well then in the case where the dispute is about the amount stipulated is this ruling the view of our Judah and not that of the rabbis now since where our Judah is more stringent the rabbis are more lenient where our Judah is more lenient will the rabbis be more stringent but then will the rabbis also agree then that which Rabbi B. Samuel learned that where the amount stipulated is in dispute, he who desires to exact from his neighbor must bring proof whose view would it be. It cannot be the view of our Judah nor that of the rabbis, but said Rabbi, in this they disagree. Our Judah holds in an oath imposed by the Torah an enactment was instituted in favor of the hired laborer, but in an oath imposed by the rabbis, which is itself an enactment, we do not impose one enactment upon another enactment. And the rabbis hold even in an oath imposed by the rabbis, we also institute an enactment in favor of the hired laborer, but in the case of a dispute about the amount stipulated, this the employer remembers he who was robbed, how if they testified against him that he entered his house to seize his pledge, etc. But perhaps he did not seize his pledge, did not Arnaman say if one held an axe in his hand and said, I am going to cut down the palm tree of so and so, and it was found cut and cast on it. Ground we do not say that he cut it down hence a man often boasts but does not fulfill here also perhaps he boasted and did not fulfill read and seize his pledge then let us see what pledge he sees Rabbi Barhanna said that our Yohanan said he claimed from him vessels which may be taken under his garments Rab Judah said if they saw him hiding articles under his garments and he came out Talmud, Mashabiath B and said I bought them he is not believed and we do not say this except in the case of a householder who does not usually sell his household articles but in the case of a householder who sometimes sells his articles he is believed and in the case of a householder who does not usually sell his household articles we also do not say that the intruder is not believed except with regard to articles it is not usual to hide but with regard to articles which it is usual to hide he is believed and with regard to articles which it is not usual to hide we also do not Say that he is not believed except if he is a man who is not decorous but in the case of a decorous man that is his way and we do not say that he is not believed except when the householder says he lent them and the other says he bought them but if the householder says the other stole them it is not at all in the householder's power to say so for we do not assuredly presume a man to be a robber and we do not say that the intruder is not believed except in the case of articles which it is customary to lend or hire out but in the case of articles which it is not customary to lend or hire out he is believed for our Hunabi Abin sent his decision that in the case of articles which it is customary to lend or hire out and the intruder said I bought them he is not believed as in the case where robber removed a pair of scissors for cutting cloth and a book of Agata from orphans things which it is customary to lend and hire out robber said even the caretaker may take the oath and even the caretaker's wife may take the oath. Our papa inquired in the case of his hired laborer or retainer, what is the ruling? Let it stand. Our Yamar said to our Ashi, if he claimed from him a silver goblet, what is the ruling? He replied, We see if he is a man reputed to be wealthy or a man who is trustworthy, so that people deposit articles with him. He takes an oath and recovers the goblet, but if not, he does not. He who was wounded, how Rab Judah said that Samuel said they did not teach it except if the wound were in a spot where he could have inflicted it himself. But if it is in a spot where he could not have inflicted it himself, he receives compensation without an oath. But let us take into consideration that perhaps he rubbed himself against the wall. Our Hayat taught that the Mishnah deals with a case where a bite appeared on his back or between his armpits, but perhaps someone else did it to him. There was no other, and he whose opponent is suspected of swearing falsely and even. Of an oath, what is meant by even of an oath? He states a case of not only not only if he is guilty in these where there is a denial of money, but even in this also, which is merely a denial of words, he is no longer believed on oath. Let him mention also the oath of utterance. He mentions only such an oath that at the time of swearing he swears falsely, but the oath of utterance where it is possible to say that he is swearing the truth, he does not mention granted in the case of I shall eat or I shall not eat, but in the case of I have eaten or I have not eaten, what shall we say? He mentions Vainoth Talmud, Mashabiate, and all that are similar to it. If one of them was a dice player, wherefore is this necessary? He the Tana mentions a biblical disqualification and he mentions a rabbinic disqualification. If both were suspect, etc. Rabbi said to Arnaman, How did we learn in the Mishnah? He said to him, I do not know what is the law. He said to him, I do not know it was stated. Are. Joseph Bimanyam I said that Arnaman said our Jose says they divide and so did Arzibid B. Ashai learned our Jose says they divide some say Arzibid
Snatch said RMI, how shall judges settle this dispute? Shall we say to him, go and pay? There are not two witnesses, shall we exempt him? There is one witness that he snatched, shall we say to him, go and swear? Since he says, I snatched it, he is like a robber. Our Abba said to him, he is liable to take an oath, and he cannot take the oath, and everyone who is liable to take an oath and cannot take the oath must pay. Rabba said, it is reasonable to agree with our Abba, for RMI learned the oath of the Lord. Shall be between them both, but not between the ears. How is this to be understood? Shall we say that he said to him, your father owed my father a hundred zoos, and the other replied to him, fifty, he owed him, but not the other fifty. What is the difference between him and his father? But then it must mean he said to him, your father owed my father a hundred zoos, and the other replied to him, fifty, I know, but the other fifty, I do not know Talmud. Mashabiyat be now granted if you say that his father. In such circumstances would have been liable to take an oath it is therefore necessary for scripture to exempt the ears but if you say that his father in such circumstances would also have been exempt wherefore do we need scripture to exempt the ears and rap and Samuel how do they expound this verse the oath of the Lord etc they require it for what was taught Simeon B. Tarfan says the oath of the Lord shall be between them both this teaches that the oath falls upon both Simeon B. Tarfan says whence do we know that there is a prohibition to the sutner because it is said thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not cause adultery to be committed and you murmured in your tent Simeon B. Tarfan says you spied out and put to shame the tent of the omnipresent as far as the great river the river Euphrates Simeon B. Tarfan says go near a fat man and be fat in the school of our Ishmael and was taught the servant of a king is like a king and the shopkeeper with his account book etc it was Taught Rabbi said what is the object of troubling with this oath? Our high said to him we have already learned it both take an oath and receive payment from the householder did he accept it from him or did he not accept it from him come and here it was taught Rabbi says the workmen take an oath to the shopkeeper now if it were so it should be to the householder that they take the oath Rabbi said the workmen swear to the householder in the presence of the shopkeeper so that they may be ashamed because of him it was stated if two sets of witnesses contradict each other Aruna said the set may come by itself and bear testimony and that set may come by itself and bear testimony but Arhista said what do we want with false witnesses where there are two lenders and two borrowers and two documents is the point at issue between them in the case of one lender and one borrower and two documents the holder of the document is at a disadvantage where there are two lenders and one Borrower and two documents, that is our mission, but in the case of two borrowers and one lender and two documents, what is Arhuna's ruling? Let it stand, Arhuna be Judah raised an objection, Talmud. Mashabiyat, if one said it was two ox goats high and the other said three, their testimony is valid, but if one said three and the other said five, their testimony is invalid, but they may join for other testimony. Now, does this not mean for testimony in a money matter? Rabbi said, No, it means he. And another may join for other testimony for this new moon, for they are now two against one, and the words of one are of no value where there are two. He said to the shopkeeper, Give me for a dinar fruit, etc. It was taught, Arjuna said, When do we say that the householder takes the oath if the fruits are heaped up and lying there and both are contesting about them, but if he threw them into his basket over his back, he who wishes to exact from his neighbor must bring proof, he said to the money. Changer give me etc. It is necessary for both clauses to be stated for if he had taught us only the first one we might have thought in that case the rabbi say that the householder takes an oath because fruit may decay and because it decays they do not keep it but in the case of money which does not decay we might think they agree with Arjuna and if the second clause had been stated we might have thought in this case Arjuna says that the householder does not take an oath but in that first clause I might have thought he agrees with the rabbis therefore both clauses are necessary just as they said that she who impairs her ketuba so also orphans cannot exact payment except with an oath from whom shall we say from the borrower their father would have obtained payment without an oath and they require an oath thus he the tana means so also orphans from orphans cannot exact payment except with an oath rab and Samuel both said they did not teach this except if it Lender died during the lifetime of the borrower, but if the borrower died during the lifetime of the lender, the lender had already become liable to take an oath to the children of the borrower, and a man cannot bequeath an oath to his children. They sent this question to our Eliezer, what is the nature of this oath? He sent them the reply, the heirs swear the oath of heirs and receive their due. They sent this question also in the days of RMI. He explained, so often do they continue sending this question. If I would have found some argument in connection with it, would I not have sent it to them? But said RMI, since it has come to us, we will say something concerning it. If he stood in the court and died, the lender had already become liable to take an oath to the children of the borrower, and a man cannot bequeath an oath to his children. But if he died before he came to the court, the heirs swear the oath of heirs and receive their due to this Arnam and Demert. Is it the court that? Makes him liable to take the oath from the time that the borrower died. The lender had already become liable to take an oath to the children of the borrower, but said Arnaman, if the ruling of Rab and Samuel is accepted, it is accepted, and if not, not hence he is in doubt, but did not our Joseph Bimanyam I say that Arnaman decided a case that they should divide according to the view of our mayor he means, but he himself does not agree. Our Ashai raised an objection if she died, her ears mentioned her. Ketuba until twenty five years have elapsed here. We are discussing a case where she took the oath and then died. Come and here if he married the first wife and she died, and he married the second and he died the second, and her ears come before the ears of the first year. Also she took the oath and then died. Come and here, but his ears make her take an oath and her ears and those who come with her authority are she may said alternatives are stated her if she is a widow and her ears if she is. Divorced our Nathan B. Hashai raised an objection the son's power is more extensive than the father's power Talmud, Mashabiyat be for the son exacts payment either with an oath or without an oath whereas the father exacts payment only with an oath now in what circumstances obviously if the borrower died during the lifetime of the lender and yet it states that the son exacts payment either with an oath or without an oath with an oath the oath of heirs without an oath as our Simeon B. Gamaliel says our Joseph said this is in accordance with the view of Beth Shammai who hold that a bond which is ready to be collected is counted as if it is already collected our Naman happened to come to Surah Arhista and Rabbi son of Arhuna went into him and said to him come sir abrogate this ruling of Rab and Samuel he replied to them have I taken the trouble to come all these parsangs in order to abrogate the ruling of Rab and Samuel but grant at least that we do not add to it as for example that which our papa said he who impairs his bond and died his heirs swear the oath of heirs and obtain payment there was a man who died and left a guarantor our papa thought of saying in this case also the principle that we should not add to it applies said Arhuna the son of our Joshua to our papa will not the guarantor go after the orphans there was a certain man who died and left a brother Rami Behama thought of saying this is also a case where the principle we should not add to it applies said Rabbah to him what is the difference between my father did not instruct me etc and my brother did not instruct me etc our Hama said now since the law has not been stated either in accordance with the view of Rab and Samuel or in accordance with the view of our Eliezer if a judge decides as Rab and Samuel it is legal if he decides as our Eliezer it is also legal our papa said this document of orphans we do not tear up and we do not exact payment on it we do not exact payment on it in case we agree with Rab. And Samuel and we do not tear up for if a judge decides as our Eliezer it is legal there was a judge who decided as our Eliezer there was a rabbinic scholar in his town who said to him I can bring a letter from the West that the law is not in accordance with our Eliezer he replied to him when you bring it he came before our Hama he said to him if a judge decides as our Eliezer it is legal and these take an oath though no claim is preferred against them are we discussing the case of idiots thus he means and these take an oath not in a definite claim but in a doubtful claim partners tenants etc a tenant taught the son of the house who was mentioned in the mission as liable to take an oath does not mean that he walks in and walks out but he brings in laborers and takes out laborers brings in produce and takes out produce and wherein are these different because they allow themselves permission in it or Joseph Bimanyam I said that Arnaman said but only when the claim between them is at at least two silver my HS in accordance with whose view Samuels but are high taught in support of Rab say the denial of the claim as Rab holds if the partners or tenants had divided an oath
Hard labor to whom we are lenient, what is the difference between them? There is this difference whether the court find an opening for him to impose another oath, but the sabbatical year cancels the oath. Whence do we know this? Argidal said that Rab said because scripture says, and this is the word of the release, even a word it releases. Chapter 8 Mishnah There are four guardians, an unpaid guardian, a borrower, a paid guardian, and a hire. An unpaid guardian takes an oath in all cases. A borrower pays in all cases, a paid guardian, and a hire take an oath in the case of injury, capture, or death, but pay for loss or theft. If he, the owner said to the unpaid guardian, Where is my ox? And he replied to him, It died, whereas it was injured, or captured, or stolen, or lost, or he replied, IT was injured, whereas it died, or was captured, or stolen, or lost, or he replied, IT was captured, whereas it died, or was injured, or stolen, or lost, or he replied, IT was stolen, whereas it died, or was injured. Or captured or lost, or he replied, IT was lost, whereas it died, or was injured, or captured, or stolen, and the owner said, I adjure you, and he said, Amen, he is exempt. If the owner said, Where is my ox? And he replied to him, I do not know what you say, whereas it died, or was injured, or captured, or stolen, or lost, and the owner said, I adjure you, and he said, Amen, he is exempt. If the owner said, Where is my ox? And he replied to him, It was lost, and the owner said, I adjure you, and he said, Amen. And witnesses testified against him that he had consumed it, he pays the principal, if he confessed himself, he pays the principal, fifth, and guilt offering. If the owner said, Where is my ox? And he replied to him, It was stolen, and the owner said, I adjure you, and he said, Amen, and witnesses testified against him that he himself stole it, he pays double, if he confessed himself, he pays the principal, fifth, and guilt offering. If a man said to one in the street, Where is my ox, which you have stolen, and he Replied, I did not steal it, and witnesses testified against him that he did steal it. He pays double if he killed it or sold it. He pays four or five times its value if he saw witnesses coming nearer and nearer. And he said, I did steal it, but I did not kill or sell it. He pays only the principal if he the owner said to the borrower, Where is my ox? And he replied to him, Talmud, Mashabiyat bit died, whereas it was injured or captured or stolen or lost. Or he replied, It was injured, whereas it died or was captured or stolen or lost. Or he replied, It was captured, whereas it died or was injured or stolen or lost. Or he replied, It was stolen, whereas it died or was injured or captured or lost. Or he replied, It was lost, whereas it died or was injured or captured or stolen. And the owner said, I adjure you, and he said, Amen. He is exempt if the owner said, Where is my ox? And he replied to him, I do not know what you say, whereas it died or was injured or captured or stolen or lost. And it Owner said, I drew you, and he said, Amen. He is liable if he said to a paid guardian or hire, Where is my ox? And he replied to him, It died, whereas it was injured or captured, or he replied, IT was injured, whereas it died, or was captured, or he replied, IT was captured, whereas it died, or was injured, or he replied, IT was stolen, whereas it was lost, or he replied, IT was lost, whereas it was stolen. And the owner said, I drew you, and he said, Amen. He is exempt if he replied, IT died, or it was injured, or it was captured, whereas it was stolen, or lost. And the owner said, I drew you, and he said, Amen. He is liable if he replied, IT was lost, or it was stolen, whereas it died, or was injured, or captured. And the owner said, I drew you, and he said, Amen. He is exempt. This is the principle. He who by lying changes from liability to liability, or from exemption to exemption, or from exemption to liability is exempt from liability to exemption is liable. This is the principle. He who takes both to make it more lenient for himself is liable to make it more stringent for himself is exempt. Gemara, who is the Tana who holds that there are four guardians, Arnaman said that Rabbi Biaboa said it is Armeir said Rabbi to Arnaman is there than a Tana who does not hold that there are four guardians. He said to him, Thus I meant to say to you, who is the Tana who holds that a hire is like a paid guardian. Rabbi Biaboa said it is Armeir, but surely we have heard that Armeir holds it. Reverse view for we learned a hire. How does he pay Armeir said like an unpaid guardian? Arjuna said like a paid guardian. Rabbi Biaboa learned it reverse. Are they four? There are three. Arnaman B. Isaac said there are four guardians, but their regulations are three. If he said to an unpaid guardian, etc., where is my ox, etc. If he said to one in the street, etc. If he said to a guardian, etc., where is my ox, he replied to him, I do not know what you say, etc. Rab said they are all exempt from the oath of Guardians but are liable in respect of the oath of utterance and Samuel said they are exempt also in respect of the oath of utterance in what do they disagree Samuel holds it is not possible of application in the future and Rab holds it is possible of application both negatively and positively but they have already expressed their disagreement on this point once for it was stated I swear that so and so threw a pebble into the sea I swear that he did not throw a pebble into the sea Rab says he is liable and Samuel says he is exempt Rab says he is liable because it is applicable negatively and positively and Samuel says he is exempt because it is not applicable in the future it is necessary for them to express their disagreement in the present instance too for if they had told us their disagreement in that case we might have thought that in that case Rab says he is liable because he swears of his own accord but in this case where the court administer the oath to and we might have thought that he agrees with Samuel as RMI said for RMI said in any oath which the judges administer there is no liability in respect of the oath of utterance and if their disagreement had been stated in this case we might have thought that in this case Samuel says he is exempt but in that case we might have thought that he agrees with Rab therefore it is necessary for their disagreement to be stated in both cases to turn to the main text RMI said in any oath which the judges administer there is no liability in respect of the oath of utterance for it is said or if anyone swear uttering with the lips of his own accord as Rush said for Rush said he is translatable by four expressions if perhaps but because R. Eliezer says they are all exempt from the oath of guardians but are liable in respect of the oath of utterance except in the case of the statement I do not know what you say made by the borrower and that of theft and loss by the paid guardian and hire where they are liable for they denied money.